Blackstone Audio presents No One Heard Her Scream by Jordan Dane Prologue South Padre Island, Texas, mid-June, after midnight. Somewhere in her heart, Danielle Montgomery knew this was wrong, and her guilt had a face. Mama's face. Memories of her mother flashed in her head with a steady and persistent rhythm. I swear it's the Catholic guilt, she said to herself. She took a deep breath and fiddled with a senior class ring on her finger. What's the use of a regular confession if a girl has nothing new to say? She held her wrist up to the dim glow of a street lamp and looked at her watch. Twenty minutes late. Had she misunderstood his instructions? In the back of her mind, a bigger question plagued her. Why had she promised to meet him like this? He was a stranger who'd hit on her at the beach. The attention of a college boy, especially in front of her classmates, made her feel special. She'd been a sucker for his gorgeous blue eyes. But she had a notion Mama wouldn't have been so impressed. Maybe that was the whole point. Now Danielle paced by the side entrance to the club, flicking ashes from a cigarette. Another rebellious rite of passage Mama wouldn't approve. Then the feeling came again, the feeling of being watched. Stronger this time. Her eyes strafed the alley behind her, narrow and murky with shadows. Nothing. She looked up to a handful of darkened windows. Someone might be checking her out, some pervert in the dark. Now you're being paranoid, Danny. She drew a frazzled breath and took another drag off her cigarette, blowing smoke rings in the air. With the music thumping behind the metal door, she stared up into the night sky, thick with stars. A clear night, and the flickering points of light beat to the rhythm of the music. The bar rocked, just as he promised. But being underage, she had no hope of getting inside without his help. As she watched the smoke rings drift apart, another thought occurred to her. Can't believe this. No way the jerk ditched me. Frustration wedged a lump in her throat. She tossed her cigarette butt and kicked a broken beer bottle with the toe of her shoe, hearing it clink across the asphalt. She'd left her girlfriends back at the hotel, promising a full report if they covered for her with the chaperones. At this rate, unless she embellished the truth, there'd be nothing to say, so much for becoming the new legend at St. Joseph's High, back in San Antonio. Unwilling to give up on her plans, she fanned herself with a hand. Damn it, I bet my mascara is runny. Probably have friggin' raccoon eyes. Muggy, hot air clung to her skin and fused with the perspiration to make her perfume smell stale. And worse, a tinge of sunburn radiated off her skin, intensifying the heat. Strands of her blonde hair fell heavy and damp, clinging to her bare shoulders and back. Even without a mirror, she knew her hair had gone flat. The humidity and salty air off the ocean had done their usual damage. She'd spent two hours getting ready. Now none of it mattered. Damn it, Brandon, where are you? She thought about catching a cab back to the hotel, but in the pale light, she glanced down at her new clothes. She wanted him to see her in this outfit. Tight jeans would get his attention, and the blue halter top accentuated the color of her eyes. All of a sudden, a sound came from the entrance to the alley, the drone of an engine and the crunch of tires. She looked up. Headlights blinded her. She squinted and raised a hand to block the glare. A dark van. Brandon? She called. Her voice cracked. Is that you? No answer. The driver got out and slammed the van door behind him. With the streetlight behind him, his face remained in shadow. Something was very wrong. He couldn't make it, sweet thing. Low and sinister, the man's voice skittered across her skin like spiders. Well, I do. Her breath caught in her throat. Danielle dropped her purse and turned to run. Maybe he'd settle for money. No such luck. From behind her, she heard heavy footsteps gaining on her. But as her scream pierced the night air, another man emerged from the darkness ahead, lunging at her. She tried to run by him, but he grabbed her arm, almost wrenched it out of its socket. No! She shrieked. The man spun her around. Now, with no other choice, Danielle balled her fists, ready to fight. She kicked, hard, but nothing fazed him. He backhanded her across the face. The shock jolted her skull and stars burst deep inside her brain, blinding her. She dropped to the asphalt. Her exposed skin scraped the ground. 
The heels of her hands and her elbows scuffed bloody and raw. Can't give up. She fought to stay conscious. You give up now, you die. Two shadows preyed on her, eclipsing the light at the end of the alley. Danielle rolled onto her back, flailing arms and kicking legs at whatever moved. Strong hands gripped her, hard. One clasped her mouth. The weight of a knee to her chest cut off her air. Through her nose, she drew a gasp into burning lungs. Suddenly, Danielle felt the stab of a needle in her neck. With the sharp pain, fear prickled her scalp, and goosebumps raced across her skin. Her neck burned like acid. A death-like stillness came when her body fell slack, her arms limp by her sides. Oh, God, please, she screamed inside her head, but no sound came from her mouth. A man's hand suffocated her. As the drug washed through her, once more she caught a glimpse of the night sky. Her eyes fixed upon the stars dotting the heavens, shimmering light. And like an old movie, images of her mother's face flickered in and out of her mind. Mama's lips moved, out of sync, as she spoke. The sound of her voice muffled in the haze until darkness swallowed everything. Oh, Mama, I'm so sorry. Bittersweet memories played cruel tricks with her mind, but as a tear drained from Danielle's eye, her thoughts drifted apart like smoke rings in the night sky. All she felt was the distant wetness of the drop. With great concentration, she focused on the sensation, picturing the tear as it rolled down her cheek. Buoyancy lifted her body, setting it adrift in a pitch-black void. Soon, the world would cease to exist. Time would come to a dead stop. And in the darkness, even the memory of Mama's voice wouldn't reach her. Chapter One Central Police Station Gymnasium, downtown San Antonio, five months later. Rebecca Montgomery battered the 70-pound punching bag in blinding succession. Ignoring the price her body would pay, pain and physical exhaustion dulled the rage and guilt, but nothing would free her from it, nothing. Her life balanced on a single point in time, poised at a dead stop, resistant to moving forward and incapable of going back. The night her little sister went missing rocked her world, but in the agonizing time that followed, her life changed forever, Becca could never make it right, not now. Danielle's body was never found. She grimaced at the thought and intensified her workout. Not knowing what had happened tore at her day by day, driven by her own inability to uncover the truth. Horrific thoughts emerged, dark and disturbing. Being a homicide detective prepared her for the worst-case scenario, but in doing so, it robbed her of hope. And for that, Becca hated herself. Stay focused, Keep moving. Use the pain. The initial shock of Danny's disappearance morphed into a flood of emotions. From mind-numbing depression to blinding rage when she thought about the injustice, nothing made the pain go away. She found herself desperate to regain control of her life, wanting her body to feel something and her mind to release the demons. Becca tightened her jaw until it hurt. Push through it. You gotta stay strong. She welcomed her method of self-inflicted punishment, giving in to its rhythm. Even through elastic wrap and workout gloves, her fist ached with every jab. The bag swayed with each driving blow. The muscles in her legs burned from the early morning workout. Circling, Becca picked up the pace and shifted weight to focus her whole body behind each impact. Her lungs heaved like a machine. Bobbing and weaving, she switched the speed and the combination of her punches. Left jab, straight right, left hook. With shoulder-length dark hair pulled back, she ignored the loose strands stuck to her cheeks. Sweat trailed off her body and drenched her cotton t-shirt and shorts. Becca had hit the zone. Within Central Station on South Frio Street, she exercised most mornings in a large facility located in the basement of police headquarters. But her usual workout had taken on more significance. Like the sputtering vapor whistling from a kettle on the boil, Becca needed to vent, and this was a good place to blow off steam. She'd grown accustomed to the musk of body odor mixed with the persistent smell of the dank walls of the SAPD gymnasium. The steady clacking of weights and the drone of showers had become nothing more than white noise. Male voices echoed behind her, but one finally stood out. Hey, Montgomery, you've been shadowing my case again and I don't like it. Silence spread across the gym. All conversation died and the clack of weights stopped. She didn't have to turn around to know all eyes were on her. Becca lowered her arms, gasping from the exertion of her penance. Sweat stung her eyes. 
After yanking off her gloves, she took her time, running scenarios through her mind. Let it go, Beck. She reached for a nearby towel and wiped it across her face, draping it over her neck. Don't let the jerk get to you. Becca knew what a reasonable person might do, but by the time she turned around, the word reasonable vanished from her vocabulary. I don't know what you're talking about, Murphy. Her dark eyes took aim like a laser scope on a sniper rifle. So why don't you mind your own business? Becca turned her shoulder, but he pulled her around to face him. Oh, that's rich coming from you. You're acting like a damned vigilante and I'm supposed to mind my own business? Other lives are at risk here. I was wondering if you'd noticed that, she said. Moving closer, she picked lint off his t-shirt and lowered her voice so not many would hear. You see, I think you picture this case to be a fast track for your career. You probably figure if you play your cards right, this liaison gig to the FBI might impress the feds. But you know what? Time is swirling down the drain and you got nothing on my sister's killer or the other abductions. Good luck impressing anyone with that. Ho oh, ho, the men within earshot resounded in unison. Nervous laughter died. Paul Murphy served as a catalyst to her mounting frustration. All she needed was an excuse to lash out, and he had given it to her. The man didn't know when to quit. A dedicated cop, real determined, good qualities, except when directed at her. Almost six foot, the bastard wasn't much taller than she, but he looked like a wall of muscle, broad shoulders and thick neck, a regular fire plug. You're a pretty big talker. Maybe you think special treatment is in order with what happened to your sister and all, but I can't have you sticking your nose in my business, so knock it off. Murphy stepped closer, close enough for her to see every acne scar. His shoulders and arms glistened with sweat. Like a chess player, she assessed her next moves. His nose had already been broken once. A second time wouldn't hurt his looks any. She contemplated rearranging his face with a well-placed uppercut, but several of the men drew into a tight circle around him. Although Becca wasn't sure whose side they were on, it didn't matter. Since her sister's case started, she'd made enemies. She'd pushed and pushed until walls were erected, keeping her out of the loop in the investigation that leapt jurisdictional boundaries. So Becca knew she'd be on her own. But that didn't stop her from tossing gasoline onto a smoldering fire. She heard the words coming from her mouth, the voice of a stranger. I don't expect anything special. I only want you to do your damn job. Well, you're gonna have to trust me to do that, Montgomery. Let me do my fucking job. Fists at her sides, she stood her ground, leaving little room to maneuver. The last thing she wanted was to fight one of her own, but she couldn't back down either. Whoever threw the first punch would be the real loser. She knew it. So did Murphy. She could tell by his hesitation. Becca faced a real standoff, 200 pounds worth. Break it up, you two. That's an order. The bellowing voice of Lieutenant Arturo Santiago forced her to stand down, but she hadn't got off the hot seat. Montgomery, in my office now. And Murphy, you're next after you hit the showers. I don't want to call in a hazmat team to fumigate after your sorry ass darkens my door. A lieutenant always knew how to clear a room. Becca took a deep breath, trying to control the surge of adrenaline through her system. Murphy shrugged and forced a grin. Come on, LT, I'm a ray of sunshine, no fumigating required. He backed off with a slight nod and pointed a finger at her. This is my case, Montgomery. Are we clear? Oh, I think we both know where we stand on the subject, yeah. She tugged into her sweats, and I'll give your point all the consideration it's due. Murphy stormed off in a huff, reading her message loud and clear. Becca hadn't picked the fight, but she'd been prepared to end it. Practically egging Murphy on, she found herself wanting him to throw the first punch. And even more disturbing, she'd been disappointed when the lieutenant intervened. What the hell was wrong with her? She had let Murphy get to her, allowing her pent-up tension to cloud her good judgment. Now she had to deal with the lieutenant in the privacy of his office. She knew what he wanted to talk about, and it had nothing to do with Murphy's sorry ass. Lieutenant Santiago's office smelled of coffee and stale smoke, a byproduct of the old homicide division before anti-smoking legislation. Central Station had been smoke-free for quite a while, but the stench lingered from years past, infused into the walls. No amount of renovation had ever managed to eliminate the odor. With arms crossed, Becca sat in front of his desk, waiting. She imagined how her conversation with the lieutenant might play out, but none of the scenarios were in her favor. Play the hand you've been dealt. No fancy moves. 
Behind his beige metal desk with walnut veneer top, a clock hung on the wall and marked the passing of time with a steady, annoying beat. Tick, tick, tick. All part of the charade, Becca knew the man's game of intimidation, making her wait. So far, she had to admit it had worked pretty well. And the glass walls of the corner office made the room feel like a damned sweat box, even at this time of day. She wiped a sheen of perspiration off her forehead. To distract herself from the discomfort, she gazed around the room, taking in the details of the man's many accomplishments. Becca's eyes found a photo of Santiago with his family. At work, the lieutenant maintained a stern grimace, but the man had an infectious smile when he allowed it to show. Deepening age lines gave his face character. His short-cropped dark hair had receded to a crown, worn like a laurel wreath around his head. Shining plaques of meritorious service framed photos of him with the mayor and coaching mementos from a local Little League team reflected his life in service to the community and law enforcement. At one time, such recognition would have meant everything to her. But now, with Danielle gone, it all seemed so pointless. Jesus, Danny, she whispered. Why the hell? Tick, tick. Looking out the picture window to her left, she lost herself in the drama of sunrise. Filtered through a cheap set of Venetian blinds, the morning sun pierced heavy cloud cover with spears of brilliant orange, a quiet skirmish. City buses and commuter traffic droned in the background. It reminded her that life carried on and the world spun on its axis, whether she came along for the ride or not. A humbling notion. You take your coffee black, right? She jumped at the sound of his voice, an unsettling reaction. Lieutenant Santiago entered the office, holding two cups of coffee. A hot beverage would exacerbate the heat, but she could use the caffeine. Becca reached for the cup as he shut the door. Yes, sir. She took a sip, breathing in the aroma from the steam. Thanks. This office can be a bit stifling in the mornings, but I kind of like it. She drank in silence, waiting for him to start. Knowing the lieutenant, she wouldn't have to wait long. What happened? Is it true you've been bird-dogging Murphy's work, conducting your own investigation? Becca avoided his stare, looking down into her cup. A lumbering silence filled the space between them, interrupted by the steady beat of the clock. Tick, tick. The lieutenant knew the answer to his question, and she didn't feel the need to incriminate herself. We already talked about this, Rebecca. Your involvement complicates the case. You're too close to it. She looked up, narrowing her eyes. Maybe that's what the investigation needs, sir. A fresh set of eyes. Someone with a stake in this. She set her coffee down on the corner of his desk and crossed her arms. Murphy is a good cop, but a real simple kind of guy. For him, thinking out of the box is a radical concept, reserved for left-wing liberals, four-eyed geeks, and girly men. Santiago raised an eyebrow and wrestled with his lower lip to avoid smiling. So why'd you let him get to you? The man zeroed in on the heart of the problem. You were ready to deck him. She shrugged. Seemed like a swell idea at the time. Not good enough, Rebecca. He leaned forward, elbows on his desk. Look, I know this has been rough on you. Not being more involved in Danielle's case, I can imagine how I'd feel if something happened to one of my kids. His face softened in empathy. Don't force me to stop you, Becca. My heart wouldn't be in it. But you gotta see there's a bigger picture here. I can't allow you to jeopardize this investigation. But my sister's case is getting lost in the shuffle of these abductions, sir. She pressed, her voice laden with emotion. I gotta speak for her. I don't see anyone else doing it. His face settled into his usual stern expression. Need I remind you that the circumstances surrounding Danielle are a little different from the other two victims in this case? Yeah, all three lived here and were abducted from class outings across the country. But that's where the similarities end. Your sister left a trail after Padre Island, Becca. His raised voice merged with an abrasive creak of his chair. The sound made her skin scramble like hearing fingernails screech across a chalkboard. Lately, her nerves were raw, but her revulsion had more to do with what he said, and the lieutenant added insult to injury by harping on his version of the truth. Look, you gotta face facts. Danny used her credit card at two gas stations and a motel, and we had an eyewitness sighting and a video to back this up. It looks like she ran away from home and hooked up with the wrong people. An unreliable witness and one blurry video did not stack up to much in Becca's book. 
Even if the young girl in the videotape looked as if she wore Danielle's new clothes, identified by her sister's closest friends, it amounted to circumstantial evidence at best. But don't you see, Art? She'd never do that. Sure, she had a rebellious streak, but what kid at her age doesn't? Hell, you should have seen me. Becca bolted out of her chair and stalked toward his office window, holding back the anger welling deep in her belly. She'd heard this account before, and it always made her furious. But talking about Danny in the past tense gnawed at her gut like a cancer. It didn't feel right. You, a rebel. Hard to imagine, he sniped. Sarcasm duly noted, but hear me out. She turned to face him. I think someone stole her credit card and set up a bogus trail for us to follow. I think they wanted to throw us off what really happened to her. And what's your theory on that? Tick, tick, tick. Becca hated to admit it. She was as clueless as Murphy on what happened to her sister. At first, Danielle's disappearance looked like the random act of a stray predator. After interviewing Danny's friends and extracting the truth, investigators closed in on a local hotspot. Tire tracks, signs of a struggle, and spots of her sister's blood marked the crime scene. And the college kid she was supposed to meet, he had a damned rock-solid alibi. So the search for Danielle began. Local law joined forces with a contingent from San Antonio to scour the neighborhood for witnesses. Reward posters and flyers went out. Volunteers and local pilots searched for signs of a body. Radio stations and television news teams blitzed the story. None of the efforts paid off. In between a few promising leads, many hoaxes were investigated, draining the resources of the police. Eventually, evidence of her credit card use trickled in, the sightings leading the search away from Padre Island. The FBI was brought in when it looked like her trail crossed state lines. Then Becca's worst fear, a motel room spattered with blood. Too much blood lost for anyone to survive. At first, she was in denial that the blood belonged to her sister, but the tests came back a match. Danny had died in a cheap motel room. No body found. Two other abduction cases followed in different states, but with connections to San Antonio. And in the turn of a page, Danny's story became old news. The media moved on. With Becca relegated to the status of family member, she'd been kept at arm's length from the investigation. Her pushing investigators and double-checking leads had alienated her from the insiders to the case. Censored verbal reports gave her limited information, so she'd resorted to stealing peeks at Murphy's casebook. Now that looked like a dead end. The word powerless didn't begin to describe how she felt. And looking into the eyes of her despondent mother on the day they buried Danielle's empty coffin cast Becca into a new brand of hell. A part of her died that day. I don't have any theories. Not yet. Becca slumped against the window frame. But if Danny's case is so different from the others, maybe I can conduct my own. You haven't heard a word I've said, have you? Lieutenant Santiago clenched his jaw, a familiar gesture. Sit. Now. His command gave no room for interpretation. This was not an invitation to be declined. Becca heaved a sigh and trudged back to her seat, mustering a rebellious slouch. The FBI smells the work of a human trafficking ring with connections to San Antonio. And like flies to a pile of horseshit, they're buzzing over my jurisdiction. I don't need to tell you how that makes me feel, pompous bastards. He furrowed his brow. With you poking your nose into this, the feds have already raised their objections. Your link to Danielle could pose a problem for the prosecution if they find a connection. Especially if a defense attorney gets wind of your involvement with evidence gathering. Do you want that? I don't care about any damned court case, sir. I want justice for Danny. And that's the problem. Don't make me out to be the bad guy here. If there's some nutbag abducting and killing young women, it's my job and yours to put them away. A sad expression etched his face. Don't make me force you to take time off. You and I both know how you'd spend it. I'd rather keep an eye on you myself. With his brow furrowed, he leaned across the desk, concern overshadowing his personal disappointment. She owed Lieutenant Santiago so much. The man had been a mentor to her. Interfering in Danielle's case had been a flagrant betrayal of his trust and contrary to her sense of responsibility as a cop. Still, she had no choice. Straightening up in her chair, she waited to hear his version of a compromise. Before you hit the showers, get with dispatch. They got a call about skeletal remains found at the old Imperial Theater, the one that just burned down. For now, 
I'm assigning you to the cold case squad to handle it, on temporary loan. Is this an order, LT? Does it need to be? He matched her tone, ramped up the attitude. He'd lost his patience with the caring father routine. Look, you've got a chance to give someone else closure here, and you must know how important that is. The pile of bones at the Imperial used to be someone's family. You do your job. I'll do what I can to keep you apprised of Murphy's progress myself. Deal? Becca crossed her arms and leaned against the doorframe, staring at him. He had played the guilt card like a master. No way for her to trumpet. She cocked her head and crooked a corner of her mouth, watching as he basked in his victory. He returned her smile. If you need anything, or just want to talk, let me know. Thanks, LT. I'll remember that. Becca left his office and headed for dispatch, her mind working on what to do next. Lieutenant Santiago had been right about one thing. Closure was important. It would be worth any sacrifice. The heat from the sun burned off the morning haze, but an early cool front brought a stiff breeze to jostle the trees. Real Texas weather. A taste of winter might come on the heels of sweltering heat or monsoon rains. This time of year, it paid to be a regular Girl Scout, prepared for anything. Becca turned off Commerce onto St. Mary's Street and found a parking lot across the street from the Imperial Theater. She found a spot next to one of the fire department trucks. Once outside her vehicle, Becca tugged at the collar of her white Oxford shirt and buttoned the jacket to her navy pantsuit, preparing to go inside. Becca removed her sunglasses, slipped them into the pocket of her jacket, and clipped her ID badge on a lapel. She stared across the street to assess the damage from the front. Yellow crime scene tape whipped in the breeze, a flag for curious onlookers. Several people lingered on her side of the street and down a block or two. What they expected to see, she had no idea. For all they knew, it had only been a fire. News of the body had not been released. Still, morbid curiosity drew them like flies to roadkill. But one man stood out from the rest. Dressed in a sharp suit and tie, the guy looked like he had stepped off the cover of Gentleman's Quarterly magazine with his swarthy good looks. GQ had Mongo Bucks written all over him. Wearing dark glasses, he leaned against a deep blue Mercedes S600 parked along the street, hands in his pants pockets. Even without seeing his eyes, she knew he spotted her, his head turning with interest as she stood on the curb. He didn't look like the typical gawker who hoped to catch a glimpse of some action from the old burned-out building. Not this guy. He was anything but typical. And another facet of him caught her eye. Ever since leaving her crown vic, she had become his focus, holding his complete interest. The feeling's mutual, gorgeous, she whispered, but I'm not in the mood. Becca shifted her gaze to the Imperial. The theater bore a certain dignity, even covered in layers of soot. The fire had consumed much of its striking architecture and intricate detail with no regard for history. Prior to the blaze, she believed the theater had been left derelict. A real shame. Seeing it now from the outside, nothing more than a blackened carcass, provoked her already sullen mood. She read somewhere that the recently declared historic building had been slated for restoration, but the work hadn't begun yet. Now it never would. From what she remembered of the theater, Baroque, Mediterranean, and Spanish mission influences had inspired the design, conveying theater patrons to a fanciful villa. Arches with ornate columns, tile rooftops, and a bell tower surrounded the stage. Walls were transformed into steeples with colorful glass windows. Rising above the quaint setting, a vaulted sky in deep blue twinkled with endless stars and clouds drifted overhead like mist. On a balcony railing, a rare white peacock perched next to doves caught in mid-flight, all part of the architect's illusory world. With a young Danielle in tow, Becca had been in the theater as a teen, the treasured memory of an outing with her late grandmother. The experience had forever left its mark. At the time, she and Danny imagined the Imperial to be a grand palace, home to a legendary king and queen with magical powers. Crystal chandeliers soared high above the plush seats, making the gilded walls glisten in the pale light. She remembered holding her breath when the lights dimmed, eyes wide. With its elaborate brocade borders, the velvet curtain rose over the stage. Elegant ballerinas performed the Nutcracker, looking even more enchanting on the ornate stage, pure magic. Now all that was gone, and so was Danielle. Her heart ached with profound loss. 
Ignoring GQ, still standing by his pricey car, Beck crossed the street and walked through what remained of the front door. After she flashed her badge to the uniform stationed at the entrance, he handed her a protective helmet with plexiglass visor, standard issue. She reached into the pocket of her jacket for a fresh pair of latex gloves and made sure she had her case book, pen, and flashlight. Inside, a dank, smoldering odor filled her nostrils. Water damage fused with the fire's destruction. Squinting, Becca adjusted to the dark interior and hit the switch to her cell light. The beam of light stretched into the void, capturing fine particles of dust in its wake, a reminder why the air felt thick and smelled stale. The scorched shell captured her attention, a macabre landscape in black and gray. Past the lobby, an eerie hum drifted through the cavernous space, leading her like a beacon. She heard voices ahead, the words garbled by the distance, and the steady whir coming from a portable power generator. With the electricity out to the building, the generator would allow them to work by floodlights. Crime scene techs were hard at work, bagging and tagging evidence and taking digital photographs. But one section of the theater caught her eye. Bright lights flooded a murky and gaping cavity in a stone wall to the right of the stage. A group of men gathered near the opening, their silhouettes casting elongated shadows with every flash of the camera. As she approached, one of the men turned. Hey, Becca, was wondering who'd get the short straw. Team leader for the crime scene technicians, Sam Hastings grinned as Becca snapped on her latex gloves. Tall and lanky, with curly brown hair receding at his temples, the senior CSI stepped aside for her to get a closer look. Details of his face faded from view as he moved deeper into the shadows. Short straws are all I get lately. Skeletal remains were uncommon. Becca crooked her lips into a reasonable facsimile of a smile. Before I forget, have one of your guys record the crowd outside, especially the suit by the Mercedes, and get his tag. Good idea. Firebugs like to watch the aftermath of their handiwork. The guy looks suspicious. Let's just say he stands out from the crowd, but I want the license tags and faces of everyone out there. She bent to get a closer look and dropped to a knee. One of the techs knelt by the masonry and removed another stone, setting it on the floor beside him. A couple of bricks were already bagged. She knew anything could be evidence, including the mortar used. It might give some indication of a timeline. With flashlight in hand, Becca kept her eyes focused on the dark hole. She found herself staring into the hollow eyes of a skull. Its jaw gaped open in a grotesque scream. The smell of old death lingered enough to fill the tomb with a stale, earthy stench. Nothing more. So tell me something I don't know, Sam. Okay. He took a moment to think. When I was ten, a kid half my size made me cry when he threatened to hit me. Becca turned toward him, an eyebrow raised. Not exactly what I had in mind, but thanks for sharing. She fought a smile. How did they find the body? Firefighter, swinging a mean axe, took out the first bricks, enough to find something staring back. Once again, Becca glanced over her shoulder. Before she made a smart remark, Sam beat her to the punch. Hey, if I'd gone the fireman route, I would have had to make a trip home to change my shorts. But I'm your basic jaded CSI guy. Nothing much surprises me anymore. I hear ya. Becca shifted focus deep into the hole and noticed something disturbing. What do we have here? He's got no fingers? Phalanges are the first to go. Over time, small bones drop off. Sam replied. He nudged close to her shoulder and used his flashlight to locate the bone fragments in the bottom of the cramped space. It's going to take us a while to remove the skeleton. We'll extricate the rest in one piece, if we can. He changed direction of his beam to reveal the skull and spoke aloud as if he were making a mental checklist. We don't get many skeletal remains to ID. We may have to bring in a specialist, a forensic anthropologist, Maybe try and reconstruct facial features. We'll collect some mitochondrial DNA and retain it to compare against any known relation to the deceased. That'll be your job to find next of kin. My best hope to speed up the ID process will be to check into missing persons. The body had to be buried in this theater while it was under construction or during some kind of renovation. Maybe that'll help narrow the time period for my search. We could get lucky. She made notes in her casebook. With a grimace, she rested an elbow on her knee and said... I came here as a kid to see a ballet once. It really creeps me out to know that while the crowd gave a standing ovation, this guy was buried in the wall near the stage. Yup, back in the day I heard it was murder to get a front row seat. Becca shut her eyes and shook her head. A collective groan rumbled through the text standing behind her. Everyone's a critic. 
The CSI team leader shrugged. Hey, Sam, wouldn't the smell of the body be detected once it was time for curtain call at the Imperial? Yep, but construction or renovation work takes time, right? Crews coming in and out. Time for a body to decompose depends on temperature, moisture, and accessibility to insects. In the summer, an exposed human body can be reduced to bones in nine days. Now granted, this type of setup would have taken longer, but it's conceivable only bones attended opening night. No tucks required. With more of the wall removed, he craned his neck and directed his flashlight into the makeshift tomb. Looks like we're going to have to rethink the gender thing. Check out those hips. With a tilt of her head, Becca turned to stare at the senior CSI. You need to hang out with people who are partial to breathing. In case you haven't noticed, this is a pile of bones. What hips? I use the word hips for your benefit. I didn't think, hey, check out that sciatic notch would get your attention, am I right? When she scrunched her face, Sam explained and pointed to the lower vertebrae. The sciatic notch spreads as a woman gets older, allowing the pelvis to make room for childbirth. If I had to guess, this sacrum and pelvic rim are from a young female. And the partially erupted molars back me up. I'd say the victim was late teens to early 20s at the time of death. He pointed a finger to the brow of the skull. Another thing. Check out the forehead. It's almost vertical. Men's tend to slant more, develop a brow ridge. And with the narrow mandible, definitely female. So my he is a she? Yep, looks like it. When Becca peered deeper into the stone vault, markings caught her eye. Hey, what's this? She inched closer and directed her flashlight to the left. Oh, God. Are those what I think they are? Jagged scratches lined the inside of the stone vault. Layers of them overlapped in no discernible pattern. Thin striations mixed with deeper gouges. She felt the group of men move closer. Silence made the air feel thick and oppressive, motionless. With her discovery, it became harder for her to breathe. Finally, Sam confirmed what she already suspected. By the solemn tone in his voice, she knew it struck him, too. Scratches. Probably from her fingernails. Looks like she was buried alive. Becca closed her eyes to block the images. A gruesome strobe effect triggered in her mind. Tortured screams. A mouth gasping for air. Sheer panic. She pictured Danielle dying an unthinkable death, walled away in darkness with no one to hear her cries for help. No one heard her scream. She hadn't realized she'd spoken the words aloud until Sam consoled her with his reply. Until now. He sighed and stared into the hole. Danielle's face haunted her. As a homicide detective, Becca had witnessed the perverse nature of the human condition carried to the extreme. But the varying degrees of cruelty one human being inflicted upon another never ceased to amaze her. The day it did would be the day she'd quit. Still, she knew this case would brand her psyche for years to come. You all right? Sam nudged her shoulder, his voice quiet and reassuring. It took her a long while to answer. Yeah. I'll be okay. The words coming from her mouth sounded trite and mechanical, lacking any real conviction. Think I found something to cheer you up. He reached into the tomb and navigated through the tight space. After shining a light on what he retrieved, he said, maybe a lucky charm. Sam held a thin necklace with a trinket dangling from it. The metal had been discolored with the years, and dirt clung to the delicate chain. What's that? She narrowed her eyes to get a better look at the jewelry she took from his hand. Holding the evidence toward the light, she answered her own question, in the shape of a heart. If this isn't some cheap bauble, it might lead somewhere. Good eye, Hastings. Sam smiled. Yeah, my wife says I have an eye for the expensive stuff. It's pretty tarnished, but it doesn't look cheap to me. And if I'm not mistaken, there are small diamond chips on it, too. Becca stood and handed the necklace back, making another note in her book. Who's the arson investigator? She asked. Rick Galagos is working the lead. You know him? When she nodded, he pointed to the far wall. Try over there. Before she left, the CSI grabbed her arm and pulled her aside, out of earshot from his crew. Concern lined his face. You and your family are in my prayers. If there's anything I can do. She smiled. With what we do, prayers seem like a band-aid on a hemorrhage. Don't get me wrong. I come from a long line of scuba diving Protestants, 
Most of my family only surface on church holidays, but I found it helps me. Thanks, Sam. You're a good friend, but really, I'm all right. I'll be in touch on our Jane Doe. Complete denial. She heard it in her voice. I'm all right, my ass. Her life admired in her sister's tragedy, and she knew it. But the murder victim's family needed her to function on all cylinders. They deserved her best. Guess prayers can't hurt, she muttered as she walked away. Maybe God listens to other people. Galagos was one of the best arson investigators with the city. The man had extensive experience and training with an education in chemicals. He'd also been part of a bomb squad at another police station. With the pairing of Rick Galagos and Sam Hastings on this investigation, maybe she hadn't drawn the short straw after all. Rick was her height, with thick dark hair and skin the color of rich mocha. His eyes were almost black, and he possessed a piercing stare, the kind that unnerved the guilty. But for those having the pleasure to work with him, he showed warmth and good humor in his gaze. A diligent investigator and a thorough one. She liked him from the first day they had met, several years ago. Hey, Rick. She lowered the beam of her flashlight, leaving his face partially lit. This case is going to be tough enough. Glad you're working the fire. How's it coming? Getting close to wrapping up, but I've got something for you to see. Follow me, Becca. He waved a hand and led her through the burned rubble. He took her toward a back door and into the bright sunshine. Becca shielded her eyes with a hand, but it felt good to be out from under the oppressive darkness of the charred imperial. Parts of her skin were caked with a layer of dust. Feeling gritty, she ran a hand over her chin, only to find her gloves smeared with soot. No telling what she'd find on her white blouse. Just great. She'd clean up in the car. It wasn't her day. Becca filled her lungs with fresh air and let Rick talk. Arsonists believe fire destroys evidence, but not if an investigator knows what to look for. They forget only the vapor burns, not the liquid part of the fuel. So if any material is saturated with an accelerant, the wetness prevents the cloth from burning, leaving behind evidence for us to connect the dots. If we match the fabric to something on the premises of a suspect, we've got a link to the crime scene. So what have you learned so far? I've been examining patterns of burn, the structure of the building itself, the ventilation factors, and what fuel loadings were available. The Imperial was a veritable powder keg waiting for someone to strike a match. He brought her toward a large garbage receptacle set too close to the back wall of the building. But I found some poor patterns in and around this dumpster. They look promising. He squatted near a pile of trash and pointed, continuing with his preliminary findings. Incendiary fire. A candle ignited the blaze and served as a time delay. It looks like some type of liquid accelerant was used, more than likely gasoline, but I'll confirm that when I run it through the gas chromatograph. See here? It burned in a way that remained visible after the fire. Rick pointed to the burn pattern, or rather, the absence of burn. I'm still collecting evidence, enclosing what I find in airtight containers to prevent cross-contamination and keep the integrity of the accelerant intact. But so far, this looks like arson, deliberately set. Arson added a wrinkle of complication, but a thought registered in her mind. Guess if the fire hadn't happened, we might never have found our Jane Doe buried in the wall. Whoever set the blaze may help us find justice for our murder victim. At least we have a shot at it. Kind of an interesting turn of fate, I'd say. The irony appealed to her. Becca handed her helmet to the fire investigator. I'll leave this stylish headgear with you. Send me a copy of your findings. And thanks, Rick. Will do. He nodded and headed back into the building. Normally, the owner of the Imperial Theater would be considered a strong suspect for a fire caused by arson. As a rule, the fraudulent act was committed to collect insurance money, especially if the policy amount exceeded the value of the real estate. That fit the bill for the Imperial in its current state of disrepair. But if the property owner had anything to do with the body buried in the theater, an arson fire would be the last thing the owner would want. An arson investigation would only shed light on a very deep, dark secret. The pieces to this puzzle didn't make sense, yet. But there was nothing like a good mystery. No matter how her investigation proceeded, the owner of the Imperial Theater would be high on her interview list. Becca jotted some more notations into her casebook and walked around the building, still thinking about the murdered woman. When she rounded the corner at the front of the theater, she caught sight of her mystery man's Mercedes, but he wasn't in sight. 
For an instant, she felt disappointed. Beck, get over yourself. With my luck, I'll find him in one of the mug books back at headquarters, with priors as long as my arm. She heaved a sigh. Reaching into her jacket pocket, she retrieved her car keys and walked across the street. After unlocking her car door, she noticed movement near the corner of the Imperial. Becca recognized the man, even under his designer shades. But instead of crossing the street toward his expensive ride, the guy headed in the opposite way, as if he had somewhere else to be. Doubts crept into her mind. Maybe the Mercedes wasn't his. No way. The man definitely fit the ride. So what are you up to, GQ? She pursed her lips and thought for a moment, giving in to her impulse to follow. With enough people around, she could blend in and tail him from her side of the street. Mostly, Becca was too damned curious to let him walk away. She slipped on her sunglasses. On instinct, she felt for her Glock, lodged in a holster at the small of her back. Speaking to her weapon, Becca muttered, Let's you and me take a stroll, shall we? Chapter Two The man walked with purpose, hands in his pockets, a sexy swagger. If she'd known the name of his tailor, Becca would have sent a thank you note. His suit accentuated every asset the man had. Her target moved with a certain power and grace she always associated with a grade A male. Yet with his head lowered in boyish charm, his body was a contradiction. Navigating the streets with eyes looking down, he seemed to know where he was going, a man on a mission. His face stern, he looked preoccupied and deep in thought. And although people noticed him, they avoided eye contact, maybe sensing a trace of danger. Eye candy tinged with risk. Becca felt it too. Gut instincts as a cop and as a woman. The guy never turned her way. When he slowed and sat down at a small table in front of a sidewalk cafe, she ducked into a bookstore on her side of the street. With her nose in a book, Becca stood by a large window maintaining surveillance. GQ placed his order. Before long, the waiter brought two hot beverages. He expected someone to join him. This could be interesting, she muttered. Raising the book to cover her face, she peeked over the top of her sunglasses. In a simple gesture, her well-dressed target raised a hand and waved. His guest had arrived. Becca looked up and down the street, waiting to spot the newcomer to the scene. No one stood out. But he waved again, this time with a faint smile on his face. Eyes wide, she almost dropped her book. What the hell? She glanced over her shoulder. No one stood behind. Is he waving at me? When she turned back, he had removed his sunglasses and stared at her, a definite invitation or a challenge. Her face heated with embarrassment, but in no time her blush dissolved into anger at being caught. Becca jammed the book back on the shelf and took a deep breath. Don't let him get to you, Beck, and don't underestimate him again. Outside the bookstore, she stood on the curb, waiting for the traffic light to change. GQ hadn't moved. Sprawled at the small, wrought iron table for two, he had his arms crossed over his ample chest, looking plenty smug. With the breezy day, no sane person would have chosen a seat outside. So without a doubt, the mystery man and Becca would have their privacy. She gritted her teeth, determined not to give in to his not-so-subtle game of intimidation. Hiding behind her sunglasses, she glared at him as the light changed. He reminded her of an old tomcat about to play with his next meal. Becca took her time crossing the intersection. What would she say? After all, she had been caught in the act of following him. Scenarios played out in her mind, but as she approached, he made the first move. A low, masculine voice with a faint Hispanic accent. I have taken the liberty of ordering your favorite. Cappuccino with cinnamon, I believe. He stood and pulled the seat out for her. You looked like you could use a break. She removed her sunglasses and sat down, eyes focused on the man taking the seat across from her. You knew I'd. Of course he knew she would follow him. Damn it. And I suppose if you know my Java preferences, you obviously know my... He never let her finish. 
Your name? Detective Montgomery. He grinned, showing a subtle display of dimples. At the risk of sounding like a stalker, the answer is yes. Or do you prefer Rebecca? No amount of charm or cappuccino tempered her shock. And still he pressed his advantage. With a downright lethal smile, he leaned toward her, close enough for her to get a whiff of his distinctive cologne. His intimacy in the small table did a number on her head. In her mind, the busy street and all its noise faded to nothing. All she saw were those eyes, dark, sensual, and honey-brown. They commanded her complete attention. Becca tried to turn away, but found it impossible. The man stared straight through her, unnerving and mesmerizing at the same time. With the palpable connection between them, she wondered if he felt it too. Becca had to break his spell. She shoved the cappuccino aside and matched his posture, elbows on the table. You have me at a disadvantage. I don't know your name. You in a sharing mood? She tilted her head and waited. A resourceful woman like you, you'll find out soon enough. The cagey bastard sure liked hoarding his secrets. She had to gain control of this conversation fast. I noticed you hanging out in front of the Imperial earlier. Is this a crime, Rebecca? A slow, lazy smile, dark eyes riveted on hers. If so, you won't catch me doing it again. After all, I'm a law-abiding citizen. He took his first sip of coffee. Becca found herself fixated on his lips, full and expressive. Oh, hell. This man could be connected to the arson fire. Focus, Beck. Keep your wits, woman. She sat back in her chair and forced a smile. I think the operative word is catch. You seem to have eyes in the back of your head. Her mind worked overtime as she kept up her end of the conversation. Becca made a mental tally of his appearance for purely professional reasons. Well over six feet tall, with a lean athletic build, around 180 pounds. But when her imagination drifted to picturing that body up close and personal... Under silk sheets, she forced herself back into cop mode and continued with her inventory of the man. Full head of black hair, well-groomed, and he smelled so damned good. She grimaced at her lack of focus and continued with the tough job of taking stock. Manicured nails, expensive threads, a small scar over his right eye, a thin white line against an olive complexion, gave his face character and it might prove to be a distinguishing mark to ID him. But his most memorable feature, his eyes, she'd recognize anywhere. If those eyes lurked in a mug book or in a database, she'd know them on sight. Deep brown honey melting under a July sun. Was that an eye color? You look like a guy with an agenda. What were you doing at the theater? She tried the direct approach. I was there to represent the interests of my benefactor. At one time, he had an affiliation with the old theater. That is all. He sipped his coffee, a slow, deliberate move. Looks like your investigator found evidence of arson. You guessing, or do you know this for a fact? A pretty good guess, I'm afraid. Putting two and two together, she now understood why he'd been across the street, near the corner by the theater. He'd spied on them as they inspected the dumpster in the back parking lot of the Imperial. Knowing he'd deny it, she tried a different tack. So this benefactor and his so-called affiliation, did he once own the property? When he answered with only a sly smile, she tried again. Okay, let's try something a little more simple. Does your benefactor have a name? All in good time, Rebecca. I have faith in your ability to detect such things. He cocked his head, not taking his eyes off her, but I have to warn you, my benefactor is a very dangerous man. Is that a threat? No, consider it a warning, more of a professional courtesy. She narrowed her eyes and stared at him, trying to determine any hint of sarcasm. He looked dead serious. Aren't you taking a chance by warning the cop working the case? If he's so dangerous, why cross him? Guess I like to live on the edge. His expression grew more solemn. Eyes down, he toyed with his coffee cup. And he doesn't own me, yet. She reached across and rubbed her fingers on the sleeve of his expensive suit. Oh, I don't know. 
Looks like he's made a hefty down payment on his investment. For a brief moment, he torqued his jaw and looked up. She'd hit a nerve. Just make sure you bring your A-game with this guy. He's powerful and as nasty as they come. Don't you worry about my A-game, Slick. She raised her chin in challenge. I always bring it. Oh, really? With eyes focused on her lips, he picked up a napkin. In a surprising gesture, he leaned closer and reached for her, a pale blue linen in his hand. Becca pulled back at first, shocked by his bold move. But as he wiped her chin with an unexpected gentleness, she gave in to the intimacy and relaxed. Way to go, Beck. Real classy. All this time, she put up a front of bravado with black smudge on her face, a remnant from the fire. And he kept a straight face, not mentioning it. With a raised eyebrow, he showed her the dirty napkin, proof of her A-game. Thanks. She barely looked him in the eye. Guess it's been a long day. After a strained moment, Becca noticed he hadn't backed away. She found him staring, and once again she sensed a strong connection. As close as he was to her, anyone along the street might have assumed they were lovers. Becca imagined she felt his breath on her skin, and yet his touch seemed so natural, as if they'd met in another life. A stirring, unforgettable moment. But without warning, he broke the bond, sternness back in his expression, a gust of wind blew her hair, and in a snap, her connection to him faltered. He sat back in his seat and let awkward silence build between them. It reminded her they were strangers who had run out of things to say. Like I said, you'll need an A-game, even if you have to borrow one. Look, Slick, I've got an investigation to conduct, and as much as I've enjoyed our little one-sided rendezvous, I've got things to do. After taking a sip of his coffee, he looked across the table at her cup. But you haven't touched your cappuccino. I only drink with friends. The gloves were off. No sense allowing him to monopolize her dance card. She had better things to do. So I, this cryptic little game, Slick. You won't share your name or the identity of your so-called benefactor, yet you're chock full of professional courtesies. Surely you have better things to do with your time than waste mine. After a faint, sad smile, the man slipped on his sunglasses, preparing to leave. I wanted to meet you, to find out why a homicide detective gets assigned to a fire investigation. Finally, all his cards were on the table, a well-played hand thus far. But now, he was fishing. He knew she worked homicide, but had no idea about the body found in the old theater. Interesting. It appeared she still held a card up her sleeve and latex gloves in her pocket. Well, imagine that. I guess there are things you don't know. As she spoke, Becca slipped on one of her gloves under the table. But a resourceful man such as yourself will find out soon enough. I have faith in your abilities. She reached across the table for his coffee cup with her gloved hand, and without ceremony, dumped what remained of his java onto the sidewalk by their table. Her sudden move drew a flicker of indignation in his eyes, one that quickly faded. Two sets of fingerprints on this cup, yours and the waiter's. Thanks for making my job so easy. Becca stood, cup in hand, not waiting for him to make the next move. With a low, intimate voice, she leaned over the table, her face inches from his, close enough to see through his expensive shades. And that bulge I detect? You'd better be damned glad to see me and have a permit to carry that weapon. If not, you'll find the next time we meet I won't be shy about using my handcuffs. For the first time, the guy looked as if she had caught him off guard, but the instant was gone in the flick of his eyelash. Shy doesn't suit you. He stood and smiled. Cockiness had been replaced by an element of sadness in his expression, yet in a seductive gesture, he leaned toward her, Reacting on pure instinct, she closed her eyes and focused on the moment. The warmth of his skin and his subtle cologne triggered her imagination. Becca's heart stopped. Instead of the kiss she expected, his soft whisper teased her ear. I would have been disappointed if you hadn't made a move for my prince. I look forward to seeing you again, Rebecca. After setting a hundred-dollar bill on the table, he turned and walked away, back the way he had come, 
She watched until he melded with the foot traffic on the street, her heart still pounding with a rush of his intimacy. After a long moment, Becca gave in to a smile as she gazed down at the coffee cup, her clever coup. She would enjoy discovering the name of her mystery man and the identity of his benefactor, and she'd have a front row seat to gauge their reactions when she sprang the news of a dead body found at the Imperial. That should melt GQ's cool facade. He'd done his homework. Now time for Becca to do hers. A half-eaten burrito wrapped in foil lay atop Becca's desk. The smell of refried beans and old coffee filled her nostrils, almost a distraction. But nothing would divert her attention. She was a woman on a mission. Even though Danny was never far from her thoughts, it felt good to be working a case again. Most detective work was a painstaking grind, picking apart every detail until a thread of motive could be followed and backed by irrefutable evidence. But it all began with the identification of the victim. So to start her thread, Becca jumped online to retrieve what information she could. She determined the time period for the original theater fabrication and the subsequent renovation through the public record filings for construction permits. This gave her a time frame within which to perform an extensive search of the archives for old missing persons cases. With her investigation narrowed by time period and females by age, she came down to five cases. One of those had been declared a hoax. The young woman had eloped with an older man, case closed. Two had turned into murder cases when the bodies were later found. One of those was still open. That left two cases— Becca made a note of the case numbers and submitted an electronic request to have the records pulled. Cases older than five years were archived in the bowels of the county courthouse, not stored with the newer evidence unit on South Frio Street. It would take time to locate the boxes. While she waited, Becca knew how to fill her time. GQ's dark eyes spurred her on. He had a name, and she'd find it. After leaving the sidewalk bistro, she walked the man's coffee cup back to the theater. A CSI tech bagged it and would process it for prints. And she obtained the recording of the rabble of onlookers outside the theater. She watched it several times, committing each face to memory. Yet she had to shake her head when she noticed that her mystery man had done a vanishing act. Cagey bastard. Guess you don't care for the limelight. Luckily, the tech doing the recording backed up his work, with a detailed listing of the license plates with the makes and models of all vehicles. GQ's license plate among them. She ran his tag through the Department of Motor Vehicles. According to the DMV, the car was registered to Global Enterprises, a corporation she knew nothing about. She ran a check of the name against local businesses. Still nothing. Not what I expected, she muttered as she sat back in her desk chair. But before she redirected her attention... Becca returned her focus to the ownership history of the Imperial Theater. Let's see what's floating out in cyberspace. Moving to the edge of her seat, she popped her knuckles like a concert pianist. Nearly oblivious to the ringing phones, conversations, and people traffic through the bullpen of the Homicide Division, she sat at her metal desk, fingers tapping her keyboard. She knew her first step would be the property ownership records— if she found the owner of the Imperial, she could zero in on her mystery man, killing two buzzards with one stone. In most cases, she would have hit pay dirt searching the county tax assessor's records, but nothing doing. Her research only produced the name of a non-profit organization dedicated to the preservation and restoration of historic buildings for cultural use. She had to dig deeper, back to the original owner, on a lark, she keyed the Imperial Theater and San Antonio into an internet search engine. Thank God and Al Gore for the internet. She smiled, bathed in the pale light off her computer monitor. She scored 360,000 records. Becca tried a couple of other queries and a more advanced search to fine-tune the hits. Eventually, her persistence paid off. Bingo. An old newspaper archive contained an article announcing the dedication of the Imperial as a historic building, complete with photographs taken at the front of the structure. A bright, sunny day. With a twinge of deja vu, Becca remembered reading the article when it was first published. Less than a year ago, the mayor and the elite of San Antonio had gathered for the occasion. 
Even though the photo held many smiling faces in the foreground, one set of dark eyes lurked in the shadows of the theater entrance, behind the key players, and he looked anything but happy. No name for her mystery man in the caption, but she was one step closer to identifying him. Becca searched the article for any name construed as a benefactor affiliated with the property. Gotcha. I'd say ownership constitutes an affiliation, wouldn't you, Mr. Crypto? Her success produced a smile that faded when she read the name of the theater owner aloud. Hunter Cavanaugh. Thanks for the warning, Slick. When you said he was powerful and nasty, you weren't kidding. Cavanaugh had a reputation, good and bad. On the surface, he appeared to be a high-powered member of the community with far-reaching political ties. She had no idea the extent of those connections. Somehow, Cavanaugh had parlayed old family money into an international conglomerate focused on the travel industry. A sudden turn of good fortune? Becca stared at the archived photo displayed on the computer monitor, looking at the eyes of Hunter Cavanaugh. I'm not a big fan of coincidence. Since Cavanaugh donated the theater to a nonprofit charity, shifting title to another organization, her insurance fraud angle bit the dust. Of course, she had to confirm the details, but the man wasn't exactly hurting for cash either. This time, Becca did a search on Global Enterprises and the name Cavanaugh. She scored numerous hits, printing out press releases, financial documents, and newspaper articles on a merger between Cavanaugh's travel company and Global Enterprises almost three years ago. What do we have here? She knitted her brow and lowered her chin, staring at her computer screen. Once again, a familiar face skulked in the background of another newspaper photo, eyes she would know anywhere. Only this time, Cavanaugh was nowhere in sight. Another suit posed in the foreground. You sure get around, Slick. After skimming the article, she printed the material and reread the pages. On the surface, the New York-based Global Enterprises invested in resorts abroad, with some domestic locations. On paper, the merger made sense. But when the article told of how the corporate head, Joseph Rivera, had been accused of racketeering, Becca smelled money laundering. Rivera's case had been dismissed on a technicality, no doubt through the efforts of high-priced legal help. The name Rivera didn't ring a bell, but after reading the story, she came to one conclusion— GQ had connections to the mob. With his ties to the heavy hitters of New York as well as to Kavanaugh, her gut told her he might be pulling double duty. Could he be working for more than one boss? At first, Becca saw Kavanaugh's link to mob money as one of the reasons his travel business diversified and flourished. But from what she knew about Kavanaugh, the man had too big an ego. He wouldn't stand for a spy operating in his midst or welcome any interference from an outside source in the form of someone he deemed lower on the food chain. Kavanaugh might be fueling the engines of the mafia train with GQ on board for the ride, doing his dirty work. That kind of combo was dangerous enough, but she didn't want to get caught in the middle of a turf war. Something didn't add up. The news story made her stomach lurch for another reason, a personal one. How could she have been so wrong about her mystery man? She had sensed the danger but overlooked it, finding something redeeming in his eyes. She had to admit it. A more powerful urge had overruled her better judgment. The man rattled her, touched her in a way she had never experienced. If he stood in her way, could she ignore her personal feelings to do her job? Only one way to find out. Becca heaved a sigh. When her desk phone rang, she answered, Montgomery. Hey, Rebecca. She recognized the voice of Sam Hastings, her CSI guy. Those fingerprints on the coffee cup? We ran them against NCIC without any luck, but through AFIS, we got a hit off firearms registration. Your boy's name is Diego Galvin, and he's got a permit to carry concealed in Texas. The FBI's National Crime Information Center contained computerized criminal justice information, available to law enforcement 24-7, and the state's automated fingerprint indexing system had been created to store fingerprints from a myriad of sources, from the private to public sector. AFIS also linked with a national repository system maintained by the FBI, allowing law enforcement to perform national criminal record searches, all in the spirit of cooperation. But not every state participated in the effort. 
So even with the high-tech assistance, criminals still fell through the crack in this multi-jurisdictional computerized world. Becca made a note of Galvin's name in her casebook. I'll send over my findings. Anything else you need on this? Sam asked. As Becca listened, her request for the archived missing persons cases arrived. Two boxes were shoved onto a corner of her desk. After adding her initials to a receipt log, she smiled and waved to the delivery kid, keeping up her end of the conversation. No, thanks for the quick turnaround. I'll do a little more digging on my own. Later. Now she had a name. Becca would cross-check it against other data sources to get a better picture of the man. She knew her search for Diego Galvin should take a back seat to the old case files, but it had become personal, and she knew it. Instead of going through the boxes right away, she got back on her computer, hoping to find greater insight into her mystery man. An hour later, she was no closer to answers. Damn it. Another blind alley in her research into Galvin's background. Becca justified the search as part of the case, but in her heart, she knew the truth. His dark eyes haunted her, dared her to dig deeper. The more Galvin eluded her, the more she dug, letting her stubborn streak get the better of her. A New Jersey driver's license and two credit cards went back six years or so. Prior to that, he was a ghost. Becca peeled away layer after layer, and still she couldn't get a glimpse of any pertinent history. His tax records might reveal something, but that would take time to retrieve, and a warrant signed by a federal judge. For a person of interest, she didn't have enough reason to justify the intrusion into his background, so she remained focused on the data at hand. No traffic citations or warrants outstanding. She had already learned that his current vehicle was registered in the name of Global Enterprises, but so was his insurance. Nothing to trace there. And to add to her frustration, for every record she uncovered, Becca found a different post office box. The guy lived in plain sight, but off the grid. You're good, Diego. Real good. Did Kavanaugh finance your disappearing act or someone else? Top-notch stuff. After running his prints without a hit, Becca had been stymied. His lack of a criminal record surprised her the most. She felt certain he had spent some quality time at the Gray Bar Hotel, maybe under a different name, a jaded cop's instincts, but she came up empty. You haven't beaten me yet, Galvin, she muttered. But I've almost got enough to pay a call on your benefactor, Hunter Cavanaugh. Still, a persistent question lingered in her mind. What was the purpose of Diego Galvin's warning against Cavanaugh? He had known who she was and staged the whole thing, right down to her late afternoon addiction to cappuccino with cinnamon. A part of her hoped he might make an interesting ally if it came to it. But she knew better than to be so gullible. In her line of work, trust had to be earned. Heading north on I-10, Diego Galvin watched the late afternoon sun glisten on the surface of a man-made lake at the gated entrance to the Dominion, a prestigious residential area located northwest of San Antonio. Mist from a shooting fountain cast a rainbow across a bridge made of cantera stone, a beautiful setting, but one he'd grown to resent. Seeing it meant he was twenty minutes from the private estate of Hunter Cavanaugh. He tightened his jaw as his stomach churned. No matter how idyllic the scene, he reacted with his usual conditioned reflex, like one of Pavlov's dogs at the ring of a bell. Get over it. You asked for this gig. On the last leg of the trip, vast ranch lands stretched across the interstate, Bordered by mesquite trees, sagebrush, and miles of barbed wire, cattle lulled by flowing creeks, with abandoned hay bales weathering in the sun, the hill country of Texas in all its glory. But as a hawk made lazy swirls in a cloudless sky, held aloft by an updraft, Diego found himself envious of the bird's freedom. It reminded him of the police detective who'd seen through his subterfuge. He knew by his outward appearance most people would see affluence and success. The carefully orchestrated facade, conjured up by Kavanaugh, reflected more on him than Diego, yet the colorful plumage of the rooster hadn't fooled Detective Rebecca Montgomery. Although he'd been pleased by her intellect, her honest insight had been an embarrassment, and he was to blame for that. Very perceptive, Rebecca. Saying her name aloud summoned a memory of her face, Spirited eyes, flawless skin, 
and lips that aroused his blood even now. Don't go there, Galvin. The woman deserves better. Jaw tight and eyes glued on the road ahead, Diego gripped the steering wheel of the Mercedes. He had taken the long way home, needing time to think. Rebecca's words stung like tequila poured into a gaping wound with a lime and salt chaser. If she hadn't been dead on with her assessment, he might have laughed it off. Looks like he's made a hefty down payment on his investment, she had said. The attractive detective sized him up as a man who could be bought. Diego couldn't argue the point. Her sentiments reflected the dread in his own gut. The wealth surrounding him had taken some time to get used to, but now the attached strings weighed heavy, an anchor around his neck. Somewhere along the way, he had turned a blind eye to his conscience, in complete denial of how much he'd changed over the years. Every day, a darker side of him emerged, and he had yet to draw the line. He'd convinced himself he couldn't afford to. So much had changed. Diego wasn't sure he could find his way back from the precipice. His only way out might involve a treacherous leap. He turned onto Citadel Drive, minutes from the elaborate front gates of the Kavanaugh estate. A mantle of oak trees gave an air of timelessness to the shaded driveway dappled by the sun. His cell phone rang as he picked up speed. Diego reached into the pocket of his suit and glanced at the display. With a grimace, he answered, Galvin, I expected a report before now. Low and intimate, the voice of Hunter Cavanaugh raised the hair on the back of his neck. Where are you? He thought for a moment and said what came to mind. I get paid to be thorough, not to report to you every five minutes like some mindless sycophant. One day, Diego knew his sarcasm would get him killed, and it would probably be at the hands of the man on the other end of the line. With reluctance, he responded to the question. I'll be there in five minutes. Dead silence. Finally, a raspy whisper came through the cell phone. Why do you continually try my patience? One of these days, I might surprise you and grant your death wish, Diego. If you put me out of my misery, people might think you've grown soft. The breathing on the other end of the line changed. A low, menacing noise turned into full-blown laughter, devoid of any real humor. Diego pictured the older man's face, aristocratic features tainted by fierce eyes of ice blue. You still amuse me, but don't take that for granted. The contempt was hard to miss. I want a full report when you get here. The line went dead. What the hell are you thinking, Galvin? He muttered, dropping the cell phone onto the passenger seat. A death wish. An astute observation. For him to deal with Kavanaugh, a death wish made the job interesting, like playing catch using a live grenade. Yet at some point, his insane game would come to an abrupt end. Diego could accept the consequences with only his life on the line, but Detective Rebecca Montgomery posed a problem. She'd confront Kavanaugh on the arson fire, no wiser than dangling a red bandana in front of a deranged bull. The man would fix his sights and not let go, toying with her for mere sport. No matter how gutsy and smart she might be, the detective would have her hands full trying to outwit him. His vast resources and unrivaled cruelty would give Kavanaugh the advantage. Diego had seen him in action too many times. With the growing demands of his job, Diego found his life tough enough, but Rebecca could bring down his makeshift house of cards. At first glance, the woman didn't have the savvy to play on Kavanaugh's turf. But what she lacked in expertise, she more than made up for with nerve and determination. Gut instinct told him Rebecca wouldn't back off. He'd seen the conviction in her eyes. Would he stick his neck out for her? Taking on that kind of responsibility might tip the scales of his balancing game, force him to make a move off dead center. The risk might get him killed. Don't get stupid. Not now. Diego swore under his breath as he turned onto the cobblestone drive of Kavanaugh's stronghold, his gilded cage. This book is continued on disc two. No One Heard Her Scream by Jordan Dane continued. Disc two. Becca spent the late afternoon behind her desk, 
dredging up the tragic past of two young women still missing. Their lives had taken a perverse detour, severed from their families by a faceless evil. She understood the enduring pain of their loved ones. Not knowing was the worst. Taken from the archived evidence boxes, photographs of the victims provided by the families morphed into Danny's face. Her eyes, her smile, an unfulfilled future. For an instant, Becky even thought she smelled her sister's perfume, lingering in the air, triggering a haunting and pervasive guilt. She shut her eyes tight, holding back the tears that were never far from the surface. Keep digging. Becca took a deep breath and plunged into the boxes for more. Her instincts told her the answer might be at the next turn of a page. A young woman, buried in a very dark place, had died alone, with only a futile scream to break the silence that marked her passing from this life. Putting a name to the bones at the medical examiner's was step one to finding her killer. Yet something in the photograph of Isabel Marquez drew her attention time and time again, and in the quiet of the late afternoon, she almost heard the girl whispering, Look again, or you'll miss it. She held up the high school class photo once more, a pretty young girl captured forever in a happier time, with a mischievous grin and eyes graced by innocence. Although her thoughts turned to Danielle, Becca wanted to remember the face of Isabel, as if it would be possible for her to forget. Wait a minute. I knew that name sounded familiar. Finally, it clicked. The word coincidence raised a red flag. She'd seen the name of Marquez earlier in the day. Becca remembered something from the list of license tags taken by a CSI tech outside the destroyed theater. Standing hunched over her desk, she rummaged through the accumulating piles of paper, searching for the report she received earlier. As she suspected, the name of Marquez was on the list. A red Ford F-150 truck registered to Rudy Marquez. After a quick look in the case file, she learned that Isabel's father had been deceased at the time she went missing, but her mother and two brothers filed the initial report. Rudy was one of Isabel's brothers. To place a face with the name, she replayed the CSI video, hoping to get a fix on the owner of the truck. Of all the people gathered outside the Imperial Theater, one set of eyes reflected a different level of interest than the rest of the rabble, and she knew, without confirmation, she'd found Rudy Marquez amidst the gawkers, standing by a red truck. That's gotta be you, she whispered. What are you up to? Becca felt certain it wasn't idle curiosity that had drawn the man to the theater, but so much remained unexplained. Did Rudy Marquez know anything about the dead body found at the Imperial? And was there any connection to Hunter Cavanaugh, the one-time owner of the property, a man dangerous enough for the mysterious Diego Galvin to risk his own neck to warn her? Questions flooded her mind. But when she picked up the school photo of Isabel again, she knew she had a solid lead. Her eye caught another reason to make the trip to see Marquez. Well, I'll be damned. Right under my nose all along. After a nibble on the corner of her mouth, she smiled. Thanks, Isabel. Chapter 3 Becca headed west on General McMullen, a bustling six-lane thoroughfare, a place where men still stood on busy street corners hawking newspapers, taking their lives in their hands to peddle bad news. Businesses along the way were mostly converted houses, painted in vivid reds, yellows, and electric blues. In the light of day, the paint colors could do some serious damage to perfectly good eyeballs if a person stared too long. Now, with the sun on a downward spiral, the boulevard would soon blaze in neon, and the night shift rabble would scurry from their hiding places like cockroaches on party patrol. Under the heading of surreal, churches wedged between bars, tattoo parlors, hooker hotspots, and tarot card readers. An eclectic hodgepodge of vice and redemption offered up in a single locale, yet despite the rough nature of the neighborhood, a steady vitality pulsed through the district like blood coursing through an artery. Before she hit the intersection of Castroville Road, Becca turned her crown vic down a side street near Taqueria Vallarta, one of her favorite places to grab a bite. The restaurant served killer barbacoa in fresh corn tortillas, a traditional weekend treat. 
and if Jose Cuervo took unfair advantage of her the night before, a mega bowl of menudo would do the trick. The breakfast of champions. In the hood, you couldn't beat the aromas. The dinner hour and her stomach growled in response. But as hungry as she was, Becca had too much on her mind to stop. After turning onto San Bernardo Street, she spotted the red F-150 of Rudy Marquez and pulled in behind the vehicle. Glittering in the waning sun, rosary beads hung from the rearview mirror of the truck, a common display in town. But the man was nowhere in sight. Before she got out, Becca scanned the neighborhood and confirmed the street address. House numbers reflected off a rusted white mailbox that listed to one side, its concrete base uprooted. She'd found the place. The Marquez family lived in a dingy white clabbered house with window frames and front door painted in a bright blue, the paint peeling in spots. A dismal pit the size of a matchbox. Even though wrought iron covered every window and door of the house, no doubt meant as a deterrent to crime, the rundown condition of the property should have been enough to discourage a criminal looking for a quick score. What could these people possess that would be worth stealing? But she knew better. Criminals preyed on the poor who lacked the resources to do anything about it. So much went unreported. Becca heaved a sigh and got out of her car, shifting her thoughts to how she would conduct her interview with Marquez. Until she got a sense of Rudy's part in all this, she had to play her cards right. A chain-link fence bordered patches of green in front of the Marquez place. Weeds and dandelions had locked horns with what remained of the St. Augustine grass, Yard work and house repairs were low on the family's list of priorities. They had enough on their minds. With casebook and pen in hand, Becca stepped inside the cyclone fence and clanked the gate shut behind her. Yellow ribbons made of plastic fluttered in the breeze, tied to a scrawny mesquite tree, a reminder of the family's loss. A stone shrine stood near the cement front stoop with a ceramic statue of the Virgin Mary gazing down, arms outstretched. Placed under rocks to hold them in place, laminated photos of Isabel had weathered and were lying at the foot of the sculpture, a sad memorial. For a long moment, Becca stared at the grotto, wanting to pray, but the words wouldn't come. Can I help you? A thick Hispanic accent. As she turned, the glare of sunset hit her sight line, blaze orange on a last-ditch assault. Becca squinted and raised a hand to block the light. From what she saw, the silhouette of a man stood inside the screen door, his face in shadow. She reached for her badge and held it up. My name is Detective Rebecca Montgomery. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Is this about Isabel? The man's face came out from the dark. Becca stopped, taken back by the sight. He had an uncanny resemblance to the missing girl. Yet the white collar had been a complete surprise. Standing in the threshold of the Marquez house stood a priest. Are you a family member, father? Intense dark eyes framed by a full head of black hair, dark skin, medium height and build. Although she saw the family resemblance, this man's stern expression hardened the Marquez likeness, gave it an edge. Yes, I'm Victor Marquez. Isabel is my sister. The priest struggled with whether to use the present tense. She knew the feeling. He didn't open the screen door only stared out the mesh, using it as a fragile barrier against what would come next. Becca knew the look, had seen it many times before as a detective delivering bad news. Now, after what happened to her own sister, she knew firsthand how dread mixed with the strange sensation of relief for it to be over. A gut-wrenching contradiction. Even though the priest set his jaw and steeled himself for what she would say, his eyes couldn't hide the pain, Becca raised her chin and took a deep breath as she walked up the steps to the front door. She had to be the cop now, not the victim. Don't read too much into this, Beck. He's not your personal mirror. Stay objective. Easier said than done. Do you mind if I come in? For a moment, she didn't know if he would allow it. Eventually, he did. Sparse furnishings, but the place looked clean. A faint hint of pine cleaner played second fiddle to the pungent aroma of roasted jalapenos and bell pepper, someone making salsa. Scented candles burned near the entry. Another shrine for Isabel dominated the tiny living room. Keepsakes and photos of the missing Marquez girl were cast in the pale glow of flickering red votive candles. 
Isabel had been elevated to sainthood by her family. Becca understood the sentiment. In death, the imperfections of the victim were forgotten. The priest noticed her attention to the memorial. My mother tells me the constant reminder helps her cope. His words were punctuated with a sigh. But you don't think so? He shrugged. Why are you here, detective? Before Becca answered, an older woman entered the room from the kitchen, wearing a blue house frock and a faded green apron, wiping her hands with a rag. Petite and rail thin, Hortense Marquez looked as if she'd been crying. Her eyes still brimmed with the sheen of tears. She wore a yellow bandana wrapped around her head, and curly wisps of gray hair poked out from under it. Grief etched her face, making the woman appear older than her years, and despite the memorial of hope she'd set up in her living room, despair had found a home in this woman's eyes. Becca knew the look all too well. This is my mother. Please excuse us. After a quiet exchange in Spanish with the priest, the woman forced a smile and nodded before she left the room. But not before she gave Becca one final look, one she'd seen from her own mother's eyes. Although Becca knew only enough Spanish to be dangerous, no words were necessary. For the things that really mattered in life, there were no language barriers. Once they were alone, the priest gestured for her to take a seat. Was there some reason you didn't tell her I was with the SAPD? She asked as she sat on a green floral love seat, armrests frayed on the corners. Her English is not good. No sense in alarming her until I know. Something for sure. Father Victor took a seat across from her, a wooden chair that had seen better days. I'm investigating your sister's disappearance. Before she went on, the priest interrupted. Investigating? It's been almost seven years. Why have the police taken an interest now? Suspicion narrowed his eyes. Father Victor had set aside his religious affiliation to become brother to Isabel, the patience and generosity of his profession forgotten. I know this must be difficult, but... No! How could you know? He lashed out, his face racked with grief. But when he looked into Becca's eyes, he stopped himself. I suppose you see a lot of families like this. Unfortunately, that's true, but it's still not the same as going through it. Becca met his gaze. She wanted to stop, not go any further. Maybe it was his white collar, or maybe she saw herself in him, like a mirror. My baby sister, Danielle, she was taken and killed. We never found her body. The priest stared at her in disbelief. They sat in silence. The quiet gave Becca a strange comfort. She looked away to give him time to recover, or maybe she needed the time. But when she looked up, the priest's eyes glistened with tears. The sudden display of sympathy caught Becca by surprise. He reached for her hand, his fingers clutching hers. Becca flinched at his gesture. She hadn't been touched in a very long time. But Eve, you never found her body. How could you know for sure? He asked. How could you know? His words brought back a flood of doubts. Her acceptance of Danny's death had never felt real. She gave it lip service, but in the end, she didn't believe it herself, not without a body. Becca felt an old, familiar wall erecting. The tiny living room closed in on her. She gritted her teeth and pulled her hand away. Becca couldn't deal with his pity. We... I know, father. She squeezed the casebook in her hand. Although closure for the Marquez family had its inescapable merits, she didn't want to be the one to rob this family of hope. Still, she had a job to do, her usual mantra. But as the flickering red votive candles of Isabel's shrine taunted her, a disturbing thought took hold. Had she really given up on Danny so easily? An empty casket, the headstone... Becca believed she'd done the right thing to give her mother closure, but now it all felt like such a betrayal. She avoided the priest's stare and took a deep breath. Are you all right, detective? Yes, I'm fine. She cleared her throat to shake off the emotion. No sense in prolonging this. We've found some remains that may be your sister's. I'll need a sample of the family's DNA to help with the identification. Father Victor shut his eyes and lowered his head, a quiet prayer. At least the man had his faith to give him strength. 
She gave him a moment, gazing around the room. Her eyes found a Marquez family photo hung on a nearby wall. In his priest garb, Victor stood behind his mother with Rudy and Isabel at her side, a picture taken at a happier time. It reminded Becca of another photograph, the one she'd brought with her from evidence. I'm so sorry for what your family has gone through, she added in a quiet tone. Father Victor, can you tell me anything about the necklace your sister is wearing here? Becca showed him a photograph from her casebook, evidence from the archived box on the Marquez missing person case. Earlier, she had recognized the gold jewelry in the photo as being the same item recovered from the bones at the theater. I remember this. The Isabel I knew never could have afforded such a necklace. He clenched his jaw and held the picture in his hand, his eyes glazed over by the past. She told me she bought it for herself, but I never believed that. At the time, I heard she was dating an older man, someone with money. But she would never talk about it, not with me. If she didn't talk to you about it, Father, who did she talk to? How could you know about the older man if she wasn't the one who told you? It's been so long ago, I forgot. By his expression, Becca could tell she'd surprised him by her question, and his answer had been too abrupt. Coupled with the shift in his eyes, he looked like a man concocting a story. After the priest handed back the school photo, he shifted in his chair, a guarded posture. Another sign of his reluctance, Becca tried a different approach. The piece looks like a unique design. Can you tell me anything more about the heart charm? I'm afraid I can't help you with that. With a fingernail, Father Victor picked at a chip in the armrest of his chair, avoiding her eyes. Another stall, and another dead end. Well, who could help me? When he didn't answer right away, she tried another avenue. Becca had to get him talking again. Did you all grow up in this house, Father? Yes, we did. A faint smile. My mother did the best she could, raising us after my father died. Tight quarters, and only one bathroom? After he nodded, Becca smiled. That could test the strength of a family for sure. It wasn't so bad after I moved out. St. Mary's Seminary in Houston. The Archdiocese gave me a scholarship. Good opportunity for you, but I bet Isabel and Rudy still fought over the bathroom even after you left. Typical brother-sister stuff, huh? No, oh, no. It wasn't like that. Isabel and Rudy got along great. They were inseparable, really. They shared... He stopped himself. So Isabel and Rudy were close, she asked. The memory opened fresh wounds for the priest. Becca witnessed a dark haze spread across his face. Maybe Isabel confided in Rudy about the necklace and who might have given it to her. Do you know what she told him, father? How would I know that? I didn't even live here anymore. I can't help you, detective. I have no idea what they talked about. Maybe Rudy can help me. Where is he now? He's at work, but no telling when he'll be home. Is this really necessary? How does he get to work, father? She persisted. She kept up the questions, hoping to distract him. And her constant use of his title was deliberate, reminding him of his calling. He drives himself. Normally. The man hadn't lied. The word normally was a smokescreen. Normally, a very clever one, but not today. Not when she knew about the truck outside. Why all the questions about my brother? And why all the resistance, father? She wanted to ask. But if she did, his limited cooperation would dry up in a hurry. Evasive didn't begin to describe how Father Victor had reacted to her questions about Rudy. Excuse me, father. But what kind of vehicle does he drive? She painted him in a corner to see if he'd lie about the truck. He took a long moment to think, his moment of truth, or not. But by the defeated look in his eye, she knew there was no point to continue along this line of questioning. You know, Father, it won't take me any time to run a DMV check on the red F-150 parked in front. You want to save me some time? Why would you assume that truck belongs to my brother? Suspicion edged his face, but by his contrite tone, she knew the man was more on the defense than on the offense. Becca was still in control. Yet for her to admit she knew for certain the truck belonged to the cleric's brother, she might tip her hand on Rudy's trip to the Imperial, and she wasn't ready to do that. Call it a hunch? 
Your mother doesn't look like the F-150 type, in red, no less. Is the truck yours, father? She had no idea if Roman Catholic priests owned vehicles or not. No, I came in a few days ago. Rudy lets me borrow his truck when I'm in town. My parish, St. John's, is in Houston. So how did Rudy get to work today? It took him a long moment to respond. He knew she had gotten the better of him again. I drove him, he replied. Before she asked another question, he pressed, Detective, what are you after? If all you want is to talk about that necklace and get a DNA sample, I can help you. There's no need to dredge up the past with my brother. Tough cookie. A priest with street smarts and a stubborn streak to boot. Father Victor was not making this easy. Being the oldest, he slipped into his big brother role with ease. When it came to Rudy, the man put up one hell of a roadblock. After taking a deep breath, the priest softened his expression and tried another approach. Look, tomorrow I promise to bring my brother by your precinct. We'll cooperate with the DNA testing, but I'd like to be present while you speak to Rudy. As kids, he and Isabel were very close. I'm afraid this will break his heart. Can you understand that, Detective Montgomery? I'm trying to protect my family. What's left of it? Becca handed the priest her business card. When would be a convenient time to talk to your brother? I'll bring him by after work, around six if that's not too late. That's fine. Just ask for me. Becca wanted him on her side. You want closure for your family, don't you, father? Without looking up from her business card, he nodded. Please, help me do that. She leaned forward, resisting the urge to touch him. It must be hard for you, not living here. For an instant, pain tinged his expression. The conversation had turned personal again. I came in for my sister's birthday. It was yesterday. He couldn't look her in the eye. Instead, Victor stared at Isabel's shrine, his eyes mesmerized by the flickering candles. We still celebrate her special day. My mother even wraps a gift, saving each one for when, Isabel. He steepled his fingers and pinched the bridge of his nose, slouching back in his chair with eyes closed. It's been hard for all of us. I stayed with my mother today after I drove my brother to work early this morning. Danielle's birthday wasn't for another couple of months. Becca wondered what she and her mother would do to mark the occasion. The thought twisted her gut into a knot until she replayed what he had said in her mind. Out of curiosity, what kind of work does Rudy do? He's a mason. Works for various subcontractors. The construction business in San Antonio is quite healthy. He does okay. Those guys work hard. He must have a pretty long day. What are his usual hours? Dawn to dusk this time of year. If Rudy was at work by dawn and without his truck, who had been outside the Imperial Theater mid-morning? Was Victor telling the truth about his hours or protecting his brother once again? Okay. She had to admit it. The brothers looked so much alike that Becca didn't know if she'd made a mistake in assuming the crime scene videotape had been of Rudy in front of the theater. But maybe the DMV records influenced that decision. Thinking back, she recalled a man stood by the truck in worn jeans, a sweatshirt, and a jacket. Sans the white collar of a priest in uniform, she would have remembered a priest. Doubts leached into her brain. Which one had been outside the Imperial? Well, I won't take up any more of your time, Father. Becca stood... The sooner we get things resolved, the better. Maybe you and I can find our answers. Bring Isabel home once and for all. And maybe some questions are better left unanswered. Before she replied, he gestured for the door and walked her out. See you tomorrow, detective. Becca walked down the short sidewalk to the gate, resisting the urge to look over her shoulder. She felt the priest's eyes at her back. All she wanted was to shed light on a despicable crime but this interview drilled another point home. She needed to learn much more about Isabel and Rudy. And after meeting Victor, new questions stirred in her mind. The priest knew more than he said. Her investigation had taken a 180-degree turn. Paseo del Rio, the Riverwalk, downtown San Antonio. Staring out the window of her small condo on the Riverwalk, 
Becca took a swig of lukewarm beer, ignoring the flat taste. Her eyes took in every detail, yet nothing registered in her mind. The trip to the Marquez house had struck a personal chord, setting her into a deep funk. Becca ran fingers through her dark hair and pulled down the sleeves to her SAPD sweats. Even though Father Victor Marquez looked anything but happy, the priest still had his family to protect. He ran interference for both his brother Rudy and their mother, a tight bond. In sharp contrast, Becca had closed down to deal with her grief, shutting herself off from anyone who got too close, especially after Mama did the same. Before the abduction that ended Danielle's life, Becca would have bet good money on the underlying strength of her family, but in the end, the tie to her grieving mother had been as fragile as glass. Maybe they were too much alike. She remembered her last visit with Mama, hearing the words that broke her heart. Get out! Leave me alone, damn it! Her mother screamed, her face red and swollen with rage, her breath bitter from alcohol. Who are you to preach to me about needing anyone but yourself? My baby is dead. I got nothing. Like a sucker punch to the belly, Mama's words struck deep, even as Becca stared out her window, reliving the past. You got me, Mama, she whispered. For what it's worth, you still have me. All she had tried to do that day was get her mother into rehab and counseling. Her drinking had gotten out of control. With the therapy, they could have taken it together, but Mama wanted no part of it. When her mother drank, her rage took over. First, the focus was little day-to-day -day stuff, but as time and grief wore on, her anger shifted to Danny's killers, the useless police investigation, with the final stages centering on herself, the kind of mother she had turned out to be, the failure. But eventually, Mama's rage took on a bitterness, all pointed at Becca, and that hurt the most. Sure, she could rationalize and say her mother hadn't really meant her cruel words, but an element of truth filtered through. When she dared to look into her personal failings, Becca discovered she had no one to trust, no one to share how she felt. A harsh reality check. Her job and her ambition had always been enough, until now. Mama had a point. God, I hate this. When will it ever stop? Becca took a deep breath, stifling the lump wedged in her throat. The unending hurt had left her bone weary. She hadn't realized she'd been crying. Trembling fingers wiped away the tears. She glanced back at the clock on the far wall, almost midnight. The sounds outside her window died down to a muffled thump, a jazz band nearing last call. And the dregs of city traffic, coming from the streets of Crockett and Presa, had been reduced to a vague notion carried on the breeze. Despite the surge of emotions welling inside her, the familiar cacophony gave her a strange comfort. Her home was nothing to brag about, but it had become a safe haven, of sorts. Martha Stewart wouldn't be knocking on her door looking for housekeeping tips, but her condo had been an amazing return on her investment, inheritance money from her grandmother. On a cop's salary, she couldn't touch the locale. For most people, the noise might have made it difficult to sleep, yet Becca found the steady clamor of downtown to be soothing. Up until Danielle first went missing, now it didn't matter much. She and sleep had parted ways, irreconcilable differences. Becca wiped her cheeks with the sleeve of her sweatshirt and stretched her back. The muscles between her shoulder blades felt stiff, and her thighs were sore, the result of her early morning workout, self-inflicted abuse. After grabbing a fresh beer from the fridge, she walked toward her fire escape window, heading for her nightly ritual. Raising the window, Becca ducked through and stepped onto the first landing, cold beer in hand, her skin erupted in goosebumps when her bare feet hit the cool cement. She made a short climb up the fire escape and over the parapet wall to her rooftop garden, an oasis she maintained to preserve her own sanity. Rather than flick on the festive white Christmas lights she had strung across the ornamental garden, tonight Becca preferred the anonymity of the dark. She pulled up a lawn chair and rested her elbows on the brick ledge, gazing to the river below. Becca took a sip of her corona, feeling the chill rush through her. She shut her eyes and listened to the sounds of the city. A drift on the cool breeze was the faint smell of the river, the earthy essence of stale humidity mixed with the lingering aroma of fajitas, a gift from the Casa Rio restaurant. She opened her eyes to glance toward the river bend, 
At this hour, festive lights shimmered along the water and made a dramatic silhouette of the weeping bowers of cypress trees. From a nearby club, a muffled voice on a microphone announced last call, and the jazz band began its final short set. She knew the drill and listened to every note, letting time sift through her fingers like sand. But as her gaze drifted toward the music, something peculiar caught her eye, triggering her cop instincts into high gear. A lone man stood at the crest of a stone bridge over the river, his body silhouetted by a pale light. Becca craned her neck to get a better view. Squinting, she tried to catch a look at his face. Her mind played tricks. It made no sense, yet she pictured Diego's handsome face in her mind. Come on, Beck, no way, she muttered. From her perch, foot traffic this time of night always drew her attention, but this man stood still, almost a fixture. He melded with the footbridge as if he were part of the stonework. She almost missed him. But suddenly, he moved. He held something in his hand, raising it to his face in a sweeping gesture. Even though his features were shrouded in darkness, the object caught the light before he tossed it into the water. She leaned forward, hoping to get a glimpse of what he'd thrown. It floated on the water's surface, buoyant, not heavy enough to sink. A bulb of white caught in the lazy current of the river, as it drifted by her vantage point, under the reflection from a security light, she recognized it, a single white rose. The flower bobbed on the water, faint ripples skimmed the surface, undulating with every movement of the rose. Becca furrowed her brow and peered through the shadows toward the bridge, searching for him, nothing. She stood and leaned over the parapet wall, straining to see under the heavy bower of trees. Up the river and down, he was nowhere in sight gone. How did he disappear so fast? Damn it. Becca's heart picked up the pace to match the jazz band downriver, pounding for all the wrong reasons. Her face flushed. She searched every shadow, yet eventually gave up on finding him. Clenching her jaw, she wrapped her arms across her chest to ward off the chill of the night breeze. The wind rustled the trees of her garden, stirring a memory. Becca pictured Diego's lips, his strong jawline, and she remembered the gentle touch of his large hands when he wiped the smudge off her chin. But most of all, his dark eyes haunted her. You better put him out of your head, Beck. The man's trouble. No doubt it had only been her imagination that willed the stranger to be him. A heaping dose of wishful thinking and a couple of Coronas hadn't hurt either. Last call. She raised the bottle of beer to her lips and downed the rest. With empty bottle in hand, Becca navigated the steps down, her mind preoccupied with the image of the man on the bridge. As she turned to her window near the landing, Becca caught a glimpse of something, her eyes fixed on it. What the hell? A breath jammed in her throat. Another white rose lay on the cement near the open window to her condo. On pure instinct, she pressed her back against the outside wall, hiding in the shadows, Becca didn't want to be silhouetted by the light coming from her living room, making herself a target. Her eyes searched the darkness, squinting to regain her night vision. After a long moment, she felt certain her mystery man had skipped. Exercising caution, she inched her way toward the window and peered in. Everything was like she left it, but had he been inside? She hadn't been gone long, but damn it, the man was a ghost, a blasted ghost. Annie had the gall to leave a calling card, one that would lurk in her memory for nights to come. Either he knew her routine or he'd waited for the right opportunity. Why? None of this made sense. He could have come and gone without her knowing it. Instead, he chose to leave a rose and made a show of calling her attention to it. A very deliberate act. A romantic gesture tinged with an element of danger. The man had some kind of personal agenda involving her, but she had no clue what it could be. Not yet. Becca knew she'd see Diego tomorrow when she called on Hunter Cavanaugh. Maybe that thought played on her subconscious more than she realized. Or maybe her loneliness had triggered the illusion of romance, driven by her need to be touched by someone. Either way, she had to be careful. She knew nothing about his past, only that Diego Galvin had unsavory connections to the mob and traveled in dangerous circles. Their worlds could not be farther apart, cop and criminal. Tainted and forbidden fruit. That's all he represented to her. No way she'd allow anything to happen between them. Becca crawled back through the window. 
After a quick search of the premises, gun in hand, she found nothing out of the ordinary. She locked up for the night, flicking off lights as she went. One last time, Becca stood in the dark by the window, scanning every shadow along the river. Who the hell are you, Diego? She whispered, and what do you want from me? Chapter 4 Barefoot and dressed in jeans and a black t-shirt, Diego sat in the kitchen before dawn, a morning ritual he'd cultivated since taking up residence at Cavanaugh's estate. He preferred to be alone with his newspaper and coffee before the onslaught of the chef and his kitchen crew. Diego lived amidst the pampering, but he fended for himself, keeping Cavanaugh and his staff at bay. No one knew his comings and goings by design. And this morning, although he held the newspaper in his hand, Diego hadn't retained a single word. An image from last night replayed in his mind over and over. Drawn to the river walk, he had stood in the shadows watching her. That's all he intended to do. But Rebecca held him there, spellbound from the first tear. He still pictured her staring out the window, a beautiful face tainted by sadness. And all he wanted to do was hold her. Clearly the woman could handle herself, so why had he been so hell-bent on taking her in his arms? Diego knew the answer, had avoided it like a scourge. He'd been alone for so long. Maybe he'd mistaken her need of comfort for his own. And that thought scared the hell out of him. The isolation of his work, of his life, had sowed a seed of restlessness. He no longer accepted the way things were, and the seed had sprouted, threatening to take root. The white roses had been plucked from a vendor's cart, an afterthought, the only way he could touch her and still keep his distance. But judging by her reaction, when she shoved her back against the wall in fear, he should have resisted the urge. He hadn't intended to frighten her with the gesture. But what the hell had he intended? That first day. He should never have made contact with her outside the Imperial. Big mistake. Now he was behaving like an idiot. He had no right to meddle in her personal life. Someone like Rebecca would never... Intruding on his thoughts, a hulking presence blocked the overhead light, casting a shadow on his day and the sports section. The ugly face of Matt Brogan looked down at him. Where were you last night? Out. Diego found single syllables worked best. Not good enough. Brogan, the bully. A shaved, meaty head atop broad shoulders with no neck. So early in the morning and the man wore a suit. Diego had never seen him without one. For all he knew, he wore the damned thing to bed, tie and all. But no matter how expensive the label, Brogan wore designer duds like they came off the rack. That about sized the man up, and those were his good points. He didn't like Brogan's advantage over him, so he got up and moved, using the pretense of refilling his coffee mug. Brogan stood a head higher and outweighed him by 50 pounds, easy. Diego preferred to keep his distance, choosing a spot across a food preparation island to stand and sip his coffee. Besides, the hanging pots and pans blocked his view of the man's fleshy face, a side benefit. Who died and made you hull monitor, Brogan? You were just pissed because I ditched you. You had no business following me, especially when you're no good at it. Brogan had been dropped on his head as a child. At least that's what Diego preferred to believe. Brain damage explained a lot. No sane mother would have raised a child using Brogan as a prototype. You don't know nothing about my business, he blustered, ready to pick a fight as usual. As far as I'm concerned, you're some kind of outsider around here. You're nothing but a damned watchdog with a fancy pedigree forced on us by Rivera and Global Enterprises. And those New York boys don't know squat about our operations in Texas unless the old man tells them. The way I see it, Rivera needs us a hell of a lot more than we need you, so don't push your luck, mutt. The merger with Global is working as it should be for now, and I'm here to see that both sides live up to the agreement. But you cause a blip on Castengra's radar screen, and you'll see how much he needs you. Hell, even worse, I wouldn't want to be the guy that topples this house of cards for Kavanaugh. But maybe you're man enough to take both of them on. You threatening me? Diego shrugged. Actually, I'm conducting a scientific study on the correlation between abnormally high levels of machismo and stupidity. I think you'd make a perfect test subject. Brogan tightened his jaw and clenched his fists. 
but after a long moment, the arrogance evaporated from his face. Hey, I'm only looking out for boss man's interests, even if the old man is too blind to see through your lone wolf act. You've been spending too much time off the reservation. Don't think it's gone unnoticed. Diego laughed and placed a hand over his heart in mock sincerity, trying to downplay his behavior. He didn't need the suspicion. Can't a man have a love life without you knowing about it? He shrugged and shook his head, making light of it all. But I tell you, I'm touched. I had no idea you were such a concerned citizen, looking out for the welfare of others. Oh, this time I thought you only cared for numero uno. I see now I was wrong. Can you forgive me, mi amigo? Cut the bullshit. I don't trust you, Galvin. The man stepped closer, his eyes no bigger than slits. Diego had seen the look before, but usually rodents didn't come as big as Brogan. You're hiding something, Mex, and it's only a matter of time before I catch you running crossways of the old man. Then you're mine. Diego lowered his voice, his eyes on Brogan. A wise man would turn and walk away. Brogan sneered. Yeah? But which one of us is that smart? If you have to ask. Diego shrugged. In a surprise move, he turned to go, catching Brogan's reaction from the corner of his eye. Hey, don't you turn your back on me, you son of a bitch. The bigger man torqued his jaw and lowered his chin. He dodged the food prep island and lunged for Diego, yanking at his shirt to throw him off balance. Brogan punched him in the jaw, making the first move. That's all Diego needed. All his frustrations bubbled to the surface. In seconds, Brogan's assault would land another fist to Diego's face. He couldn't let him get the upper hand. He stiff-armed the grip Brogan had on his shirt and broke free, dodging the second blow. Ducking under the punch, Diego let the man's weight propel him forward, prodded by a shove of his own. And a well-placed kick to the man's ass sent him sprawling. Brogan hit the floor, hard. Oof. The man stumbled to his feet, seething from his abrupt encounter with masonry. He came up bleeding, his lip cut. It's not too late for you to apologize. Diego knew his caustic remark would lead to round two. He wasn't disappointed. In tight quarters, Brogan came at him again, shoulder lowered like a linebacker. He pinned Diego to the kitchen counter, grappling him in a bear hug. He saw stars with the exertion. The edge of the tile counter cut into his back. He had to make a move, fast. A man as big as Brogan could do some serious damage. Diego let his instincts take over. He shoved the man's head back and punched Brogan's nose. Once, twice. On his third attempt to break free, Diego felt the man's cartilage give way. Brogan cried out in pain and released his grip on Diego. With eyes watering, the man bent over in agony, hands to his face. Shit, you broke my... Before Brogan got his bearings and tried something else... Diego shoved him back and swept his legs out from under him, toppling him to the floor. He held the man down, pinning his throat with an arm to cut off his air, a powerful persuader. Brogan had tested Diego on other occasions, picking his spots. So far, the results had been the same. He never learned from his mistakes, but Diego couldn't let his guard down for a second. He had to stay sharp. And on top of it all, he suspected Brogan had his own agenda. The man wouldn't hesitate to kill if he got the chance. That made his counterpart very dangerous. Within Kavanaugh's organization, Matt Brogan had earned his number one ranking. Diego reminded himself of this fact as he watched Brogan's face turn purple. He still cinched the man's throat in a vice-like squeeze. In a generous concession, he eased up on his chokehold. And Brogan collapsed to the floor, sucking air into his lungs. That gave Diego time to assess the damage as he stepped back. Blood splattered the man's tie and white shirt. A trickle came out his nose and smeared through the sheen of sweat on his skin. His lower lip was cut and swollen, fatter than usual. Seeing Brogan this way had one bonus. Up till now, Diego couldn't imagine the man any uglier. Now he could. You're done marking my territory. Quit pissing on my turf. Brogan clenched his jaw, but never said a word. No sign of gratitude. The man took another gasping breath and pulled himself up from the floor, unable to look Diego in the eye. It was over, or so Diego thought. Diego turned to leave, but as he got near the doorway, he heard the hiss of metal. 
He turned back around to see Brogan threatening him with a butcher knife. The man taunted him, daring him to come closer. Come on, we ain't done yet. Diego had no choice but to prove the bastard wrong. He reached for a ten-piece knife set on a nearby butcher block, taking the four-inch paring and the five-inch serrated utility knives from their slots. He flipped one of the knives in his hand end over end, grabbing it by the blade tip. High carbon steel, good balance? This would do. Diego took aim. Without hesitation, he launched the knife. It happened so fast, Brogan had no time to react. His jaw dropped and his eyes grew wide. The paring knife whizzed by his head and landed with a thump on the kitchen cabinet behind him. And in case he hadn't gotten the message, Diego hurled a second knife. This time, he nicked the man's ear to drive his point home. Oh, damn it! Okay, okay, knock it off! Brogan cupped a meaty hand over his ear and reached for a dish towel with the other. The kitchen staff would have a mess to clean before they heated the griddle and flipped eggs. I'm done talking, and I don't want to have this conversation again. We clear. Although Brogan nodded in agreement, Diego knew it wasn't over, not by a long shot. As he headed up the back stairs to his quarters, leaving Brogan to lick his wounds, Diego knew he hadn't done himself any favors. Next time, Matt Brogan would come at him with a short fuse and a taste for getting even. Kavanaugh's seductive henchman had plagued Becca's thoughts all night. If she intended to keep Diego Galvin at a distance, her libido never got the email. She hadn't slept a wink. All too soon, her alarm clock buzzed, a demonic grating sound. She had allowed enough time for her usual workout at the gym, but this morning she had hit the snooze bar and yanked the covers over her head instead. One of those days, if a positive attitude measured up to a tank of gas, she'd be running on empty. Now in the harsh light of day, Becca drove to the Kavanaugh estate in a daze, no better prepared for the appointment she had made. Dosed up with caffeine, she hovered at cruising altitude, primed and pumped to see Hunter Kavanaugh and Diego Galvin. Primed and pumped? Who the hell was she kidding? Becca turned off Citadel Drive onto the estate and stopped to show ID to a security guard. Kavanaugh expected her. The impressive front gate and pristine grounds zipped by without notice. Too much on her mind. But as she drew closer, butterflies the size of vultures battered her insides. The main house loomed ahead, a massive, sprawling mansion of Mediterranean design. A cobblestone drive circled an imposing fountain with colorful flowers at its base. Vivid red awnings encased an ornate front door and custom windows across the facade. And a terracotta roofline accentuated stucco walls with imported stonework to match, a distinctive Italian influence. Becca parked her Crown Vic short of the front door, feeling unworthy to block the main entrance. With one last look in the rearview mirror, she checked her hair and makeup and took a whiff of the white rose pinned to the lapel of her charcoal gray pantsuit jacket. Normally, the floral boutonnet would be too natty for her taste, but she wanted to send a clear message to Galvin. His midnight FTD service hadn't intimidated her in the least. Yeah, right, if you didn't count the whole sleepless night thing. A stern-faced butler answered the front door, looking like a member of the Adams family. The man sported a major comb-over of gray hair, his eyes the color of pewter. But heaping insult on top of injury, the butler's suit looked like it cost more than a month's salary for a civil servant. So far, her day had warped into a peachy keen affair. Right this way, detective. Mr. Cavanaugh is expecting you. As Becca listened to the high-pitched strains of a violin, she followed the butler through a magnificent rotunda. Her shoes echoed on the tile floor in the foyer, staccato time. With the butler keeping his eyes straight ahead, she walked behind him, sneaking a peek at every detail. Becca had never seen anything so lavish. Subtle recessed lighting reflected anteroom walls of muted green. Marble columns, veined in black and gold, supported archways of carved ivory. Beyond the dim light of the foyer, a mahogany and beveled glass doorway marked the entrance to the salon. As a focal point, inside the entrance to the chamber, a crystal chandelier hung low over a massive center table braced by gilt lions. Hunter Cavanaugh had extravagant taste. It must feel good to be king. After Becca crossed the threshold, she heard a man's voice from across the room. Please, join me, Detective Montgomery. 
In a lavish chair covered in leopard skin and framed in curves of bronze and black, an older man in his fifties sat with chin raised, like royalty holding court. She recognized Hunter Cavanaugh from her research. With a backdrop of gilded walls, his pale skin and white blonde hair gave him the appearance of a statue, his pale blue eyes a stark contrast. Cavanaugh wore a crisp white shirt and black slacks, with a vintage smoking jacket in blood red. The guy either had a flair for drama or he had a thing for Vincent Price. Diego Galvin stood by his side. It took all her discipline to ignore him. These are my associates, Cavanaugh gestured with a hand. This is Mr. Diego Galvin. A pleasure to meet you, detective. What the hell? Diego acted as if they had never met. A complete departure from the other day. But more to the point, it didn't look as if he had told Cavanaugh about their little encounter outside the Imperial, an even bigger curiosity. That and the bruise on his jaw. The man could even make a bruise look sexy. Diego smiled, warm and genuine, the cockiness gone. Yet his eyes shot her a clear message. Play along, Rebecca. How generous did she feel, and why would he assume she'd cooperate? But when she returned his smile, he added a wink, meant for her alone. It stopped her cold. Her smile dissolved into an awkward business-like nod, a move that amused him. Despite the clandestine greeting and his subtle flirtation, she couldn't help but notice. Diego looked elegant in his gray suit and black cashmere turtleneck, the picture of confidence and style. Bruise or no bruise, why does he have to look and smell so good, damn it? Kavanaugh's voice intruded. And this is Mr. Matt Brogan. If Diego had all the qualities of a charming and intelligent Dr. Jekyll, Matt Brogan had to be his alter ego, Mr. Hyde. The guy's face looked like it had spent some quality time pressed to a George Foreman grill. Streaks of red skin appeared swollen to the touch, and his ear had a major gash in it. Brogan nodded, no real greeting, and he barely made eye contact. A falling out among thieves? Apparently Diego had won the argument. A tiny voice in Becca's head told her to keep her mouth shut about his raw appearance, but her host noticed her reaction. Kavanaugh raised an eyebrow, a glint of amusement in his eyes. He crooked his lips into a smile. It seems Mr. Brogan had a dispute with the chef this morning. He leaned toward her and whispered, as if the man in question stood out of earshot, I'm afraid his kitchen privileges have been suspended. Kavanaugh stood and walked to a console table. May I pour you some coffee? A silver coffee service had been arranged, an elaborate setup. Yes, sir, I'd love some. Kavanaugh poured two cups and gestured for her to sit on a velvet divan, midnight blue with gold piping. He brought the coffee over and served her. The whole idea was to get him to feel comfortable with her, not a difficult task if she set her mind to it. But today... With this man, Becca would have to force the mindless banter. You are a striking woman, Detective Rebecca Montgomery, but I suppose you hear that a lot. Oh, I don't know. I find a man says just about anything to a woman with a gun. She smiled. But in my line of work, it's hard to gauge sincerity without a lie detector. Well, unfortunately, I found honesty is a rare commodity these days. Wouldn't you agree? His face remained stoic, unreadable, but he coerced a smile from her again. Kavanaugh had either seen through her strained cordiality, or the man had informed her that he rarely told the truth. I must say you were a little cryptic on the phone. What is this about, detective? I do appreciate you seeing me like this, Mr. Kavanaugh. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the Imperial Theater. I was disturbed to hear it burn down. Pity. But I'm afraid I no longer own the building, some time back, I donated it to a charity as a historical site. He smiled and sipped his coffee. Yes, I remember reading about that in the paper a year or so ago. As a young girl, I visited the theater. Magnificent original architecture. Who handled the last renovation design work? For an instant, she glanced toward Diego. Becca hadn't intended to do it, but like a compass compelled to point north, she caught herself drawn to the man. Diego narrowed his eyes, seeing through her subterfuge. Idle chit-chat had never been her forte. 
Hans Muller, a local architect. He gained national recognition for that renovation project, I'm proud to say. And with a wink, he added, For specialty work, I hire it done. You hire out specialty work as in murder? Becca got the distinct impression Kavanaugh was toying with her. The man was in his element, feeling cocksure. Could he be hinting at a truth only he knew, daring her to find it? And were Diego and No Neck Boy nothing more than hired thugs? Becca's gut twisted, her cop instincts on the blitz. After a sip of her coffee, she asked, And did Muller handle all the renovation work? Yes, he did, of course. He leaned toward her. Why all the interest in architecture, detective? Actually, I loved that old building. When specifically did you relinquish ownership of it, sir? He gave her a date she already knew. Becca kept her eyes on him, waiting for a change in body language. Up until now, they had chatted, idle conversation to establish a baseline of his normal behavior. Enough time for her to get a read on his mannerisms, his voice, his thought processes. Now she'd hit him with the real reason for her visit. I'm sorry to say that we are investigating more than a fire at the Imperial. It seems that seven years ago a body was buried in a wall during the last renovation. What? I don't understand. Skeletal remains were found after the fire, Mr. Cavanaugh, and I'm sure you'd like to get to the bottom of this as much as I would. Slick as black ice, the man tried to suppress his reaction, but Becca caught something all the same. His eyes were jumpy, like a suspect's. With a man like Cavanaugh, the best she might get is a slip-up on his part, a careless word that would give her a clue to chase, but the man salvaged his composure in two seconds flat. How dreadful he said. Do you happen to know the identity of this poor individual? We're working on it. But in the meantime, when was the last time you saw this young woman? Becca handed Isabel's photo to Kavanaugh. The way she posed the question, she made it appear as if Kavanaugh already knew the girl, a deliberate ploy. Sorry, can't help you. I don't recognize her at all. Kavanaugh waved a hand and gestured for his men to come over. No Neck shook his head and shrugged, a cold response. He hadn't even glanced at the photo of Isabel for more than two seconds. Becca suspected the guy would react the same way if someone asked if he were lactose intolerant. Talk about a poker face. A dead girl would hold no more significance to this whack job than that bloated feeling after eating dairy. But Diego had been a different story. He stared at her, his eyes narrowed in question, suggesting a hint of concern and compassion. Well, what do you know? Becca took a deep breath, resisting the urge to read too much into this man. With her life being a complete wreck, she couldn't deal with a potential disappointment named Diego Galvin. Do you suspect it is this young woman's body in the theater, detective? Too soon to tell, sir. Well, certainly I'm sympathetic, but what does this have to do with me? Kavanaugh asked. Becca hated that question had heard it many times before. She took a deep breath and held back her resentment. Murder was a crime against humanity, a depraved act that diminished mankind as a whole. But Kavanaugh viewed the world with him at its center. End of story. She would get nowhere explaining her belief to a man like him. I have to investigate all the angles, and you owned the property at the time. She set her coffee cup down on its saucer, what motive would someone have to select your theater for a body dump? I have no idea. He answered way too fast. No outrage, no questions. The man didn't even seem curious. In her experience, an innocent person might mull over the question, maybe speculate on an answer. But someone with something to hide would answer without thinking, like Kavanaugh. She decided to try a different tactic. Play along with me here, Mr. Kavanaugh. Because I tell you, I can use all the help I can get on a case this old. Why would someone kill and leave a body buried in a wall of your theater? She pressed. If she read him right, Kavanaugh looked like a man who relished being in charge. Stroking his intellect seemed like a natural choice. Given the man's ego, he might have the audacity to reveal certain elements of the truth, throwing them in her face. A man like Kavanaugh might believe he was above the law and smarter than the police. It wasn't up to Becca to prove him wrong. Her only objective at this point was to keep him talking. If she was any judge of character, 
His ego would do the rest. But from the corner of her eye, she saw Diego shift his weight. Becca resisted the urge to look over. His deliberate move triggered his words of warning about his benefactor. They replayed in her head. Just make sure you bring your A game with this guy. He's powerful and as nasty as they come. Suddenly, her lowly Columbo routine didn't feel adequate for the challenge. When she looked at Kavanaugh, the man smiled, ingratiating and perverse. Her skin crawled at the sight. Hypothetically speaking, you say? The man asked. When she nodded, Kavanaugh gazed across the room and made a good show of playing along. Well, let's presume this unnamed body is the beautiful young woman in the photograph, shall we? He waited for her to acknowledge his clever deduction before he continued. Perhaps it was a crime of passion, the stuff of Edgar Allan Poe. A jilted lover buries her alive, the sound of her beating heart still resounding in his ear. What better place for high drama than an old theater? With all due respect, Mr. Cavanaugh, I didn't say the victim was buried alive, but please go on. Your thoughts interest me. He fell silent for an instant, considering her observation. No, I, I guess you didn't. He smirked. But Poe wouldn't have had it any other way. Cavanaugh raised his chin and spoke in a raspy whisper. I didn't know the girl, but perhaps she wasn't entirely innocent. Maybe this girl had a secret life no one knew about. Is that the type of speculation you mean? For an awkward moment, he turned his gaze on her like a weapon. She blinked. The intensity of his ice-blue eyes took her breath, and even though he asked questions, his conjecture sounded an awful lot like statements of fact. Witnessing her uneasiness, Kavanaugh leaned toward her, closing the gap of her comfort zone. His voice low and intimate, he brushed a finger across the petal of the white rose on her lapel. An older man can offer a younger woman so many things. Maybe unwittingly, she became the moth to a very dangerous flame. Becca held her ground, not backing off. Breathe, damn it. She returned his unblinking stare, resisting the urge to bolt. Her creep barometer had hit the red zone. Yesterday, Father Victor suggested Isabel had a relationship with an older man, one who had money. Was Becca staring into the eyes of a killer? She swallowed and forced a smile. That's very good. If this whole wealthy playboy thing doesn't work out, I could put in a good word for you down at the SAPD. To regain her composure, Becca took a sip of coffee before she continued. The recent fire may prove to be arson. Any theories on that? Arson? Well, there's your answer, he offered. How so? Whoever set the fire no doubt knew about the body. Don't you see? Otherwise it would be too much coincidence. Your arsonist may well be the killer. Interesting theory, sir. Kavanaugh looked like a man who had delivered the only line he had in a stage play. Smug and theatrical. Surely Diego had told the man about the possibility of arson at the Imperial. If he did, Kavanaugh had plenty of time to conjure up his great insight, his theory to place blame on a faceless firebug. Becca had thought of this angle before, but why would someone wait seven years to pin a murder on Kavanaugh? Could the body have been intended to act like a time bomb, waiting to blow up in the man's face at the worst possible time? Why now? Too many questions without answers. Do you know of anyone who would frame you for this murder, sir? Set you up to take the fall? A man in my position has made enemies, to be sure, but I can't think of anyone who would do this. No. You're right. From what she gathered, Kavanaugh had jump-started his family business on a foundation of mob money, and he hired muscle to ensure his protection. Yet he sat before her, innocence personified. Time for her to rock the yacht. Your travel company merged a few years ago with Global Enterprises, and since that time your business has flourished. Any possibility of... Kavanaugh interrupted. What would cause you to look into the merger of my company? The man's eye twitched, a subtle gesture, but the tightening of his jawline had been more pronounced. Becca hit a nerve. Throughout most of the interview, she struggled to maintain control, with Kavanaugh playing the part of grand master of their mental tug-of-war. 
Yet, with the topic of global enterprises on the table, Kavanaugh clammed up, pretended to be insulted by her line of questioning. His cooperation came to a grinding halt. Becca had discovered his trigger, an Achilles heel. Score one for the visiting team. At this stage of my investigation, I have to look at anything and everything, Mr. Kavanaugh. His composure had vanished. If you are asking if someone within my corporation would do this, the answer is no, detective. Kavanaugh set his coffee cup down and stood. This conversation is over. Anything else I can do for you? Becca had been dismissed. No, sir. That will do for now. You've been very helpful. She stood and reached for her casebook to retrieve a business card. If you think of anything else, please contact me. Although Kavanaugh took her card, he never glanced at it. The man had no intention of picking up where they'd left off. The next move would be hers. Diego will see you to the front door, the man ordered. As Kavanaugh left the room, gesturing for Brogan to follow him, Becca caught a distinct reaction from Diego. His double-take gave him away. Kavanaugh's directive had surprised him, and he didn't appreciate being odd man out. I can find my own way out. After all, I am a detective, she teased. And in her best Hispanic accent, she added, I can detect such things. Diego looked distracted and totally missed her impersonation of him. The man watched Kavanaugh leave the room with Brogan and his beady-eyed stare that only a coiled rattler would understand. Why didn't you... Before she finished her thought, Diego flashed her an intense look coupled with a subtle shake of his head, cautioning her to keep quiet. No trouble, detective. It will be my pleasure to escort you out. They walked in silence, his hand touching the small of her back. Although she tried to ignore his gesture, the feel of his fingers on her body kindled a surge of adrenaline she couldn't control. Toe-curling stuff. With cheeks flushed, she set her jaw. No way she would acknowledge his effect on her. This estate has eyes and ears, he whispered out of the corner of his mouth, not looking her way. Becca knew the clack of her heels on the tile floor would make audio surveillance difficult, but video was another story. So she kept her eyes straight ahead and her voice low. We gotta talk, she muttered. Not here, he whispered. When they got to the front door, Diego reached for the knob and opened it. In a louder voice, he added, Good day, detective. Diego Galvin looked edgy, his unflappable facade a distant memory, and his dark eyes darted back the way they'd come, his jaw taut with tension. Something had caused him to lose his cool. She had to admit that seeing him like this did a number on her head, but her head was the least of her problems. Her body had a mind of its own. Diego stood close enough for her to feel the warmth off his skin, mixed with his subtle cologne, a potent combination. Although the man tried to maintain his distance, his eyes conveyed another message altogether. They held a sense of danger mixed with an iron-clad humanity, an intriguing labyrinth she had to explore. Becca narrowed her eyes, resisting the urge to ask him how and when he would contact her. Instead, she walked out the front door, taking her first step toward trust. Besides, playing a little cloak and dagger with gorgeous eyes wouldn't ruin the rest of her day. Diego looked like a man who wanted to talk, a perfect match. She wanted to hear whatever he had to say, to a point. Becca merged the Crown Vic into traffic on I-10 with a lot on her mind. Diego's words of warning about Kavanaugh were dead on the money. The man gave her a serious case of the creeps, triggering a gut reaction that the affluent pillar of the community hid something, especially where Global Enterprises was concerned. But as she replayed the interview with Kavanaugh in her head, her cell phone rang. Montgomery? Becca, where are you? She recognized the voice of Lieutenant Arturo Santiago. I'm on I-10 heading back downtown. Why? I wanted you to hear this from me before the media gets a hold of it. His words gripped her heart, a grave tone to his voice. It drew her back to the day she first heard about a bloody motel room. This couldn't be good. Sounds ominous. What's up? There's been another abduction in Austin near the UT campus a couple of days ago. Another young life ruined, a family torn apart. The news wrenched her gut. Danielle's sweet face flashed in front of her eyes. Becca clenched her jaw and gripped the steering wheel, hard. She tried to regain her composure, stay focused. Same M.O.? 
She hated the edge to her voice, the need. Is there a connection, Art? No, the MO is different. Broad daylight this time, no nightclub involved. And the girl was a college kid, some foreign exchange student from Japan. The FBI clued Murphy in on this one. We wouldn't have seen it as connected except for one thing. Yeah, what's that? The man hadn't heard her. He kept on talking. We're not going to leak this detail to the press, Becca. This one we keep. Art, spit it out. I gotta know. Your sister's senior class ring was found in a van they dumped, wedged in a crack. The news stole her breath, bringing a sudden rush of tears to her eyes. The innocence of a graduation that would never be collided with the horror of Danielle's violent death in a blood-splattered motel room. A cruel jolt. It took every ounce of concentration to keep her car between the painted lines. No way she'd be frozen out on this one. Not now. By itself, this doesn't mean much. It's only her ring, judging by the initials on the inside of the band. We have no context, no time frame. The ring ties this vehicle to the FBI's case. That's all. But it's something, Art, she pleaded, softening her tone. Something of Danny's. Look, I know what you're thinking. But I gotta tell you, Santiago added, I got a new guy from the FBI down here today. He's buttoning things up tight. You're not gonna... Becca didn't let him finish. I want in, Art. One way or another, I want in. She insisted, not waiting for Lieutenant Santiago's response. Becca ended the call and tossed the cell onto the seat next to her. She hit the gas pedal. No way Santiago would bar her from the investigation now. Chapter 5 Detective Montgomery is going to be a problem, one I will place in your hands. Hunter Cavanaugh collapsed into his black leather desk chair, the start of a headache pulsing at his temples. The study smelled of brandy and cigar smoke, with the underlying musty odor of old books. The combined pungency gnarled his stomach, intensified by the reversal of fortune to his morning. Kavanaugh sat behind his desk and stared straight through Brogan, his mind on other things. And let's keep this our little secret. Diego is not to find out. The last thing I need is for Rivera to hear about my little hobby. But this body in the theater, they won't find a connection? Does that really matter? He didn't feel like explaining himself to Brogan. Being under a cop's scrutiny is never a good thing. The pretty detective piqued his interest when he thought she was investigating the fire at the Imperial Theater. Diego had given him a heads up on the blaze being arson. Professional courtesy, the man had said. And when Detective Montgomery walked into the room, he felt like a kid waking up Christmas morning. A new toy caught his eye. Yet in no time, she doused him with a harsh reality. And she didn't look like the kind of woman who knew how to play outside the rules. I'm afraid the detective has no idea how to have fun. We could teach her. Brogan's face squeezed into a grin like a compressed accordion. Yes, I suppose we can. Kavanaugh crooked a corner of his mouth, a fleeting gesture. But this couldn't come at a worse time. What do you need me to do? Exactly. Although Brogan lacked imagination, he made up for his shortcoming with a genuine enthusiasm to execute a direct order, a quality Kavanaugh appreciated in a subordinate. To start, let's consolidate the merchandise. You know what to do. I can't have the police nosing around my affairs. Kavanaugh recognized the necessity for shoring up his defenses, but he resented his need to do so. How far do you want me to go? With the detective. He saw the glint in Brogan's dark eyes and marveled at what little it took to amuse him. Despite Brogan's eagerness, Kavanaugh wondered if he could entrust his well-being to such a man. He took a deep breath I have some ideas on the subject. Pour a brandy for both of us, Mr. Brogan. Let's talk. Becca had to slow her steps as she trekked down the corridor to Lieutenant Santiago's office. Gauging by the play of light from a window, she knew his door was open. When she rounded the corner and stepped inside, Santiago looked up, his expression stern. But he wasn't alone. Detective Montgomery, please come in and close the door. Santiago gestured for her to sit. She shut the door but remained standing. Paul Murphy, dressed in a dark gray suit, white shirt, and his favorite red power tie, turned from the window as she entered the office. He leaned against the sill, arms crossed. Murphy stared at her, his expression blank. That surprised her. 
Normally, the man wore his smugness like an extra layer of skin. Arrogance fit him like a glove. But the balding man to Murphy's left captured her attention. Tall and lanky, the older man wore his suit as if he were a human coat hanger. An unflattering cut couldn't be blamed for the guy's inability to fill it out. His dark eyes looked like two lumps of coal set against the deep wrinkles creasing his face. She got the distinct impression the lines were not caused by his stellar sense of humor. Becca extended her hand to force an introduction. I don't believe we've met. My name's Detective Rebecca. I know who you are, Detective. Please take a seat. He didn't reach for her hand. This is Mike Draper with the FBI's Criminal Investigation Division out of D.C. Santiago made the one-sided introduction for her benefit. Without a word, Draper glared at her lieutenant, a look intended as a directive to get started. And Santiago complied without so much as an insolent scowl. Draper has some questions for you. I expect your cooperation. Santiago turned his gaze to the man standing near the window. Your investigation on the arson fire and the bones found at the theater. Brief me on the case and the meeting you had with Hunter Cavanaugh this morning. Draper commanded. Sir, I can do that, but I'd rather talk about my sister's. Your sister's investigation is off limits to you. Now tell me about this case and Cavanaugh's involvement, the man insisted. Becca tried to read him, but the Fed didn't allow it. Something was going down, and she wouldn't be a part of it. She took a seat in the chair nearest her. Becca stared at the man who would deny her and made a deliberate choice. She was damned tired of playing by their rules. Not much to report yet, sir. I've got an appointment with the medical examiner this afternoon. No ID on the victim. As you know, nothing much can happen until we get that identification. Tell me about your meeting with Kavanaugh. What transpired? We had coffee, sir, she replied. In a room full of interrogators, she had to remain calm and open book. Kavanaugh seemed surprised to hear about the skeletal remains found after the fire. I don't think he's going to be much help. He's not even the owner of record for the property anymore. It's some kind of historical site. If Santiago had gotten a complaint from Kavanaugh, her lieutenant would know she had lied about not knowing the identity of the victim. Her lie by omission. He gave no sign of that, so she stuck with her makeshift game plan. Becca had grown accustomed to treading on thin ice. Is that all, Detective Montgomery? Draper persisted. Do you suspect Hunter Kavanaugh of any wrongdoing on this case of yours? How much did this man know? If he or Murphy had dug around, they might know she had requested two archived boxes on missing persons. Would they call her bluff? To throw these men off their game, she decided to go on the offensive. After all, they had hit her broadside. Time to return the favor. At present, I don't have any reason to suspect Kavanaugh of anything. She hadn't really lied. But I have some questions for you, sir. Becca leaned forward in her chair, placing an elbow on Santiago's desk, her eyes fixed on the Fed. She didn't wait for Draper's permission to go on. Just now you called the Imperial an arson fire. The final report isn't out yet. Why would you call it arson? And how did you hear about my visit to Kavanaugh this morning? I hadn't mentioned it to anyone. What's really going on here? Draper tightened his jaw and narrowed his eyes. For a second, she saw his flinch of surprise, but the man recovered quickly. Even Santiago and Murphy reacted. She saw it from the corner of her eye, but hitting the bullseye wouldn't win her any prize. This book is continued on disc three. No One Heard Her Scream by Jordan Dane continued. Disc three. By the end of shift, you will turn over all your case notes to Murphy. Any files you've started on the fire and the skeletal remains will be his. But sir, she looked at Santiago for help. Why am I being pulled off this case? I don't understand. Her lieutenant took back control of the meeting. You'll be reassigned. But until then, I'd like you to consider taking some vacation time, like we talked about the other day. Santiago sat back in his chair, his eyes unwavering. You mentioned taking time to help your mother. I think that's a great idea. Becca felt like she had stepped through a portal to another dimension, an alternate universe. Only the other day, her lieutenant told her time off was not an option. He wanted her close at hand to watch her. But today, he doled out vacation days like party favors. Something was definitely up, and Arturo Santiago wanted her to play along. She knew the man. 
sensed his message, but above all, Becca trusted him. She looked over to Murphy and shrugged. You'll have my files by the end of today. Glancing back to Santiago, she asked, Anything else, sir? No, that will be all. Thanks for your cooperation, detective. And just like that, she was out. Becca avoided looking at Draper and Murphy as she stood. She opened the door and walked out of Santiago's office without a sideways glance. The urge to slug them both would be way too strong. She headed down the hallway, gnashing her teeth until her jaw ached. Thinking back to her earlier cell phone conversation with Santiago, the man had bucked the system to share the news on Danielle's case. No doubt the chief would have reprimanded him if Draper had found out. Maybe she still had Santiago on her side. Thanks, LT, but you and I aren't done yet. Not by a long shot. Becca bounded up the stairs to her desk on the fourth floor, in no mood to ride the elevator with other people. She had until the end of the day to turn over her files and case notes. Murphy would get a sanitized version, one to back up the story she told Draper. She owed her lieutenant that much. In the meantime, Becca had a medical examiner waiting and the Marquez brothers coming at shift end. And if that wasn't enough to keep her busy, Isabel's background needed a thorough search. Her investigation at the Imperial had gotten the attention of the FBI. She suspected the abducted girls and Danielle's case were somehow linked to all of this. The Fed had all but confirmed that with his line of questioning, the arrogant bastard. At the heart of it, she pictured Hunter Cavanaugh. Mike Draper didn't give a damn about Isabel. A seven-year-old murder of a local girl would have no sex appeal for a Fed, but a wealthy guy with an international travel business and connections to the mob would lure Draper like a bottom-grubbing catfish to stink bait, a high-profile case that might cross borders. This is about you, Kavanaugh. I know it. After today, Becca would be forced to take time off. Although she'd be cut off from the action, being on vacation would allow her to keep her badge and gun, a clever move on Santiago's part. Through it all, her lieutenant had proven himself a loyal friend. Maybe he'd keep her connected to the case within the SAPD. But having someone on the inside of Kavanaugh's organization would be a real coup. Becca made up her mind. She would recruit Diego Galvin for the honor, even if she had to play hardball to get him. Sorry, Galvin. The gloves are off. Don't expect me to play nice. Bexar County Medical Examiner's Office, Louis Pasteur Drive. The skeletal remains found at the Imperial Theater had been steam cleaned and arranged in order on a light table. The bones were stark ivory white with a section of the skull cut out, a macabre jigsaw puzzle, and with all other lights in the room dimmed, the light table cast an eerie glow on the faces of crime scene investigator Sam Hastings and the medical examiner, Charles Leibowitz. The Emmy was a short, pudgy man with thinning white hair. His eyes bulged out from their sockets with puffy bags of skin beneath them, Shadows traced his full cheeks, masking their true size. Both men had pale green surgical gowns draped over their clothes, with latex gloves on their hands, same as she wore. Even with the added layers, she felt the constant chill in the room through her clothes. Well, the age, gender, and height are in line with what we know of the Marquez girl. But you say we'll have the family's DNA to match the mitochondria? Leibowitz asked. Yeah, probably after six. Becca replied, bending over to look closer at the cutaway of the skull. Tell me about this fracture here, an odd shape, kind of a wedge. Blunt force trauma. The indentation is pronounced enough to indicate some kind of hammer, something with a long, narrow head and slight curvature. See here? The medical examiner pointed with a gloved finger. The edge of the break in bone hinges downward. That indicates the bone was fresh and elastic when the injury took place. The fracture lines radiate out from there, but the blow wasn't a solid dead-on strike. The impression is deeper here, but barely noticeable on this end. More of a glancing blow. But Sam, remember the scratches on the wall where we found her? Becca turned toward the crime scene investigator. I thought she was buried alive. Sam opened his mouth to speak, but Leibowitz beat him to the punch. Oh, this blow wouldn't have killed her, the Emmy explained. I believe the cause of death will be determined more in the context of how you found her, detective. Let me translate for Charlie, Sam intervened with a grin. Buried alive in a vault without much air and no food or water is a pretty good indicator she didn't die of natural causes or a crack on the head. And the scratches on the wall and condition of her fingernails paint a grim picture. 
Charlie's right on the head trauma thing. She wouldn't have died from it. So the killer knocked her unconscious and bricked her into the wall knowing she was still alive? She asked. We may never know the killer's intention here unless we get it in a confession. A head wound like that, there would have been a lot of blood given all the blood vessels in the scalp. Maybe whoever did it thought she was dead. Sam gave his opinion, one that would never end up in an official report. And back to the weapon, what kind of hammer, Sam? Since we only have a partial impression, I'm gonna have to do some comparisons before I commit to anything. Unlike the good doctor here, I'm a hard-working stiff. Sam Hastings crooked his lips into a smile, a gesture that quickly faded. Stiff. Can't believe I used that word in this place. Becca raised an eyebrow. I don't remember seeing any fabric in the hole where we found the bones. Any theories on that? There's an outside chance the body was buried without clothing, but more than likely, the fabric deteriorated over time. You figured this girl went missing seven years ago, right? When she nodded, he continued, and we found evidence of rodent activity in the vault. That suggests another factor to the decay of fabric. Scavenging critters can break down the material pretty quick. Lovely. I hate rats. She winced. Especially the two-legged variety. Sam smirked. Anyway, that's all we've got for now. Call me when you have something more definitive, huh? On my cell? Yep, sure thing. Charlie and I have some more work to do here, taking an inventory and measurement of the bones and their conditions. But I'll let you know what I find out. Becca should have told him she was off the case, but something stopped her. She might get mileage out of keeping that fact a secret. But another thing aided her craw. Murphy had every opportunity to attend this meeting with the M.E., but he never showed an interest. If the bones on the table belonged to Isabel Marquez, Becca had a feeling the case would get shoved onto a back burner. Whatever they had on Kavanaugh would take precedence. Isabel's killer might never be identified. Becca couldn't let that happen. After meeting the Marquez family, she owed them the truth. Shrugging out of her surgical gown and stripping off the latex gloves, she headed for the door. I'll get the DNA sample to you ASAP. Later, guys. Becca dumped her surgical gown and latex gloves into a receptacle outside the autopsy room. She had a lot of ground to cover before she'd be ready for the Marquez brothers. Central Station, downtown San Antonio. The room adjacent to interrogation room number five was dark, but not empty. Through the two-way mirror, a pale light shone, giving shape to Becca's silhouette. She stood in the dark with arms crossed, watching the Marquez brothers wait for her to show up in the next room. A crime scene tech had already swabbed both men for DNA testing. Now she let time do its work. Both looked anxious, each in his own way. Their voices were muffled on the intercom speaker. Don't volunteer anything. If you have any doubts, don't answer. Just look at me, and I'll tell you what to do. Dressed in his priest vesture, Victor sat rigid in his chair, his tone low and forceful. He talked out of the corner of his mouth, not really looking at his brother. I don't need you here, Victor. You should have let me drive myself. Rudy rolled his eyes and slumped deeper into his chair, but the priest ignored his objection. Don't worry. If we need a lawyer, I know someone who may do it for free. You get what you pay for, bro. The priest didn't reply. He shut his eyes for an instant and took a deep breath. Victor raised his chin and maintained his stoic expression, hoping to assure his younger brother he could handle the situation. But by Rudy's actions, Becca saw he hadn't bought into Victor's overtures. The guy avoided looking at the priest and fidgeted in his seat. His eyes darted to the closed door every few minutes. Despite his nervousness, Rudy's dark brown eyes appeared childlike, an undeniable innocent quality to them. He looked most like Isabel in that sense, Dressed in his work clothes of faded blue jeans and a black Spurs basketball t-shirt, Rudy looked like he'd barely had time to wash his face and hands. His clothes had a layer of dust and grime, the pattern only broken by the darker markings of sweat. Shorter than Victor and very slender, Rudy had the appearance of a boy in a man's body. But Becca couldn't let her first impressions of Rudy sway her judgment as a cop. Her instincts told her this family was holding something back, now she'd push them to uncover the truth. Becca walked through the door of interrogation room five. Sorry to keep you waiting. She dropped her case book on the table in front of the Marquez brothers. I appreciate your cooperation, father. Becca extended her hand to Rudy. 
My name is Detective Rebecca Montgomery. After a long moment, he eventually returned her gesture. Rudy? Rudy Marquez? His eyes avoided hers. He raised a hand to his mouth and chewed on a thumbnail. Becca sat in front of him. She leaned forward with her elbows on the table, forcing him to look at her. Your brother tells me you and Isabel were very close, so I'm going to need your help, Rudy. She paused, making sure she held his attention. Tell me what she was like. Tell me about your Isabel. Her request surprised him. Eyes wide, he looked up and sat straight in his chair. Nearly a minute ticked by before he spoke, his voice almost a whisper. When she was little, Isabel wanted to please Mama so much. She was a good girl. He stared across the room, not focusing on anything in particular. The past had caught up with him. When I think of her, I remember Isabel putting her hand in mine when we walked to school, and not just at the crosswalks. She used to tell me how I made her feel safe. That memory took its toll. Tears welled in his eyes, a contradiction to the sad smile on his face. She needed me then. He quit talking. Silence overwhelmed the room, and Father Victor didn't fill the void. The priest swallowed hard, watching Rudy. But at some point, little girls grow up, Becca prompted. A flash of Danielle's sweet face wedged a knot in her throat. Little girls learn to live their own lives. A tear slid down his face. Rudy never looked up. Yes, they grow up. And they learn about ugliness from despicable men with no honor. Father Victor turned his head in surprise. Please, Rudy, you never want to hear about this, Victor. Yet here, you drag me in front of this stranger to talk about it. Why is that? So you can act surprised like you never knew. So you can remain the saint. Rudy's voice rose in anger. He glared at his brother. You are gone. I was left to deal with it alone. Deal with what, Rudy? Becca asked. Tell me about Isabel. Don't do this, mi hermano, please. Father Victor clutched Rudy's arm, pulling his brother closer. Hasn't our family suffered enough? Hasn't Mama been through enough pain? Rudy yanked his arm free and turned his back on Victor. About a week before she went missing, I saw Isabel get into some kind of Mercedes, a block down from our house. She was with another girl, Sonia Garza. It was kind of dark, but I recognized the Garza girl. When I asked Isabel about it, she lied. She told me the car belonged to Sonia's boyfriend. But you didn't believe her, she asked. After Rudy shook his head, Becca persisted. Why didn't you believe her, Rudy? He leaned forward, resting his elbows on the table. He looked tired. After a moment, Rudy wiped both hands over his face. I followed the car, that's why. Out I tend to some rich guy's place. I didn't like her sneaking around like that. It wasn't right. Did you ever actually see the man driving the car? She asked. It was Hunter Cavanaugh. Hearing Rudy say Cavanaugh's name surprised Becca. She tried not to let it show. How did you know it was Cavanaugh, Rudy? Had you ever seen him before? He hesitated. Anger replaced the accusation in his eyes. Oh, I get it. You don't believe me. You want to protect that son of a bitch. He stood and paced the floor behind his chair, running a hand through his thick, dark hair. The dude's old enough to be my old man. A guy like that only wants one thing from a young girl like Isabel. So you actually saw him? Becca needed confirmation. You said it was dark. I saw good enough. I recognized the car. He came out to the Imperial Theater sometimes during the renovation. I saw him there. Rudy sat back down on an edge of the chair. You worked the renovation at the Imperial? She asked. She'd know the answer soon enough. Becca had requested the billable personnel list taken off the architectural firm's invoices from the subcontractor on the renovation, and she had requested the personnel records for the subcontractor for a comparison, but none of the information had come in yet. I think we've told you enough, Detective. Father Victor stood and reached for Rudy's arm, pulling him to his feet. Go talk to this Hunter Cavanaugh, but leave my brother out of it. Yet despite Victor's plea... Rudy wasn't ready to quit. He leaned across the table and pointed a finger at her. Cavanaugh bought her that damned necklace, the one you were asking about, the gold heart. I'm sure of it. 
You don't sound sure, Rudy. Sounds like you're guessing. Becca stood and stepped closer to Marquez. Tell me about the last time you saw Isabel. His eyes grew wide. He stopped himself and swallowed. As Rudy opened his mouth to speak, Victor intervened. That's it. No more. The priest rattled off in Spanish too fast for Becca to keep up. Whatever he told Rudy, it was enough to shut him up. Please, detective, stop this. If you want to speak to either of us again, it will be through an attorney. Now I'd like to take Rudy home. Mama is expecting us for dinner. Are we free to go? Father Victor's voice wavered, and his eyes no longer looked confident. He clung to his brother, hoping she'd let him claim his small victory. Eventually, Becca nodded and watched them leave the room. After they shut the door behind them, she sat down, alone with her thoughts. Not once did Father Victor or Rudy ask about Isabel, where her body had been found. She had deliberately held back the information to see if they would. One of them had been at the Imperial after the fire. Becca had a sinking feeling if she told them where Isabel's body had been found, she wouldn't be telling them anything new. Damn it. She replayed the interview in her mind and made notes in her casebook. When she was done, Becca pulled the cell phone from her jacket pocket. On the second ring, Hastings answered the call. Hey, Sam, when you're looking for that hammer, check into masonry tools first, will ya? Any particular reason to start there? Just a hunch. Let me know what you find out. Becca ended the call, deep in thought. Rudy worked on the renovation project at the Imperial, probably as a mason, his usual gig. Suspicion twisted her gut her professional instincts grappling with the love she felt for a dead sister. She would follow the evidence, even if it led to some place she didn't want to go. Chapter 6 Becca opened the front door to her condo and tossed her keys and purse onto the kitchen counter. She didn't flip on any lights. Instead, she opened a cabinet and took out a bottle of Glenmorangie's single malt scotch whiskey, pouring a small glass. She resisted the urge to call Santiago. It was late. After her forced vacation, she'd have plenty of time to make contact. So without changing clothes, she collapsed on her sofa and stared out the windows from the unlighted room. Dim lights from the river walk bled through the glass. A kaleidoscope of pastel dappled her carpet and walls, mixed with murky shadows. Stirred by the faint breeze outside, branches of cypress made the colors undulate in the dark and across her body. Hypnotic. She took a swig of scotch. It shocked her system and burned her throat. But once its heat radiated through her chest and down her arms, she melted into the cushions of her couch. The noise from the city throbbed, a dull pulse, out of sync. Becca shut her eyes and let the events of the day close in, the faces of Danielle and Isabel clouding her mind. Alone in the dark, she felt grief the most. It emanated from deep inside, leaving her no place to hide. By the time she opened her eyes, tears streaked her face. Her skin prickled where the tears had strayed, the air starting to dry them. She finished her scotch and went for more, but when Becca stood, a glimpse of white caught her eye. A white rose lay on the brick outside her window, its green leaves stirred in the breeze, and another had been dropped on the fire escape steps at eye level so she wouldn't miss it. For an instant, her heart leapt in her chest. Diego, she whispered, a part of her felt too fragile to withstand his influence, but an even greater part willed him to be on the rooftop, waiting for her. Becca walked to her kitchen and took another dose of liquid courage, grimacing with the potency of the scotch. At the window, she took a deep breath and raised the pain. No amount of self-control would rein in the feeling. Her heart pounded in her ribcage. Becca picked up the first rose and ducked through the window onto the landing. More flowers lay on the steps, leading her to the roof. Her eyes trailed the roses to the top. The white lights of her rooftop garden replaced the stars in the night sky, shimmering points of light. He must have turned them on. Another invitation. But Becca had a plan for Diego Galvin, and it had nothing to do with a starlit night and roses. Diego stood on the edge of the light near a parapet wall, feeling more at home in the shadows of Rebecca's garden. Sand and small pebbles crunched under his boots in this section, Clay saltillo tile pavers covered the rest of the rooftop decking. He ran his fingers along the greenhouse, 
and she constructed it herself. He understood her need to have such a place, admired her for it. He cocked his head to one side when he heard the window slide open below. Rebecca was home. Diego turned to face the steps to the roof and waited, but the beat of his heart ramped up a notch, an unnerving reaction. You're acting like a damned kid, Galvin. Get a grip. He pulled open his brown leather jacket and shoved his hands into the pockets of his jeans, trying to appear casual. When she peered over the wall, he walked toward her and spoke up. I hope you don't mind. I made myself at home. He offered his hand to help her over the brick wall, a well-intentioned and chivalrous gesture. But Diego couldn't help himself. He watched her move. Not even the conservative pantsuit hid her tight athletic body. If she looked at him now, Rebecca might be afraid of what she would see reflected in his eyes. He cleared his throat and glanced away. For a guy who lurks in the shadows, you do like a grand entrance. I'll give you that. Thanks for the roses. Again. When she touched his hand, a jolt of electricity shot through his system. He tried to downplay his reaction to her, but the exercise would be pointless. He had seen it before, in her eyes. In his mind and his heart, Diego knew the truth. This woman saw through his detached facade, making him feel raw and exposed. And in doing so, she forced him to remember the man he used to be. She shed light on every dark corner of his being, making him feel redeemable. May I tried your front door, but you weren't home. This was uh, plan B. The faint breeze tousled her hair, the strands cascading the light. She stood close enough for him to smell a fragrance on her skin, a subtle floral scent, provocative and feminine. And he smelled alcohol. Rebecca had been drinking. But Diego stopped breathing altogether when he looked into her eyes. Steely defiance and a quiet restraint defined them, an intoxicating blend. She held his hand, clutching his fingers even after she had made it over the wall. He took in every detail of her face, committing it to memory, knowing the moment would not last, perfection so fleeting. Glad you stuck with plan B, she replied, a fragile smile on her face and expectation in her eyes. We have to talk. Yes, talk. About what? Words failed him. His brain failed him. He only wanted one thing to kiss those lips. Diego memorized the line of her lips, the soft skin glistening in the moonlight. With his free hand, he traced a finger along her jaw, lost and completely seduced. And she surprised him by permitting his brash move. Encouraged by this, he leaned closer, lowering his lips to hers. He pulled her to him, knowing he took a liberty. The heat of her body felt so good next to his. Every curve fit. He couldn't stop himself but she could. No, please. Even though she placed a hand to his chest, her eyes carried a very different message. I need to... What do you want, Rebecca? He whispered. She hesitated, her gaze dropping to his lips. He clung to the hope she would change her mind and kiss him instead. But Rebecca only took a deep breath and pulled away from his arms, and his emptiness returned. She crossed her arms, looking cold, and her lips trembled. Diego shrugged out of his jacket and placed it on her shoulders. She smiled at his gesture. Thank you, but you don't have to. She tried to hand the jacket back, but Diego raised his hands in protest. No, I insist. He jammed his hands into his jeans, ignoring the breeze filtering through the weave of his turtleneck sweater. I suppose you want to know about Kavanaugh. Yes, what's going on between you two? You kept our little coffee break to yourself, why is that? The truth. It should have been an easy thing to share with someone like Rebecca. But Diego had grown accustomed to his secrets. He wouldn't risk exposing them, not even for her. What part of the truth would he share? He'd have to tread a very thin line. I don't tell Kavanaugh everything. It is a game we play. Diego circled the spot where she stood, not taking his eyes off her. A slow, calculated maneuver. But the woman didn't give an inch. She turned with him, matching his intensity. Not good enough, Slick. You don't strike me as the type of guy who wings it. That was a deliberate move on your part. Now answer the question. I'll answer your question if you tell me why you were crying the other night. By the window. When she wavered, Diego flashed a lazy smile. You see, it's hard to take that first step, isn't it? 
the trust factor. His amusement faded, replaced by his intense stare. Then I will go first. It took him a moment to find the words. He knew how he felt, but saying such things aloud did not come easy. Sometimes it feels like I've lived my whole life doing things for someone else. Meeting you, that was for me. I didn't want Kavanaugh to share any piece of that. It meant too much. He stepped closer and brushed back a strand of her hair. Graced by moonlight, the magic of this woman touched him more than he wanted to admit. You have an undeniable strength in you, Rebecca. I can see it in your eyes, but it's the complete vulnerability I find most intriguing. And that you cannot hide, not from me. The urge to kiss her took hold, more powerful this time. Diego pulled her toward him, cradling the back of her head in his hand, his fingers laced through her hair. Without hesitation, he pressed his lips to hers, taking what he had no right to take. At first, she flinched in resistance. But when Rebecca's arms reached for him, her hands found the skin under his sweater, and his belly grew taut. Blood jolted through his system, on fire, fueling his arousal. He parted her lips with his tongue, and she returned his hunger, her fingers clutching at his back. The sounds of the city faded, replaced by their breathless urgency. He wanted her, needed her. Oh, God, please, I can't do this, she gasped. I'm so sorry. She pulled her lips from his, but collapsed against his body, clinging to him. With his chest heaving, he held her in his arms, his eyes shut tight. No, it's me. I should be the one to apologize. Regret filled him. He had pushed too hard, expected too much. Eyes still closed, he lowered his forehead to hers, breathing in her scent. Heat radiated off his skin. Not even the night air tempered the rush. She backed away, unable to look him in the eye. Rebecca turned her back on him, letting the clamor of the city build a wall between them. If you want me to go, he offered. No, please, stay. Rebecca faced him now standing in a murky fringe of light. Before I say what's on my mind, I do want to answer your question about why I was crying the other night. Trust doesn't come easy for me either. She sat on the brick ledge, staring down river. Diego edged closer, standing at a respectful distance. Not too long ago, I lost someone. Someone I loved very much. Rebecca's voice sounded hollow and distant, I'd been so focused on my career, I let what was really important slip through my fingers. And now I, I can't get those precious moments back with her. She's dead, and there's nothing I can do to change it. Her words resonated with him. His personal life had taken a back seat all too often, and there were days when the bitterness of regret was all he tasted. He knelt by her side, not taking his eyes from her, is that why this case is so important to you? The young girl discovered at the theater. I'm sure that's part of it. She fell silent for a long moment and fixed her gaze on him. Her eyes narrowed in suspicion. I never mentioned the age of this person. Why is it you know so much about me, Diego? Are you telling me you know about my sister, Danielle? He stood and shook his head. Your sister? Don't play dumb, Galvin. It doesn't suit you. She rose to her feet and handed him the jacket he had loaned her, a stern expression on her face. Well, you've made this easier than I thought it would be. She stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, hands on her hips. I had an interesting conversation with the FBI today. They seemed to be reading my mail. He raised his chin and narrowed his eyes. Well, you know what they say. Big Brother is watching. It's more than that, Slick. The feds are calling the fire at the Imperial arson even before the official report, kind of like you did the first day we met. She cocked her head, and they knew about my interview with Kavanaugh right after I left the estate when I hadn't told anyone about it. But I've got a theory on all this. Oh? He turned his back on her, avoiding her glare. I think the feds have someone on the inside of Kavanaugh's organization. Maybe someone under deep cover. He clenched his jaw and shut his eyes for an instant, then turned to face her. I don't see how that's possible. Kavanaugh wouldn't take anyone into his confidence without a background check with references. 
He's known for that. No way someone in law enforcement could get inside. I know the man. Not unless this person had connections with someone Kavanaugh respected or feared. Rivera got you inside, didn't he? You don't know what you're talking about. You're fishing. He stared at the moon and took a deep breath. Maybe, but I think I've got the right bait. She tugged at the sleeve of his sweater and stroked his arm, forcing him to look at her again. Her voice softened. Come on, Diego. Why else would you be here, connected to Kavanaugh? You're not like him or Brogan, I can feel it. Please, tell me the truth. Diego didn't want any secrets between them, but he had no choice. The FBI had taken away his options and suspended his life for their own agenda, the bastards. For all intents and purposes, Draper held a gun to his head, and Joseph Rivera would pay the price if Diego reneged on his end of the bargain. He wouldn't risk it, not even if his stonewalling cost him Rebecca's trust. Don't kid yourself about who I am. I understand men like Kavanaugh and Brogan. You don't know anything about me. Well, you're right about that. Why is it when I run a background check on you, I get nothing? Casper the Ghost has more substance than you, my friend. I have my reasons, none of which concern you. Yeah, but you're making it my business. You keep turning up when I least expect you. One way or another, you're plugged into the FBI, and you're an insider to Kavanaugh. I don't have to understand why. All I need is for you to take on a partner. The way I see it, you don't have a choice. You don't know what you're asking. Stay out of this, Rebecca. You want to push me? Call my bluff? See what happens. Is that a threat? Take it any way you want, Diego, if that's your real name. If you don't play by my rules, I'll expose you to Kavanaugh. At this point, I have nothing to lose. You would do that. Risk my life. Maybe others. She couldn't look him in the eye and gave no indication she would answer. So he added, From where I stand, you are not much better than Kavanaugh. You have no idea what you're doing. Then explain it to me, she shrugged. When he kept his silence, she went on. Thought so. To hell with mutual trust, huh? Look, all you have to do is keep me in the loop, and I may need you to do things for me, without a big debate. If Kavanaugh thinks I'm working with the SAPD, that loop you talk about will be around my neck. Then you'll have to keep your guard up. That should be second nature to a guy like you. A guy like me. She definitely had him pegged, and he couldn't exactly belabor the point. He was the one with a membership card to two criminal organizations, secret handshake and all. Nice to see you hold me in such high regard. He had warned Draper not to pull Rebecca off the case, but Diego was in no position to take on the FBI. He had no clout. Now the egotistical Fed would get her fired if the man knew she was trying to blackmail his prize informant into cooperating. Diego wouldn't let it happen. Rebecca was a good detective and didn't deserve the added grief but he wouldn't let Joseph Rivera down either. The way he looked at it, one more secret to keep wouldn't break the bank, so he had a new partner, one he had to protect from Kavanaugh and the FBI. Besides, trusting someone else would be his first step back to a normal life. He'd been an undercover persona non grata for such a long time, he didn't know if he had it in him. But for Rebecca, he would be willing to try. Diego only hoped he wasn't pinning a bullseye on his own back. I need time to think. I'll give you my decision tomorrow. Diego turned to leave. You're right, like you have a choice, she fumed. His posturing left her frustrated. He hadn't admitted to being an undercover fed, but he hadn't denied it either. In Galvin's world, secrets were never in short supply. But as he grabbed the fire escape rail and swung a leg over the wall to straddle it, Becca's eyes strayed to areas of Diego's body she wouldn't have the nerve to stare at with him watching. She pictured him without a stitch of clothes, and the vivid image brought a rush of blood to her cheeks, and elsewhere. In every way, this man would be a handful. Don't think too much, Galvin. If I don't hear from you, I'm moving on to my version of a plan B, and I guarantee you won't like it. She followed him to the edge, crossing her arms, chin raised. Becca had to make him believe she intended to go through with this. But before Diego started down the steps, he fixed his dark eyes on her. This time, he didn't bother to hide his appetite. The lust in his eyes mesmerized her. Threats don't work with me, but I've always found a little honey goes a long way. 
he pulled her to his chest, wrapping her in his strong embrace. Diego plunged his tongue into her mouth and teased her with the promise of unrestrained sex. Nothing delicate about this kiss. A moan of pleasure rumbled in his chest and resonated through her body, making her lightheaded and weak in the knees. A powerful quiver raced across her skin, but all too suddenly, the kiss was over, leaving her empty and wanting more. Eyes wide, she couldn't move. Her feet were planted like a damned geranium in a heavy clay pot. Until tomorrow, Rebecca. His chest heaving, Diego stroked a finger across her cheek with yearning in his eyes and a kind-hearted smile on his handsome face. And I do understand the importance of family. More than you know, he whispered. The gentle tone in his voice and his affectionate touch on her cheek lingered long after he had gone down the fire escape. Becca leaned against the wall and watched him go. In the wake of his heated kiss, Diego's sudden tenderness touched her heart. She wanted to take everything back. Blackmail was no way to start a relationship. But speaking aloud would only break the spell. Becca touched her lips, trying to hold on to the fevered sensation of his kiss, the urgency of it. And despite her threats, the man maintained his dignity. She hadn't deserved his generosity, but she'd take it, especially if it meant justice for Danielle and Isabel. Across the river, a man stood in the shadows of another rooftop, pulling the binoculars down from his battered face. Following the detective home from the police station to find out where she lived had paid off in spades. Matt Brogan couldn't believe his stroke of good luck. Well, I'll be damned, he grinned. Wicked thoughts of retribution dominated his mind. Why the hell are you so fucking cozy with a cop you only met this morning, Galvin? He couldn't help it. A chuckle rolled through his chest, giving voice to the smirk on his face. The gesture made his bruises ache and his broken nose throb, a merciless reminder of the humiliation he had suffered at the hands of Diego Galvin, but no more. He would finally have the upper hand with the mix. Brogan had tried to catch Galvin off the estate by following him to see where he went after hours, but he'd been caught every time and ridiculed afterward by the slick SOB. He should have thought of this before. All he needed was the right bait. Brogan couldn't wait to see the look on Kavanaugh's face when he reported this. The old man would be pleased. He might even earn points with Rivera, uncovering his boy playing tonsil hockey with a cop from the SAPD. Matt Brogan would enjoy killing Diego Galvin, a slow, agonizing death. A gift to the boss man and a show of respect to the Rivera clan, all in one package. And with any luck, Kavanaugh would reward him for a job well done by giving him the sexy cop. He grew hard just thinking about it. I told you it would only be a matter of time, Mex. Now you're mine. Chapter 7 Kavanaugh Estate, an hour later. He had a sickening feeling in the pit of his stomach. Overnight, the universe must have realigned and his luck turned, and not in a good way. A dark premonition weighed heavy. After a quick finger comb of his ashen hair, Hunter Kavanaugh pulled at the sash of his black silk robe as he stood at the top of the grand staircase. Only minutes earlier, a servant had awakened him, rapping on his bedroom door, an urgent matter. Now he looked down into the foyer, awash in pale light. Brogan paced near the entry. The man's heavy footfalls echoed on imported tile, an ominous noise at this hour. With a hand gliding down the banister, he took a step at a time, his descent cautious. Nothing good ever came in the middle of the night. He made his facial expression a blank slate. This had better be important. Brogan stopped and turned, his face a mix of dread and a peculiar smugness. I followed the detective like you said, he blurted out. Before the man continued, Kavanaugh waved a hand to stop him. Let's talk in the study. I'm sure privacy is in order. Brogan followed him, close on his heels, when Kavanaugh crossed the threshold of the study, he flipped on an overhead light and dimmed it. He turned his head and ordered, Close the door behind you. Kavanaugh poured himself a cognac and took a sip before he settled behind his desk. He did not offer any to Brogan, not until he heard what the man had to say. Brogan sat on the edge of a black leather chair, leaning forward to place an elbow on the corner of Kavanaugh's desk, a gesture he found presumptuous and rude. Without waiting, Brogan continued his report. That detective, I followed her like you said. 
She lives down on the river in a condo, but when I set up my surveillance across from her windows, I found out she had a visitor. Brogan raised an eyebrow and nodded, a grin on his face. The man waited without another word. After a long moment, Kavanaugh spoke up. Tell me, Mr. Brogan, how long have you and I worked together? His question threw Brogan. The man narrowed his eyes and answered, Almost ten years, sir. Yes, and in all that time, have you ever known me to play guessing games with you? Kavanaugh asked. No, sir, guess not. I mean, no, sir. Brogan swallowed. His smirk faded for only a second, but it came back with a flourish. But you never would have guessed in a million years. Turns out that sexy cop had a visitor waiting on a rooftop, and he didn't look to be a stranger, no, sir. Out with it, man, Kavanaugh demanded, letting his anger seep to the surface. Diego Galvin, Rivera's boy and the hot cop, and they got a thing going on. His words lingered in the air like exhaust fumes. Kavanaugh had a hard time catching his breath. What? His heart leapt in his chest. Blood rushed to his face. Yep, they were going at it hot and heavy. He even shelled out some bucks to buy her flowers. Looks like the Mex has been doing her for a long time, and I know how you feel about coincidences, sir. I never trusted the bastard. Kavanaugh shut his eyes tight. Conversations he had with Galvin replayed in his head over and over. Had he seen it coming? Rivera assured him Galvin was a player, someone he trusted with his life. No, this can't be happening. Brogan rattled on, but Kavanaugh blocked out his ramblings. His chest heaved, the pulse of his heart thudded in his ears, his weakness mocking him. Are you quite sure it was Galvin? He opened his eyes and glared at Brogan, letting the ice blue of his eyes reinforce his message. Because if this is some vendetta between you two, and you bring down Rivera on my head and ruin everything, you will wish your mother had never spread her legs to conceive you. Brogan's eyes grew wide, his Adam's apple bobbed. I swear, boss, I ain't lying. I was as surprised as you. Sure, I hate the guy, but I was only thinking of you when I saw that high and mighty mechs betraying you, honest to God. The man waved a hand over his chest in the sign of the cross. Brogan had conveniently found religion. The gesture, coupled with Brogan's justifications, almost made Kavanaugh laugh aloud. Almost. Kavanaugh tossed back the rest of his cognac and let the liquor burn. He had to think. Please, boss, let me kill him for you. I swear I'll do it right, slow and hard. That would give us both satisfaction indeed, but I can't let you do that. Not yet. Brogan couldn't hide the look of shock on his face. Kavanaugh raised a hand so the man wouldn't interrupt his thoughts. This is a game for shrewdness, Mr. Brogan. I'm afraid you are ill-equipped. He knew the man hadn't understood his insult. Kavanaugh never would have conducted such a battle of wits with Galvin. His disappointment in this sudden turn of events swelled inside him. He'd had high hopes for Diego. He had intended to test his loyalty for Rivera and determine how far he'd have to go to sway the younger man to work for him instead. Now those hopes were crushed, beyond salvage, and Diego Galvin's life would soon follow the same course. Diego's death wish would become his self-fulfilling prophecy. I hadn't intended to play such a game, but the choice is no longer mine. Now I must stay one step ahead. Kavanaugh sat back in his leather chair and swiveled as he thought, his fingers steepled in front of him. I would like to assume Rivera is not a party to this betrayal. He has much to lose if Galvin is working with the police. But you see, Mr. Brogan, I can't be sure of that. Kavanaugh stood and walked to the console table to his right, deep in thought. He refilled his crystal snifter with cognac and filled another glass. When he returned, he placed a cognac in front of Brogan. The man had the audacity to finish the glass in one gulp, wiping his lips with the back of his hand. Kavanaugh ignored his lack of refinement. Galvin has no knowledge of my sideline business. Kavanaugh cringed at how close he had come to cutting Diego in on his little endeavor. After tightening his jaw, he continued. And this body found at the theater is only a recent occurrence, hardly significant enough for the local police to point a finger my way. None of this makes sense but I must play it safe and move while I still can. He sipped his cognac, staring straight through Brogan. He reached across his desk and retrieved a pricey Cuban cigar from his humidor. After cutting the cap with his double-bladed guillotine cutter, he lit the cigar and rotated it between his fingers. 
The puffs of rich smoke filled the air. I'll have to find a way to compromise Galvin, place him at the center of it all. He smiled at the thought. Rivera must not suspect my involvement, and if the police are using Diego as an informant, they might be embarrassed to find that their mole is part of a very nasty business. A plan took shape in his mind as cigar smoke made lazy spirals above his head. Either way, I'll have to cut my losses now. Time to liquidate the inventory. Unfortunately, my little hobby has come to an abrupt end. Did you and your men consolidate the merchandise as I asked? Yes, sir, just like you said. Brogan licked his lips and glanced over to the cognac decanter. Cavanaugh knew what he wanted and waved him permission to refill his glass. The man filled it to the rim and brought over the decanter, making himself at home. I'm afraid that as disappointed as I am to find out about Diego, my business associate, Mr. Rivera, shall be mortified to learn of Galvin's betrayal. After all, the man recommended him so highly. Rivera might have to make it up to me, somehow. Cavanaugh's low chuckle reverberated through the chamber, disrupting the stillness of the study. All I ask, when the time comes, you let me do it. Brogan smirked. I gotta take the mechs out my way. Cavanaugh crooked his lips into a smile. Agreed. And after all this is over, I want the cop, too. In the dim light of the study, Cavanaugh studied Brogan. The man's dark eyes glinted with an underlying madness, and he took great pleasure in killing, his undeniable skill. You take pride in your work, don't you, Mr. Brogan? Cavanaugh grinned. Yes, sir, I do. And who am I to deny you such fun? Detective Montgomery is yours when this is behind us, and for that, I would like a ringside seat. Cavanaugh sat back in his chair, listening to Brogan cackle. He sucked on the end of his cigar and blew smoke into the rafters of his study. Premonition be damned. Perhaps this turn of events would prove to be favorable after all. Mitieras Café y Panaderia at Market Square. Morning. Becca had specific instructions to meet Lieutenant Santiago in the back of Mitieras, in the room with the huge 3D mural on the wall. The sweet smell of baked goods lingered in the air as she walked by lighted display cases, brimming with an array of pastries and Mexican candy. The hostess had called her number. A young girl dressed in a white lacy blouse and colorful print skirt ushered Becca through the narrow aisles. Waitstaff and busboys darted across her path, a mad game of restaurant dodgeball. A sea of Christmas lights and tinsel draped from the ceiling, a festival year-round. All the glitz and glitter came from an absurd collection of Christmas paraphernalia and rainbow-colored light bulbs, the cafe's trademark decor. And the vibrant sound of a mariachi band resounded through the sprawling restaurant, a refrain of Cielito Lindo. A high-pitched violin blended with a heart-thumping trumpet, and strong vocals were heard over the heavy strum of guitars as the musicians strolled from table to table. Santiago had picked the place on purpose, knowing audio surveillance would be impossible. It didn't hurt to be cautious. Dressed in jeans and a University of Texas sweatshirt with her dark hair in a ponytail, Becca had walked from her condo, arriving early. She ordered coffee and waited for Santiago. But another man had plagued her mind since last night. She stared into her coffee cup, thinking of Diego. In replaying their time together, she found something he said had lingered. If Kavanaugh thinks I'm working with the SAPD, that loop you talk about will be around my neck. At first, she didn't know why this stood out in her mind, yet she kept coming back to it. Finally, it struck her. Sure, Diego would be worried about Kavanaugh, but why had he not expressed the same concern about Rivera? Galvin should have been worried about both men, equally. She had missed something big, but couldn't put her finger on it. Damn it, she muttered under her breath. Is the coffee that bad? The lieutenant's voice pulled her back. The man grabbed the chair across from her and sat. So, how's vacation? Arturo Santiago grinned, a welcome sight. Yeah, burning vacation days. Remind me to thank you when I'm feeling more generous. She returned his smile. Actually, I owe you one. Big time. Good to know, he replied. Santiago called the waitress over and they ordered two machacado plates, eggs mixed with shredded beef jerky, tomatoes, onions, jalapenos, and served with refried beans and fresh homemade tortillas. Becca's empty stomach growled. 
drowned out by a chorus of La Bamba, a favorite request with the tourists. So tell me, why did I get kicked off the Marquez case? It wouldn't have anything to do with Kavanaugh, would it? She leaned her elbows on the table and narrowed her eyes. Everything to do with him. As you know, Draper suspects the man might be the one behind the missing girls. A human trafficking slant. Santiago munched on chips and salsa. But they don't have much so far. Kavanaugh is a clever bastard, and it's not an easy crime to prosecute. Becca didn't hide her look of shock. Draper thinks the guy is using his travel business for the sex trade? That's a push, isn't it? It's a theory. But human trafficking goes beyond the sex angle. It's modern-day slavery, with forced labor in factories, restaurants, or agricultural work. It can even hit closer to home with someone's nanny or housekeeper, a forced marriage, or even trafficking in human organs for transplantation. A heart going to the highest bidder under the radar of the authorities. It's the third largest and fastest growing criminal industry in the world. And Kavanaugh may have brought it to our doorstep. No telling what the guy's into. Santiago shook his head in disgust. You'd think it would be a business with a lot of risk to it. What risk? These bastards prey on vulnerable populations like runaways, abused kids, and the poor. Who are they going to complain to? Traffickers turn a quick profit with virtually no overhead. And their coin is earned over a longer period of time using the same victim, unlike drugs that can be depleted. He slouched back in his chair, a distant look on his face. And with the international borders, it makes it more difficult to detect and prosecute. Hell, I would guess prosecution doesn't stack up to much compared to the income potential. She let his anger influence her own. Prosecution is no kind of deterrent. And I bet a large, well-funded group like Kavanaugh's organization can wield political power, too. Extortion and violence can convince a lot of people to turn their heads the other way. She let the idea sink in before she continued. I wonder how long this has been going on. Maybe Isabel. Who? He asked. Oh, sorry. She shrugged. I kept a little information from Draper. The bones in the theater. I may have a name. Isabel Marquez. But no firm ID yet. I knew you had something up your sleeve. You caved too easy. He took a sip of coffee, hiding a smile. And I think I know how Draper found out about my interview with Kavanaugh. She pulled off a piece of a flour tortilla and ate it. Go ahead, say it, he grinned. I knew you'd figure it out. He's got someone on the inside, doesn't he? A fed. Becca smiled when Santiago shrugged, but she didn't share any more information about Diego. Her foray into blackmail would remain her little secret. Yeah, but his guy's not a fed. Supposedly, Draper turned someone already in place, made him an informant. The feds can play real dirty when they need to. He's got something on this guy, but Draper's pretty tight-lipped about the whole thing. I had to pull strings to get that much. The waitress brought their plates and refilled their coffee. Becca had been hungry, but the thought of Kavanaugh being involved in sex slavery turned her stomach. Had Isabel Marquez been one of his early victims? And when Danielle's sweet face emerged in her mind, she shut her eyes tight and lowered her head to stifle the image of Danny being involved in such cruelty. Her sister's last days were hard to imagine, even for a jaded cop. Had Kavanaugh been the purse strings behind Danielle's abduction? What's the matter, Becca? He set his fork down on the side of his plate. You okay? Human trafficking? What if Danny... Don't go borrowing trouble. You don't know what happened to Danielle. Her case was different from the other girls, but whatever happened to her, it's over now. His face reflected the pain in her heart. You've got to find some closure, Becca. I'm worried about you. I know, Art, and I appreciate your concern, but I have to get through this my own way, my own time. Please understand. I do. I hate seeing you go through it. That's all. To get the focus off her, she changed the subject. She briefed him on Joe Rivera and the Global Enterprises connection to Kavanaugh. What about Rivera? Do you think he's involved in the trafficking with the merger of his company? She asked, poking through her eggs with a fork. Her stomach twisted into a knot as she waited for his reply. If both Rivera and Kavanaugh were guilty of such a despicable crime, maybe Diego had played a part too. And even if Draper turned Diego, planning to use him as an informant and a witness to indict the bigger fish, it didn't let him off the hook. 
Diego's bargain with the FBI wouldn't exonerate him from his part in such a heinous crime. The thought shocked her. How could she be so wrong about him? Art, I think the Marquez case is linked to Kavanaugh in some way. His connection to young girls could span many years. Maybe Isabel was an early victim. She wiped her mouth with a napkin. I don't have any hard evidence yet, but my gut is sending me hinky vibes. My gut does that too, but I call it gas, he teased. Thanks for the image burned into my brain, but hear me out. I think Draper and Murphy will drop the Marquez case to go after Kavanaugh on the bigger, more visible arrest. They may not notice I'm still working on it. And this case may shed some light on Kavanaugh from another direction. What do you think? Sounds logical. What are your plans? Rudy Marquez, Isabel's brother, told me he saw his sister get into a Mercedes one night, along with a friend of hers, Sonia Garza. He followed them to Kavanaugh's estate. No kidding. Could be a connection worth exploring, Becca. Yeah, I thought so too. I'll track down Sonia Garza later today. Before I forget, he reached into the inside pocket of his suit jacket and pulled out a thick white envelope. You received a couple of faxes. I thought they might have something to do with your theater case. I made copies for you, but gave the originals to Murphy. Yeah, I'm sure he was thrilled. Becca opened the envelope and looked at the contents. She had contacted Hans Muller's architectural firm and the subcontractor on the first renovation of the theater, asking for the roster of personnel on the job. The work coincided with the time frame of Isabel's disappearance. She spotted Rudy Marquez's name on the subcontractor's listing easily enough, but the architectural firm's statement would require some review. The billing of time had more detail. She wanted the invoicing for comparison against the subcontractor's payroll records. Becca shoved the documents back into the envelope and set it on the table by her plate. Personnel records. I'll have to check them out. Thanks. She took her last bite of refried beans and set her fork down. Santiago had wiped his plate clean. So tell me, Art, why did you decide to help me? The waitress slipped the check on their table and refilled their coffee cups. Santiago waited for the girl to finish and leave before he answered Becca's question. Draper is an arrogant ass and he's pissing on my jurisdiction. And you? You're one of mine. End of story. He shrugged. And if he's got an informant on the inside, I don't want you getting wrapped up in the middle. Santiago stared at her for a moment, but after a while he rolled his eyes and grinned. You're probably going to ignore my sage advice, so do me a favor. Don't fly solo on this one, Becca. If you need backup, call me. And just for grins, let's pretend I'm your supervisor. Keep me informed, will ya? Without waiting for her reply, Santiago reached across the table and tossed her the check. By the way, the tab's on you. Thanks, Art. Remember this at my next evaluation. A raise would be nice. Before he took off, Santiago stood and fixed his eyes on her. Without knowing more about this inside informant, I'd proceed with extreme caution. He might self-destruct in Draper's face, and with the stakes being so high, killing may become part of the equation. Watch your back. Becca nodded and gave him a mock salute, pretending a show of humor she didn't feel. Draper won't keep me apprised of every detail, only the big ticket items if I press him. So I don't know how much help I'll be, but I'll do my best. He added, you've already been a big help. Thanks, LT. Nice to know you're on my side. She watched Santiago leave, but his words remained in her mind. Watch your back. In light of what she learned from the lieutenant, maybe her coercion of Galvin had been hasty, guided more by her libido. Would she heed Santiago's warning, or would she trust her own judgment of a man with soulful dark eyes and a gentle touch? Lieutenant Santiago could play the role of cavalry if she got herself painted into a dark and dangerous corner, but she still needed a wingman someone on the inside of the investigation. The next time she met him, Becca would have to decide if she trusted Diego Galvin. Texas weather earned its notoriety for sudden change. Leaden clouds lumbered in for the late afternoon, with the rumble of thunder heard in the distance. The wind kicked up, not to be outdone. As she got out of her car, Becca looked toward the darkening horizon, hoping she'd be done before the onslaught of rain. Rush hour traffic in San Antonio was tough enough, but an abrupt downpour would make it impossible. She had upgraded from sweatshirt and jeans to a rust-colored skirt and blazer, her gun at the small of her back in a holster. 
but given the weather, she might not have made the right choice. Becca turned her attention to an address she came to find and headed toward the building. Sonia Garza lived in a modest apartment down from Ingram Park Mall, off the Loop 410 Frontage Road. The drone of traffic from the freeway groused in the background, a steady murmur. Gang signs had been spray-painted in black on the mailbox units, utility boxes, and a brick wall at the entrance to the parking lot. No one bothered to clean them up. They'd only reappear. Sparse shrubs and small patches of lawn were the only real color to the bland setting of white brick, with a layer of dirt at its base and beige paint peeled by the sun. And if the drab, unkempt appearance to the complex didn't tell the tale, by the looks of the cars in the parking lot, rent must be cheap. With the smell of rain heavy in the air, Becca walked up the wrought iron steps to the second floor, one of the units in the back of the parking lot. She knocked on the door marked 203. A young woman with straight dark hair to her shoulders answered the door, high cheekbones and a narrow chin with thin lips of glossy pink. Her almond-shaped eyes were outlined in smudged black, a bit much for daytime. The slender young woman wore faded blue jeans and a t-shirt in black, under an oversized blue plaid shirt rolled at the sleeves. A black leather wristband. She had a pseudo-grunge goth style that gave her an edge. Sonia Garza? Yes. She narrowed her eyes and stood her ground at the door, playing the role of gatekeeper. Becca showed her badge. My name is Detective Rebecca Montgomery with the San Antonio Police Department. I'd like to ask you some questions about Isabel Marquez. Isabel, she asked, Sonia looked as if she didn't know the name, but her questioning expression eventually faded to dread. I was on my way out. This will only take a minute, Becca insisted. It took a long moment for Sonia to shrug and back away from the doorway. Come on in, for a minute. She tightened her jaw and her posture tensed as Becca stepped through the door. I'm not sure how much I can help, Detective Montgomery. The apartment was not very big. From the front door, Becca got a good picture of the whole place. A small living room and a galley-style kitchen with one bedroom and bathroom to the rear, chipped and uneven harvest gold linoleum butted up against dated brown shag carpet with forgettable furnishings to match. The stale odor of cigarettes, grease, and cheap perfume lingered in the air. Dirty dishes lay in the sink alongside empty takeout Chinese cartons, a feast for the flies buzzing the room. Hard to believe Sonia Garza was only a few years younger than Becca. Different choices, another road taken depressing. When she noticed Becca canvassing the room, Sonia rolled her eyes and said, maid doesn't come until tomorrow. Becca was afraid to sit down, but if she wanted to encourage Sonia's candor, she had to help the woman relax. Yeah, same with mine. Becca smiled. Hard to find good help these days. Sonia returned a quick grin and joined her on the sofa. She sat on the edge of the couch, looking like she'd rather be sitting in a dentist chair getting drilled for cavities. Do you work, Sonia? The young woman avoided her eyes. No, not right now. I got fired a week ago from a warehouse job, night shift. Alejandro meatpacking. Guess now I have time for travel. Becca ignored her sarcasm. How well did you know Isabel? We went to high school together. Knew a lot of the same people. Hung out sometimes. She replied, nodding like a bobblehead doll. Underneath the makeup, Becca saw the young girl Sonia might have been in high school. But the years had taken their toll, aged her through the eyes. An old soul. Is there something new? Has Isabel been found? I'm looking into her missing persons case. When was the last time you saw her? We, um... Sonia stalled and avoided eye contact. She crossed her legs and picked at the chipping polish on a fingernail, her stubby nails polished in black. Can't remember... It's been too long ago. She had no preconceived notions about Sonia, but she hadn't expected to get the cold shoulder from a friend of Isabel's. Her evasive demeanor struck a chord. Becca searched for a way to get her talking. Someone told me you and Isabel were friends. What did you used to do together? I don't see how me telling you about two kids shopping at North Star Mall is going to help your investigation. When Sonia's attitude flared, Becca kept her cool. Not an easy trick. Your insights might give me a better picture of Isabel. What can you tell me about her? What do you want to know exactly? Answering a question with a question, not a good sign. Becca sat back, letting the young woman know she intended to stay a while. The rain started to pour outside. 
In no time, it battered the front window in waves. The sound only added unnecessary tension to a room filled with it. Oh, I don't know. Basic questions like, who were some of her friends? Where did she like to hang out? Did she have any enemies? Was she dating anyone in particular? Things a friend should know. Becca couldn't help the edge to her voice. She was tired of playing games. But her new approach garnered the same resistance. Sonia glared in silence. You're not being very helpful, Ms. Garza. That makes me wonder why. Becca prepared to take the gloves off. She needed answers, and Sonia looked like a girl who could provide them, but chose not to. Do I need a lawyer? She leaned forward, her eyes fixed on Sonia. Not if you have nothing to hide. When the woman kept her silence, Becca added, You want to take a ride downtown, make this official? Because I'll be more than happy to oblige. You probably got your lawyer on speed dial. He can meet us. She shut her eyes and shook her head. Look, before Isabel disappeared, we grew apart and things changed between us. As she talked, Sonia stood and walked into the kitchen to light a cigarette. She blew the smoke into the air with force. How so? Becca asked. She changed. She wasn't the person I thought. That's all. She shrugged, a hand stuffed into a pocket while the other held her cigarette. You gotta give me more than that, Sonia, Becca pressed. Before she disappeared, when was the last time you saw her? Months, I'd say. Her answer came without hesitation, punctuated by another shrug, the gesture du jour. Her improved memory did not go unnoticed by Becca, along with her contradiction of Rudy Marquez's story about the Mercedes. Sonia paced her small living room. She took a quick look out her front window, peeking at the rain through dingy Venetian blinds. An animal trapped in a tight cage of her own making, with the growing darkness outside, the room melded into shadow, a blessing as far as Becca was concerned. But eventually, Sonia flicked on a lamp, the pale yellow struggling to make a difference. Ignoring the deluge, the woman turned and flicked ashes to the floor, a question on her mind. Why are you talking to me? I mean, it's not like me and Isabel were best friends. Time to turn up the heat. She stood and joined Sonia at the window. A crack of thunder made Becca's heart race, but she kept her face stern. I have an eyewitness who saw you get into a Mercedes with Isabel the week before she disappeared. So if you lie to me, I'll know it. Now tell me what happened. Becca held her gaze rock steady and climbed into the girl's space, her discomfort zone. Sonia only flinched for an instant, but the attitude came back with gusto. She raised her chin in defiance, but soon her eyes glistened with the onset of tears. The sudden change took Becca by surprise, a tough girl taken down a peg. A Mercedes? I don't know anyone with that kind of a car. Not then, not now. What's this about, detective? A tear slid down her face. Without hesitation, Sonia wiped it away. Look, I'm telling you the truth. I don't know anything about Isabel and a Mercedes. Becca hung tough. She wasn't done with her bluff. And your boyfriend, the one with expensive taste in cars? I suppose he never drove a high-priced ride like that. I don't know who you've been talking to, but I never had a boyfriend with that much jack. Look at me, at this dump. Does that make sense to you? Sonia's shoulders took on the image of profound defeat. She retreated to the sofa and slumped into it. The girl had a point. Had Rudy lied to her about Kavanaugh's connection to Isabel? Why would he do that? Back then, I dated some, but no one in particular. I wasn't exactly considered outgoing as a kid. I don't understand. What has this got to do with Isabel? Her hardened expression melted into genuine concern. She looked lost. Becca joined her on the couch as the rain pelted the window pane behind her. I'm trying to establish a timeline prior to her disappearance. What did you and Isabel argue about? What argument? You said you grew apart, but that usually translates to an argument of some kind. Becca smiled. My sister and I used to. She stopped herself. Tell me what happened between the two of you. There's nothing to tell, except... No eye contact, but a dark trail colored her cheeks, makeup mixed with tears. I'm listening. Becca edged nearer. Look, Isabel and I were friends until she... Sonia took a deep drag off her cigarette and blew the smoke into the air. With slender fingers, she swiped her face again. Her mom is real sweet. I don't want her mother to find out. Find out what? 
Sonia leaned forward and stubbed out her cigarette onto a dirty plate. She collapsed back onto the sofa. With pain in her eyes, she began, You gotta understand. Kids like us don't see a lot of cash. The money was tempting. I thought about going to college, even. A real pipe dream for suckers, huh? Bitter regret tainted her voice. Cash for doing what? I don't want to get into trouble. She looked away, tears flowing. No one can know. Becca reached for her hand, a gesture she couldn't resist. Talk to me, Sonia. Tell me what happened. Becca used her first name, a deliberate move. A roll of thunder outside muffled quiet sobs. Sonia pulled her hand away, looking frail and thin. She crossed her arms over her chest, withdrawing into the past. Did someone try to recruit you into prostitution, Sonia? Becca took a chance by prompting her, not exactly following interview protocol. To get at the truth, she nudged Sonia and gambled on the prostitution angle. After a long moment, the young woman nodded and wiped her face with a sleeve, her eyes and cheeks red. Who? Becca inched closer. Who did this to you? She expected to hear Hunter Cavanaugh's name. Becca held her breath and fixed her eyes on the girl, waiting. Time stopped. Sonia drew a ragged breath and whispered her secret in shame. Isabel Marquez. Lightning flashed across the blinds, trailed by a loud crack of thunder. A stunned Becca never heard the sound. Chapter 8 I never did it. I couldn't, Sonia Garza confided as she stood, her arms wrapped around herself. No one knows. I was so ashamed I even thought about it. That's why I lied to you before. Denial is so much easier than admitting it to myself. And I always believed Isabel would twist what happened to get back at me if I said anything. The young woman walked toward the window and peeked through the blinds. I never wanted Isabel's family to find out, she added. What good would that do? They've suffered too much already. I didn't want to be the one who told. Becca knew what she meant. She'd seen the family's pain imprinted in the eyes of Hortense Marquez, and the brothers each carried his own burden. You won't tell them, will you? Sonia turned her head and looked back over her shoulder. I don't think they could handle it. Not sure I'll be able to keep a promise like that. Depends on how the investigation goes. Becca heard the compassion in Sonia's voice and wanted to reflect the same. What happened? Tell me about Isabel. A low rumble of thunder and light filtered through the blinds, then vanished, casting the room back into shadows. The meager light from the lamp strained against the gloom, but at least the storm had lost its loud bluster. Sonia turned from the window and leaned against a wall. Her eyes stared straight through Becca. The past eclipsed a dreary afternoon. She started hanging out with different people. Her voice was almost a whisper, choked by regret. We grew apart, especially after she pushed so hard to get me to. Sonia stopped and lowered her head. Becca distracted her with another question. Who did she hang out with exactly? She thought for a long moment, then answered, I never knew. And there were the rumors. Rumors about what? Becca asked. She joined Becca on the sofa and gripped a pillow to her chest. Isabel came from a poor family, but all of a sudden she flashed cash and wore expensive jewelry. I hated math in school, but even I knew how to add two and two. She wore a gold necklace. You know anything about it? A gold necklace? Sonia's brow furrowed, shaped like a heart with small diamonds on it. Becca clarified. Sonia swallowed hard, a look of surprise on her face. Eventually, she shook her head. No, I don't know anything about it. I think I saw it on her once or twice. She may have worn it for a class photo, but I never knew where she got it. Come on, you mean you weren't even curious enough to ask about it? If I saw a friend wearing a necklace like that, I'd want to know where she got it. You have to understand, Detective, we weren't talking much by then. She was such a stranger, and, and anything like that only reminded me how she earned it. Her tears flowed again, more tragic in light of the distinct rhythm of the rain. A gentle patter doused the pain, lingering in the wake of the storm. She reached for Sonia's thin shoulder and stroked it with her fingertips, a reminder she wasn't alone. This time, Sonia didn't pull away. As Becca looked across the small room, 
She saw the afternoon sun gain strength in spurts through the Venetian blinds. The storm had subsided. She took solace in nature's cooperation and hoped Sonia would, too. I'm sorry to dredge up the past. I do understand how hard this must be. Becca commiserated. I feel like such a baby. Sonia sobbed, her words garbled. I haven't cried like this since those days about Isabel. It's hard to lose someone, especially like this. Can I ask you something, detective? Sonia wiped her eyes and looked up. Ever since you walked in here, I've wanted to ask. You look familiar, like maybe I've seen you on TV. Is that possible? Becca had gotten this question before and always dismissed it without an answer. But with Sonia, she wanted to be truthful, to a degree. It felt like the thing to do. A while back, I lost my sister Danielle. She was abducted, and my mother and I were interviewed by the news media. Oh, God, now I remember. Danielle Montgomery. Sure, I must have seen that. Sonia cupped a hand to her mouth in surprise. Did you ever find your sister? Becca swallowed and brushed back a strand of hair behind her ear before she answered. No, she's dead. She didn't want to shed light on the details. She'd already said too much. I'm so sorry. Isabel's case must be hard for you. Sonia looked her in the eye. For a moment, Becca felt a connection to a kindred spirit in her tragedy. But a sharp feeling of vulnerability closed in, and all she wanted to do was leave the depressing little apartment. The rain had eased enough to make a run for her car. Becca handed Sonia her business card and walked to the door. If you think of anything else... Please contact me. Anytime. She forced a smile and touched Sonia's arm. And thanks for your candor. It couldn't have been easy. The younger woman only nodded. No smile. In truth, none of this had been easy for either of them. This book is continued on disc four. No One Heard Her Scream by Jordan Dane continued. Disc four. Becca walked out the door and headed for her car, under the steady drizzle. The face of Isabel Marquez flooded her mind. Up until now, she had built a perception about her murder victim. Being a recruiter for a prostitution ring had not been part of the equation. Sonia's revelation shocked her. It shouldn't have. Becca should have stayed objective and open to anything, allowing the evidence to lead the way. Why hadn't she allowed her training and experience to guide her? Becca unlocked her car and slid inside, starting it with a turn of the key in the ignition. She drove through the apartment complex and pulled onto the frontage road, with her wiper blades beating to a slow, steady rhythm. The rain and traffic sounds were no more than white noise. In the aftermath of the storm, drivers jockeyed for position and made the drive home slow. It gave her time to think about the things she'd been avoiding. The Marquez case took a back seat to the issues she had on her mind, it wasn't the murder investigation that challenged her most. It was how the case affected her, forced her to take a long, hard look at herself. Her personal life had been the source of her weakness. Everything sprang from there. One by one, her failures emerged for a closer look, persistent like the unchanging rain. At the root of it all, she had lost her family, a link she thought would be impossible to break, indestructible. Becca blamed herself for the fragile tie and with her sister dead and her relationship to Mama strained and virtually non-existent, she compounded the blunder with another grand mistake. She let Diego Galvin get under her skin without really questioning his motives. The skeptical side to her nature had been stifled when she needed it most. Why? But with the question barely out there for examination, she knew the answer. Her need to stay connected to another living soul had been the driving force. She'd become a master at erecting walls to keep others out, and the task had grown exhausting. Becca knew it and understood the need, yet she had broken down the barrier for Diego. She had reached out to a stranger, a man who might not have her best interests at heart. The move didn't strike her as savvy. She only hoped the word self-destructive wouldn't describe it best. Her mind surged with questions about Diego Galvin. How much did he actually know about her? Had Diego taken advantage of her vulnerability on purpose for his own personal agenda? Yes, he could have learned about Danielle from recognizing her on TV as Sonia had. 
but his link to the FBI as an informant made more sense as the source of his great insight. In the end, none of it mattered. She had allowed it to happen. Diego had gained a foothold in her heart, trust or no trust. Becca prepped the ground herself, making it fertile for whatever would sprout from their union. How far would she let him go? Diego might want more than she had to give. You are such a fool, Becca, she muttered. At a stoplight, she ran fingers across her damp hair, looking at herself in the rearview mirror. The eyes of a stranger stared back, until the mirror shifted to another image. Her sister trickled from her memory, and Becca saw remnants of Danielle in her own face. That's when she knew. She'd screwed up. Her professional judgment on the Marquez case had been clouded by her obsession, a fixation to find answers in Danny's death. As a result, she had tainted the Marquez investigation, right down to the way she'd conducted her interviews. Were Isabel's and Danielle's cases linked at all, or did she merely want them to be, need them to be? Was it easier to blame someone like Hunter Cavanaugh than to admit she might never find Danielle's killer, her own failure? She gritted her teeth as she made a right turn toward home. The Riverwalk, downtown San Antonio. Becca stared out the window of her condo onto the river below. The rain had cleared the usual crowds of tourists. Stone walkways and big-leafed foliage were slick with sheen, making everything appear lush. And as the sun dipped below the horizon, it cast a fire against the lingering storm clouds. Orange and gray streaked the sky over the rooftops of the city. She glanced at her watch. After six, within the half hour it would be dark, given the added cloud cover. The day had passed, and she still hadn't heard from Diego. After coming through her front door more than an hour ago, Becca half expected to see a white rose placed near her window by the fire escape. The move had become his signature in her mind. Despite her effort to quell the expectation, she found her heart racing at the thought of him waiting on her rooftop again, with his hair damp and his body slick with rain. Becca would envy the raindrops as they slid down his warm skin, but no roses heralded his presence. Her disappointment made her anxious and moody. Despite the doubts she had about Diego's motives, having him around made her feel like she wasn't alone. A completely insane notion. I gotta get a grip on this thing. Dressed in her SAPD Navy sweats and a white t-shirt, she headed for her kitchen and poured a glass of Chardonnay. Before she brought the wine glass to her lips, the phone rang. Her cell phone. She grabbed it off her kitchen counter and flipped it open. Montgomery. Hey, Becca. Sam Hastings. She recognized the voice of her CSI guy. You're working late. What's up? I think I have a murder weapon on the Imperial Theater case. Your hunch saved me some time. I got a match. To a mason's hammer? She asked. Yep. The murder weapon was similar to other hammers, but it had a more angular head, a specific structure. The trauma to the skull is consistent with a 20-ounce mason hammer. Now it's up to you to put the weapon into context. Yeah. Her head spun with the implication that Rudy Marquez might have had something to do with his sister's death. Thanks, Sam. Now go home and make your wife happy. Definitely my pleasure. <laughs> he hung up after a soft chuckle. For a moment, she stood in the kitchen with motive scenarios gyrating through her head. Eventually, it came to her. She remembered the payroll records and the architectural billing the lieutenant had given her that morning. The white envelope. Earlier in the day, she'd tossed the faxed information onto her coffee table in the living room. Becca rounded the corner of her kitchen and sat on her sofa. She spread the papers out to compare the two documents. As she expected to find, the name of Rudy Marquez had been on the payroll of the subcontractor, listed as a mason apprentice. Seven years ago, around the time Isabel went missing, Rudy would have been a teenager. No more than 18 or 19 tops. Becca drilled through the more detailed listing used to support the billings on the renovation charged to the architectural firm. She ran her finger down the list, not wanting to miss any detail. She found Rudy's name on page four, but another name stopped her cold. No way. There's got to be some kind of mistake. She rummaged through the papers and compared the two faxes again. One name had been omitted off the subcontractor's payroll, but was clearly listed on the invoice to the architect. Well, I'll be damned. Victor Marquez. The priest had been in the seminary during that time, but had apparently worked the renovation at the Imperial Theater on occasion. 
Why didn't you say anything about this, Victor? You kept your mouth shut and let Rudy take the spotlight. Why did the subcontractor not list Victor as an outright worker on the payroll, yet bill his hours on the project to the architect? With his part-time status, had they paid him under the table? But a bigger question loomed in her mind. If the investigation turned up the heat on Rudy, his older brother Victor could divert attention and share the limelight. With both brothers appearing guilty, reasonable doubt might set them both free. Had the priest planned to protect his little brother in the only way possible? Would the priest let things go that far? From what she had seen of Isabel's mother, the woman might not withstand such pain. Becca couldn't imagine Victor putting his mother through the turmoil. But it wasn't up to Becca to interpret the facts, only to follow the evidence to an irrefutable conclusion. Not a long list of what-ifs. Finding a plausible and substantiated motive would be key. Her list of suspects had grown by one more. A man wearing the white collar of the Catholic Church. Isabel Marquez might have died because of her involvement with prostitution, killed by person or persons unknown. Or maybe an overly protective brother, who disapproved of her choices, had murdered her. Pick a brother. Becca could make a case for either one doing the deed. Only hearsay pointed a finger to Hunter Cavanaugh, the desperate accusations of a brother who might have killed his own sister. Sonia had denied Rudy's story about the Mercedes and the trip out to the Cavanaugh estate. But even though Becca's gut told her the wealthy entrepreneur might still be involved, could she trust her instincts where Cavanaugh was concerned? Becca heard a soft knock. She rose from her couch and went to the door, peering through the peephole. Oh boy, not sure I can deal with this right now, she whispered. Slowly, she undid the deadbolt and chain and opened the door. Diego Galvin leaned against the doorframe, a long-stemmed white rose in his hand, looking good enough to feast on with a shrimp fork and lemon, scratch the lemon. The man wore a brown all-weather coat with boots, jeans, and a cream cable-knit sweater. At that moment, a phrase from the sci-fi channel popped into her head. Resistance is futile. Their eyes met, and his lazy smile greeted her, his dimples embellishing an already perfect moment. Infused with a lyric Hispanic accent, his low, seductive voice titillated her ear. Did you miss me, Rebecca? Chapter 9 You better be here with good news she threatened. I don't have time for mental sparring with you, gloves or no gloves. Diego handed Rebecca the rose and stepped inside her place. With a show of reluctance, she took his offering. He wanted to smile, but couldn't. You and I working together. Not sure that should be considered good news. He meant it. They were about to play a very dangerous game, one that might get them both killed. So you've decided to accept my offer? You act like you proposed some kind of legitimate merger. You blackmailed me. Let's at least start off with some kind of reality check. He yanked off his coat and tossed it over the back of a chair. What now? You have to fill me in on everything you know so far. He rolled his eyes and turned toward the window, looking down on the river. Diego jammed his hands into his pockets. Look, she persisted, you gotta give me a reason to trust you. The way I look at it, you're square in the enemy camp. Show me you're willing to cross sides. In the reflection of the glass, he saw her posture, defiant, with hands on her hips. Diego knew it would come to this, but Rebecca had no sense of foreplay. Can I have a drink first? I'm not a cheap date. I've got my reputation to think about, you know. He turned in time to catch her surprise at the shift in topic and her faint smile, this doesn't have to be an interrogation, does it? He shrugged. Besides, I'm hungry. She pointed a finger. This is not a date, mister. Fine, I'll cook. What do you have in the fridge? He trudged past her into the kitchen. Diego did a quick inventory of her pantry and refrigerator, hampered by a steady barrage of objections from Rebecca. Look, this is business, not a social occasion. Get out of my stuff. When he turned, she hit him square in the chest with a potholder. It flopped to the floor. Diego stared at it, then looked up. I hope you have a license for a concealed potholder. If not, I may have to report you to the authorities or the food network. Go ahead. There's never a cop around when you need one. She crossed her arms and raised an eyebrow, 
any amusement well disguised. In truth, all she had to do to stop him cold was look into his eyes. She stood in front of him now. The smell of her skin and the fire in her eyes made him forget what he wanted to say. Eventually, it came back to him. Eggs. Omelet. A basic to the single guy's playbook. He swallowed and cleared his throat. You feel like breakfast, Rebecca. You don't have to. He never let her finish. Diego stepped closer and touched the side of her cheek with a finger. I know I don't have to. I want to. He smiled. Now make yourself useful. Pour us some wine and find some music to inspire my culinary skills. Something from Sesame Street? Or would that be too challenging for you? She sniped. Not exactly my taste in music, but I can humor you. He pointed a finger. Hey, you can take a cheap shot at me, but lay off Big Bird. Sesame Street and Big Bird broke the ice. As Diego worked, they talked about the rain, the river walk, and the understated perfection of the eggshell. The subject matter wasn't important. He marveled at how it made him feel to speak of such mundane things, to feel so normal. Diego wanted to remember every second of their time together. He hadn't felt this carefree in years. Who taught you how to cook? She asked, sipping wine as she sat on a chair near the breakfast bar and watched him work from a safe distance. Diego sautéed vegetables while the eggs cooked in another pan. A fond memory crossed his mind. My mother. He grinned and gestured, holding a hand to his neck. She had it up to here with men who suddenly became invalids in the kitchen. My mother wanted nothing to do with raising one. She used to say, you and I are going to redefine the word machismo, Diego. I like her. Sounds like you two are close. We were. She's dead now. I loved her very much. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. It's okay. I brought it up. Thinking about his mother, Diego felt sadness infuse his soul. Rebecca mirrored how he felt with her sympathetic expression. Given their family situations, they made a fine pair. Diego scooped vegetables into the omelet and topped it with a sprinkle of grated cheese, happy for the distraction. He folded over the eggs and placed the lid on top to allow the cheese to melt. Actually, my mother was the reason. He stopped himself and set the spatula down. It all started with her. Okay, now you've got me hooked. But what about Mike Draper? What role did he play? She retrieved plates from a cabinet and helped set the table. Her eyes never strayed far from him. I heard you were an informant for the FBI. Is that true? Yes, unfortunately. But not by choice. Look, I don't want secrets between us, Rebecca. Not anymore. Let's eat, and I'll tell you whatever you want to know. With only a sliver of moon, the heavy cloud cover made the night black as ink, Puddles on the street reflected the shift in light when the clouds parted, but darkness prevailed. Brogan liked the dark. After hitting his remote control, he drove his jet-black Mercedes S550 through the automated gate and headed for the bowels of the old warehouse. On the outside, the place looked abandoned, but Brogan knew better. The broken-down old building housed a very dark secret. As a warehouse bay door lifted, its metal rattling and creaking, Brogan got a call on his cell. He recognized the number. Talk to me. Like you said, the Mex is at her place again. Pretty cozy setup. Brogan recognized the voice of his boy Nichols, the man he'd assigned to handle the surveillance on the cop. He yanked off his tie and undid the top buttons of his shirt. You picking up anything on that parabolic mic of yours? Brogan had insisted on the added surveillance equipment. If the Mex wasn't pounding the cop into her mattress a move Brogan could understand. He wanted to know what they were talking about. So far, I haven't gotten much, boss. They talked about working together in some kind of blackmail. But once she put on the music, my party was over. I'm only picking up a garbled mess now. Well, stick with it. Keep track of how long the bastard stays, but no matter what happens, stay with her. I know that's tough duty. He grinned. I'll check in with you later. Brogan disconnected. Using the cop as bait made it easy to track Galvin's whereabouts, an added bonus. And stalking the sexy cop with the tight little body had side benefits, especially with a good set of binoculars. He hated handing over the assignment to someone else, but Kavanaugh had given him other duties, ones with their own advantages. 
Brogan drove into the subterranean level of the building and parked. After he stepped from the car, he shrugged out of his suit jacket and tossed it onto the passenger seat. He rolled up his shirt sleeves and retrieved a flashlight from the back seat. With a slam of the car doors, he flicked on the light and let the beam guide him. The dank air smelled stale, and a chill lingered after the storm. With minimal electricity serving the building, the concrete vault closed in like a tomb. But the layout gave his men a fortified position to defend. Although from the outside it looked like the only way in, Brogan made sure he had an escape route, a recent addition before they moved in. Not even his men knew about it. He contracted it special. Like in all his other locales, he made sure both entrances were sealed and reinforced. His cleverness made him smile as he swaggered toward the noise, flashlight in hand. Only a few well-positioned light bulbs and the faint sound of a radio marked where his men were in the underground maze of ramps. Without windows, their rat hole remained steeped in shadows and never changed. Time meant nothing here. As he approached, Brogan raised his voice. Shut that crap off. This is a no-rap zone. You know how much I hate that shit. One of his men cut off the radio and emerged from the darkness, with the rest of them not far behind. A single overhead bulb cast a pale light where his man McPhee stood. Sorry, boss. It helps pass the time. If that's all you can think of to pass the time down here, McPhee, you got some serious problems. Brogan joined the rest of his men in a good laugh. When he lost interest in poking fun at McPhee, Brogan picked through the boxes of stale pizza sitting on a crate. He griped. This place stinks. What's that smell? One of them got sick again. Pretty rank stuff, McPhee shrugged. He lowered his voice. They're beginning to suspect something's up. Brogan glanced into the shadows, catching glimpses of young girls huddled together. He heard the rattle of chains. Some of them needed discipline and had been chained as punishment. A patchwork of blankets covered the concrete floor and the oldest girls defined their personal space using wooden crates, old cardboard boxes, and other trash to create temporary walls. They staked out their territories like caged animals, their clothes stuffed into garbage bags around them. The girls had been moved from place to place, but their new home wasn't fit for pigs. They had no idea this would be the last time they had to worry about their accommodations. Before the consolidation, the girls worked everything from porn flicks to frat parties, some had been sold outright through foreign connections, and for a fee, any sex act would be digitally recorded and distributed all over the world. Business had been good, but all that changed, thanks to the cop and Diego Galvin, Kavanaugh wanted out, and Brogan had been charged with tying up loose ends and terminating the business. He resented the interference, especially from the mechs. Boss man wanted them all in one place. Brogan clenched his teeth, but eventually relaxed with a smirk. Don't worry, this won't last long. After a quick head count of his men, he asked, Where's Ellis? One of the men pointed to the far corner and nudged his head in the direction. Under a dim light, Brogan caught the motion and heard the sounds of flesh slapping flesh. Ellis writhed in the dark, his hips grinding. He had one of the girls pinned beneath him. No wonder McPhee had the radio blaring. Before all this, there had been rules about roughing up the inventory. Now all bets were off. Kavanaugh had washed his hands of everything, leaving the girls to the twisted appetites of the men. And Ellis was making up for lost time. Brogan hated the sudden crimp in cash flow, but with Kavanaugh never coming near the girls, that left him in complete control, the next best thing. And he had taken full advantage of his new authority and the change in ground rules. Check it out, McPhee. Ellis knows how to relieve the boredom. Take notes. Good point. The man's a machine. McPhee chuckled and peered into the darkness. What do you want me to do with the sick one? No time for that right now. First things first. Brogan licked his lips. Bring me the new one. I gotta sample the goods. Two of his men left the circle. From the dark, Brogan heard a high-pitched shriek and the crying of a young girl. Metal grated against metal. The sounds of her cage echoed in the vault. He felt the blood rush under his skin, making him hard. No, please, she cried. Her sobs turned to whimpers. 
Like a pack of hyenas, his men fixed their eyes on the new girl, taken from the UT Austin campus. No one had touched the Japanese exchange student since the abduction. Brogan would have the honor, the only rule remaining. Tears beaded in her eyes and streaked her pale cheeks. Small and petite, with a pretty face, marred by fear, she flailed against the grip of his men, a man on each arm. With one hand, Brogan grabbed her dark hair at the back of her neck and yanked her to his chest. With the other, he ran his fingers down her body. His men yowled like animals, encouraging him to make a show of it. He didn't disappoint them. When he was done, she grimaced with eyes wide. His men now watched in predatory silence. Most of her clothes had been stripped from her body. Exposed, the girl had no idea what would happen next. Brogan smelled her fear. In the stagnant air, the sweat of his exertion rolled down his back, but the fun was only just beginning. Please, don't hurt me, she pleaded, her voice heavily accented. The girl clutched his chest. Oh, come on now, darling, you ain't in Kansas anymore. Clicking little red shoes together won't get you rescued. He laughed. Turning his voice into a whisper, his lips to her ear, he said, But I'll let you in on a little secret. Now's your chance to convince me that keeping you alive is a good thing, and you better be mighty willing and persuasive as hell. The Riverwalk, downtown San Antonio. Well, what do you know? The man knew his way around a kitchen without a road map. Becca enjoyed another bite of omelet and caught him staring at her, those dark, sensual eyes left her breathless, especially by flickering candlelight. Diego had insisted on the ambiance, music, and all. The only thing to improve the meal would be service in bed. Her imagination conjured up his dark, muscular body under white bed linens, a feast for the eyes and no carbs. A penny for your thoughts, he said, taking a sip of wine. She couldn't help but laugh. No way. These thoughts are worth a lot more than a copper Lincoln, my friend. Maybe one day I'll clue you in. He returned her grin. That might be worth the wait. And I am a patient man. Becca had no doubt of that. In between the wine and subtle flirtations, they ate their meal, each knowing the social banter would come to an end. The real reason they were together loomed ahead. For all of Diego's patience and restraint, Becca had no such poise and she dared to let it show. It's killing you, isn't it? He asked. Before she replied, he offered, Go on, ask me anything. Is Diego Galvin your real name? He stared at her a long moment and eventually answered, Yes, my mother's maiden name, to be exact. Why the big mystery about your past? Your history only goes back so far. The masquerade was for Kavanaugh's benefit, in case he did a background check. I didn't want him to find out how I was connected to Joseph Rivera, the mob guy linked to Global Enterprises. You work for him, right? Not exactly. Diego stood and walked toward the window with wine glass in hand. He's the closest thing I ever had to a father. Becca slouched back in her chair, dumbfounded by an answer she hadn't expected, I think you'd better explain. Diego looked over his shoulder, his handsome face solemn. He looked like a man wondering where to start. She waited without a word, letting him find his way. Joe adopted me when my mother died of cancer. I was 12. I never knew my real father and had no other family. Diego rejoined her at the table, sitting by her side. He stroked her hand with his fingertips, his downcast eyes mesmerized by the past. Joe fell in love with my mother, Aurelia. They had plans to get married, but before it happened, she got real sick. Ovarian cancer. Diego squeezed her hand and took a deep breath before he went on. He spent money, hoping for her remission. But in the end, the cancer won. I would have become a ward of the state without a relative to take me in. By then, Joe and I had become family. He raised me, Gave me an education. I would do anything for him. I'm so sorry to hear about your mother, Diego. Becca understood his grief. I guess after she died, Joe introduced you to the family business. 
She couldn't keep the judgmental tone from her voice. It wasn't like that. His eyes flared for an instant. He sat back in his chair and took his hand from her. He did everything to keep me out of it, at least until Draper came along. Draper? What did he do? How did he turn you into an informant if you weren't involved with Rivera's mob business? He trumped up racketeering charges on Joe, about the time Global Enterprises merged with Kavanaugh's travel company. Draper saw it as his opportunity to infiltrate an organization he suspected of human trafficking. Kavanaugh's. He threatened to send Joe to jail and throw away the key if I didn't cooperate. Becca remembered reading about the racketeering indictment in a newspaper article, part of her background check on Diego. She thought Rivera had beat the rap. At least that's how the paper reported it. Instead, it appeared the charges had been held over his head with all the subtlety of a guillotine. He blackmailed you? Did he really have anything on Rivera? Not really. I don't think Draper took the time to set it all up. He fabricated his evidence and the testimony. You see, Joe is a careful man. He's not a model citizen, mind you, but it would have taken years to gather enough proof to compromise him. Apparently, Draper preferred the fast track. Why you? You weren't part of Rivera's organization. Why did Draper pull you in? I didn't have any real family ties, and he knew how much I loved the old man. Draper had Rivera insist on my involvement with the Global Enterprises merger to get me inside. Kavanaugh never objected. But even with the leg up from Joe, it took me a while to move freely within Kavanaugh's organization. He stroked his temple like he had a headache, but continued, It was easy to cover up my history. We only had to blow enough smoke to destroy the link to my mother and the adoption. I didn't want Kavanaugh to find out. In his world, any vulnerability is a sign of weakness. I agreed to become an informant so Joe wouldn't have jail time hanging over his head. He deserved better. A man's neck deep in a criminal organization, Diego. He's not exactly innocent. Look, Rebecca, I never saw him that way. And I refuse to pass judgment on a man who gave my mother peace of mind when she needed it. You know how hard it was for a kid to watch his mother die a little, each day. Powerless doesn't begin to describe it. I had nothing to give her, only worry. Becca felt his pain, saw it in his face, and heard it in his voice. She reached for his hand with both of hers, his skin warm to her touch. In truth, she found it hard to keep her hands off him. She craved intimacy like an addiction. But Joe changed all that. He vowed to take care of me, not a small thing. When she knew I'd be okay, she accepted her death and made peace with it. Diego took a deep breath and went on. Making empty promises to a dying woman would have been easy. But Joe lived up to his word, to her and to me. He loved my mother, and for that, I owe him my life. The importance of family. She understood how he felt all too well. In Diego's world, loyalty had its price, Draper's price, and Diego had been willing to pay it for a man who had shown compassion to his mother when she needed it most. Joseph Rivera could have walked out on his empty promise, but chose not to, and Diego had returned the favor. He stood by a man he thought of as his father. As far as she was concerned, Diego Galvin was the only one who didn't have another agenda or something to gain in all this. Becca had nothing but respect for his selfless act of love, of duty. In her mind, the FBI had taken advantage of the situation. Regardless of his motives, Draper parlayed the love between a father and son and gambled on a chance to stop a greater evil. Could his cause be considered noble? Did the end justify the means? A part of Becca understood Draper's motivation. Playing by conventional rules, law enforcement was often at a disadvantage in the criminal world, a world without boundaries and the confines of law. Only yesterday, she had done the very same thing to Diego, blackmail being the weapon she held to his head, her method of coercion. Would she have gone through with her threats if he resisted? Now, thanks to Diego's sense of fair play, she would never find out. But a harsh reality glared her in the face. In hindsight, Becca was no better than Draper. And that scared the hell out of her. I thought you were some kind of muscle for the mob, an enforcer, she confessed. What did you do for Rivera before all this started? You look like a guy who can handle himself. Don't tell me you were his CPA. The bean counter geek defense won't fly with me, Slick. He chuckled. Not exactly. But I do have a financial background, believe it or not. I look for investment opportunities for Joe. I find ways for him to spend his money. 
money laundering? She asked. I only look for legitimate business ventures or properties for him to acquire or sell off. Beyond that, I have no idea how his finances are handled. I strictly optimize the hard assets of his net worth. You must specialize in hostile takeovers, then. Why else would you carry a concealed weapon? She teased, sort of. Now that, I can explain. It was Joe's idea. A man should be able to defend himself. He would always say, considering his career choice, I saw the merit in his point of view. Diego grinned and shook his head. Joe arranged for my training and made sure I was proficient with weapons. And roughhousing with some of his guys put eyes in the back of my head. Hell, for a while Joe and I trained together, until prosperity made a beeline for his belly. Up till now, the drills were exercise, a way for me to focus my mind and body. I never thought... He stopped himself and fixed his eyes on her. Do you mind if I ask you a question? He turned the tables. She cleared her throat and forced a smile. I think I can handle that. Trust is a gift, a two-way street. Do you trust me, Rebecca? If you do, I'd like to hear more about your sister. Becca swallowed, searching his eyes for a reprieve. None came. He waited for her to fill the silence. She had no idea where to start, so she cut to the heart of the matter, a testimony to her newfound trust in him. When she was little, Danny looked up to me. Somewhere along the way, I lost that. I took her love for granted and shoved it aside like it never mattered. I was too busy. Becca stood and headed for the couch, wine bottle and glass in hand. With her prompting, Diego followed. Now I wish I had my time with her back. She died, and I never got a second chance to make things right between us. If you had that second chance, what would you do differently? I would have centered my world on what really mattered. My family. Mama and Danny would be top of my list. A tear rolled down her cheek. Staring into the shimmering gold of her wine, Becca didn't bother to wipe the tear away. I feel so lost without them. My mother is dead inside, paralyzed with grief and I can't find a way back into her life. She doesn't need me or want me there. I feel so ashamed of my part in this, and now I can't even find Danny's killer. That's hard to do when you've been banned from the investigation. You shouldn't blame yourself. He leaned closer and reached for her hand, kissing her palm with tenderness. The compassion in his eyes touched her heart. I believe in second chances, Rebecca. And the people we love, we hold them in our hearts. They make us who we are, become part of us. He grasped her hand and squeezed it, infusing her with his strength. Becca shut her eyes and took a deep breath, comforted by his words. For an instant, she felt the love of her baby sister, even pictured her smiling face. God, it feels good to be connected again. When she opened her eyes, she saw Diego in a new light. How could someone with deception in his heart speak like this? He had let her see inside him, given himself freely, and the foundation of his life had been family, something she envied. Diego made it look easy. You are a strong woman, Rebecca, but how you bear the burdens in your life defines that strength. Never be ashamed of your vulnerability. It's as much a part of you as your courage. He wiped a tear from her face and smiled, and what about this case you can't ignore? The body of a young girl found in the theater. I can see why it hits close to home. But do you think the murder is connected to Kavanaugh? The evidence suggests other suspects, but my instincts as a cop tell me otherwise. I can't ignore those feelings. Somehow, I think this case is linked to him. I just haven't found the connection yet. Becca told him about her case, thankful to be off the painful topic of her family. He paid attention to every detail and asked intelligent questions. It felt good to bounce her theories off someone else. It felt good to have a partner. If Kavanaugh is involved in trafficking, he's got to have his stash of girls nearby. And I think Matt Brogan is up to his red neck in it. Anger raced across Diego's eyes at the mention of Brogan. I haven't found any direct evidence, but I've been feeding possible locations to Draper as I find them. I can't imagine it would be easy to catch Kavanaugh with his hands in the cookie jar. No, the man would distance himself. Brogan is his middleman. I can feel it. 
How have you been finding the locations, the ones you've been feeding Draper? She asked. Any way I can. I rifle through his personal records, both online and hard copy, looking for properties he owns or leases. But lately he's shut down my sources and changed security codes. His men have been mobilized, mostly at night, but I've got nothing. It's like starting over at ground zero. What about your own audio surveillance, phone taps? She asked. Draper should have been able to get anything you needed. Kavanaugh sweeps the estate at irregular hours and is paranoid as hell. I couldn't risk getting caught planting my own bugs. Equipment that might be detected before it did any good. And if the man was foolish enough to incriminate himself on the phone, he has the latest high-tech gear. The phones are encrypted, cells and landlines. Diego raked his fingers through his hair, his frustration showing. He might have resented Draper's interference at the start, but Becca could tell he had found his own motivation to persevere. She respected him for it. So far, Draper has nothing. The warehouses and various locations were empty when he got there. We've worked the streets, canvassing for any unusual activity with the girls. And nothing. Diego sighed and shook his head. If Joe had known Kavanaugh had this thing going on the side, he never would have approved any damned merger. He would have shut the guy down in a hurry. Joe's sick with worry over me and mad as hell the feds got me involved. But I think most of all, he feels guilty about the role he played in putting me here. It's got to be hard for Rivera to sit on the sidelines, especially with his son paying the price for his sins. She shifted her weight on the sofa to face him. So, what's next? Desperation, a Hail Mary pass downfield. He shook his head, dimples on full display. Boyish charm mixed with his seductive qualities, a dangerous combination. Diego moved, his warm thigh touching her leg. Becca liked the feeling. When her cheeks flushed with heat, she didn't pull away. It took all her concentration to listen to what he had to say. You see, I found a receipt for some repair work at an old warehouse. Someone added a commercial-sized lock and reinforced the metal on a delivery bay door. It's not much, but I won't know until I check it out. What part of town? She asked. After he gave her the general area, she had to know. You and Draper going? Yeah, I'm meeting him in an hour. It'll probably be another dead end, but this property, it doesn't show up on Kavanaugh's records, and none of his subsidiary companies are involved. Not a sublease either. As far as I can tell, it's not linked to him at all. The repair raised a red flag with me. I mean, why pay the bill if the property isn't yours, right? He finished his wine and set the glass on her coffee table. Sounds intriguing. Will you let me know what turns up? She asked. Yeah, sure. Diego stood and reached for her hand to help her up. Thanks for dinner. And everything. The next time I feel the urge to have my eggs whipped, I'll know who to call. You make a mean omelet. My regards to the chef. Becca grabbed his coat and walked him to the door. We're partners now, remember? From here on out, I'm looking out for your backside, Slick. Good to know. My ass feels safer already. For the first time, she felt a twinge of worry for him. Tonight, Draper would be protecting his backside, not her. She should have been okay with Diego being in the company of the big bad FBI, but she only felt useless, a woman forced to take vacation. Why hasn't anyone invented bulletproof boxers in Kevlar? Becca pulled him closer, snuggling into the warmth of his arms. Good idea. Maybe Victoria should have a new secret. He lowered his lips to hers, those same full lips she'd eyed all night. Sensitive to everything Diego, Becca felt his hands on her body and craved more. She filled her senses with him, the aroma of his warm skin, the sweet taste of his lips tinged with wine. This time, she gave in to him, body and soul. Nothing ever felt so right. Brogan watched as one of his men hauled the Japanese girl away, still crying and barely able to walk. He'd left his mark, as sure as if he'd branded her with a hot iron, she wouldn't likely forget him. Wearing only a grin, Brogan walked over to a utility sink and washed up. The musk of sex and fear were heavy in the air. His men kept a respectful distance until he buttoned his shirt and zipped his pants. He'd done what he came to do. Nichols called while you were busy. I answered the call, McPhee reported, handing over Brogan's cell phone. He said the mechs was on the move, but the cops stayed put. 
Nichols is still with her. That damned mex is a pain in my ass, but not for long. Brogan clenched his teeth and headed for his car. Anything you need me to do, boss? His man followed. Be on the alert until you hear from me. No coming or going tonight, McPhee. Lock this place down tight, you hear me? Yeah, boss. Consider it done. Brogan hated the idea of Diego on the loose without one of his men keeping track of the bastard. But Cavanaugh had a plan. Brogan would get his time with Diego Galvin soon enough. He got to the Mercedes and started it. The squeal of wheels echoed in the garage. Once he got out into the night air, his cell phone rang. Without checking the display, he punched the button to talk. Yep, Nichols, is that you? No, honey, it's me. Brogan gripped the steering wheel, his eyes narrowed. It took him a while before he recognized the woman's voice. When it finally registered who was on the line, he almost ended the call. The bitch. I never figured you for being this stupid. You got a lot of nerve calling my cell. Don't hang up, Matt. Not until you hear what I've got to say. I have to talk to you in the flesh. You remember what that feels like, don't you, baby? She slathered sex into her voice like warm lubricant. You name the time and place, and I'm there. As spent as he was, Brogan still felt his body react. He hated her for that. She knew how to punch his buttons, even ones he didn't know he had. Holding the phone to his ear, he stared into the night, his jaw rigid. He drove out the gate with his mind working double time. The psycho bitch had always been crazed. Brogan heaved a sigh and made her wait while he figured out what to do. He had no intention of picking up where they left off years ago, but the urgency in her voice made him reconsider meeting with her. I'm all ears, Sonia, but this better be good. Chapter 10 A sleazy motel off Guadalupe Street suited Brogan's purpose. It rented by the hour. But the place had gone downhill since the last time he saw it, though it was hard to imagine the dump getting any worse. No doubt the beds made a fertile training ground for a forensics team, a real cesspool of DNA. It had been years since he and Sonia met there, but Brogan's choice had nothing to do with sentimentality and everything to do with coercion. If she dared to meet him, Brogan would make her pay for such stupidity. She had a lot of nerve contacting him after so many years, especially the way he ended it. Who would take such abuse and beg for more? He rented the room for an hour. Brogan slouched in a chair, smoking a cigarette and imagining all he could do to Sonia in 60 minutes. A box of condoms sat on the nightstand, with a few packets tossed onto the bed. He wanted her to know this meat had its price. One lamp lit the room, a necessity he wished he could do without. No other way to look at this rat hole except in the dark. Cigarette smoke coiled through the air like a writhing snake and disappeared in the shadows. He preferred to watch the trail of smoke. It kept his mind off the huge roach scurrying across the shag carpet. Brogan made no effort to kill it. He figured the critter had more right to be here than he did. After a soft knock, he slid his gaze from the roach to the door. Baby, it's me, she called out. Brogan recognized Sonia's voice, but didn't answer. She tried again. You in there, Matt? Another knock. Still, he didn't say a word. Eventually, the bitch opened the door. It creaked on rusty hinges. A rush of night air and traffic noise intruded from outside. In the doorway and backlit in neon lights, Sonia stood in silhouette. She wore a black spandex dress. The clingy material hugged her body like a second skin, her nipples wearing party hats. She smelled of stale cigarettes and wore the same cheap cologne he always remembered, her dark eyes smeared by too much makeup. Without warning, the past came to stay. His body hardened, straining against his pants. She shut the door behind her, a strange mix of fear and lust in her eyes. Brogan didn't move at first, never gave her a word of greeting. His eyes strafed her body, inch by inch. He put out his cigarette in an ashtray and stood. Slow and easy, he walked toward her. Sonia backed up a step, but stopped and held her ground. Stupid girl. You're gonna hurt me, aren't you, baby? She whispered when he got close. Her lips trembled and she forced a weak smile. But before Brogan answered, Sonia reached for his aching crotch, adding fuel to his fire. Greedily, she rubbed the length of him while pretending to be a dewy-eyed virgin. Reverting to one of her old games, she manipulated him with practiced innocence. Sonia was quite the little actress. Punish me, baby, 
like you used to. With her slut switch turned on, Sonia got to her knees, brushing her nipples against his legs as she worked, her eyes fixed on his. She unbuckled his belt and unzipped his pants, letting them fall to the floor. She teased him with her tongue and made him rock hard, her fingers groping the rest of him. The warm wetness of her mouth drove him insane. Brogan clutched at her, his fingers thrust into her hair. He gasped with urgency, his skin raging hot as he yanked the bitch to her feet. Losing control, Brogan tore at her dress and yanked it over her head, ripping it. His mouth clamped on hers, his tongue down her throat. In a fevered rush, Sonia clawed at him, her nails digging into his back, her breathless panting blended with his. When she ripped open his shirt, buttons flew. His pants pulled at his ankles, and he kicked them off, along with his shoes, not caring where they landed. Once again, memories of Sonia assaulted his brain, mingling with the present. Brogan grappled her to his chest, clenching soft mounds of her flesh in his hands, rubbing them with force, her skin flushed with his brutal brand of foreplay. Oh, God, easy, baby, that's it, she coaxed. Oh, so good. When they were both naked, he threw her onto the bed and smothered her with his body. Brogan bit her nipples and made her cry out in a strange combination of pain and ecstasy. He wielded his mouth like a weapon, using his tongue and his hands to subdue her. Every move a skirmish, Sonia writhed under him, her body resonating with moans of pleasure and torment. He knew she liked it rough, but Sonia had only one speed, full throttle. No, please. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, yes, she cried out, shuddering under the influence of her first orgasm. Ah, oh, God, feels so... Yes! The word easy had been created for Sonia. The woman would come with a flick of his tongue in her ear. But tonight, Brogan made up his mind Sonia wouldn't have it so easy. Without asking, he flipped her onto her stomach, shoving a pillow under her hips. When she resisted, he pinned her down. No, baby, you know I don't like it this way, she protested, turning back to catch a look at him. But he didn't want to see her eyes, not now, not with what he had in mind. Yeah, I do. Believe me, I do. He forced her face into the mattress, a hand to the back of her head. But that never stopped me before, remember? With a sneer, he forced himself between her legs. Preparing to take what he wanted, he slipped on a condom and double-bagged himself to be safe. Until Sonia's demented obsession turned him off, she had been his equal in bed. He never knew a woman to match his sexual appetite. In fact, she had grown more deviant and harder to satisfy, so he learned to take what he wanted when they were together. His needs, his perversions. The only way Brogan retained control. Eventually, he called it off, tiring of her never-ending compulsions. Better to quit Sonia than find out he wasn't good enough anymore. Please, baby, you don't know what I got to say, she pleaded, her voice muffled. Sonia tried to squirm free, but Brogan wrestled her into submission with an elbow. She argued, you're gonna thank me later, I swear. Her panic set in. She bucked under his weight, but Brogan showed no mercy. I don't want to wait. I'd rather thank you now, my way, he whispered in her ear. With his teeth, he tugged at her earlobe, tasting blood. You deserve this, and so much more. From his experience, this crackpot bitch couldn't be trusted, so why start now? Brogan shoved into her and took her down payment on the past, watching as she clutched at the bedspread under the force of his gratitude. Ah! She screamed into the pillow. Her body rocked under him. Stop! It hurts! Stop! For old time's sake, Brogan started real slow, but as his anger mounted, so did he. Sonia tried crawling away, making things worse. He ramped up his abuse until she cried real tears, her face blotchy and red. Her knuckles blanched white, glazed in sweat, as he humiliated her. Sonia would think twice before contacting him again, regardless what she had to tell him. If Kavanaugh kept his stash of girls here, Diego's heart wrenched with the thought of them held against their will in such a vile pit. The warehouse loomed on the horizon, looking more like an apparition. The bluish haze of moonlight washed over the scene, casting an eerie glow. Kids with too much time on their hands had broken many of the windows, but streetlights reflected off what remained, 
The mirrored light gave the impression the old building had eyes, luminous and vigilant. Diego drove to the designated spot alongside the others. After parking his Mercedes, he got out and stripped off his light-colored sweater. No sense making himself a target. Underneath, he wore a black T-shirt. He joined the man in charge of the operation. You're late, the FBI agent groused. Mike Draper tossed a Kevlar vest in his direction. And put this on. You're not getting shot up on my watch. Diego strapped into the vest and pulled out the latex gloves stuffed into a side pocket. What, you're not getting enough fiber in your diet, he theorized with a shrug, ignoring the stink-eye glare from the Fed. Something came up. We ready to go in? Snapping on his gloves, Diego fixed his eyes on the warehouse. Draper would never hear an apology from him for being late. In his opinion, the man's face stayed in a constant state of discontent. His concern for the Fed's fiber intake had sound reasoning behind it. Draper stood by Murphy's unmarked police car, dressed in his FBI windbreaker, pacing and barking orders on his comm set. SAPD had the place surrounded and waited for his final order to move in. Diego knew the drill. Just waiting for you, the man sniped. He hit the switch to his comm set. Green light, Murphy. I repeat, green light, you've gotta go. On the move, Diego reached for his forty-five caliber pistol, a model 1911 Colt. He pulled the weapon from its holster at the small of his back. Alongside Draper, he walked toward the front of the old warehouse. Since he was a civilian, others would clear a path. In the night air, he heard the first wave of Murphy's men calling out, San Antonio police, we have a warrant to search the premises. Open up! When they were met with silence, the cops busted in, a precision maneuver. Beams of light strafed the structure as they rushed in, weapons drawn. The place looked deserted, like all the rest had been. But something new laced the air. A strong odor of ammonia hung heavy, a byproduct from neighborhood crystal meth users. Old mason jars, strips of surgical tubing, and empty bottles of hydrogen peroxide were piled in a corner, next to discarded boxes of time-release contact and old bottles of rubbing alcohol. Nothing in working order, but the setup was unmistakable. Since the stench of crystal meth lingered and would permeate the walls for a long time, no telling if Kavanaugh would have used the place before or after the cooks had come and gone. Diego didn't like the looks of it. He couldn't picture Kavanaugh's operation working out of here. He followed Murphy's men into the dilapidated building. They fanned out to secure the site for an investigative team to do their work, but he felt the oppressive stillness close in. Place looks dead, Draper muttered, voicing the concerns Diego had twisting in his gut. Even though it took a while for the three-story structure to be searched, the all-clear sign came too soon. If the cops had found any sign of the missing girls, the comm set would be full of chatter. No such luck. Diego eased the tension in his muscles and holstered his weapon. Nothing would be happening tonight. Damn it, he cursed under his breath. Murphy, get your forensics guys in here. I want every inch of this place scoured for evidence, Draper ordered. He directed his next comment to Diego. We may still find something. If Kavanaugh's got girls stockpiled somewhere, why haven't we found them? Diego ran fingers through his hair, frustrated as hell. These girls have suffered enough. They need to be with their families. They hate this. All the more reason not to give up now. He's got to make a mistake and we'll be there when he does. Draper holstered his gun. We knew what we had going in. This shithole had no direct tie to Kavanaugh. Diego nodded and heaved a sigh. It was a long shot. I know. He found it hard to keep the disappointment from his voice. You've done your part in this investigation, Galvin. I've got no complaints. We'll process what we get and hope for a break. I'll put a rush on it. Draper walked off with flashlight in hand, leaving Diego standing in the shadows. He'd wait to see what the forensics guy came up with, but his expectations were low. Diego had hit a dead end, another failure. You act like you don't care what I got to say. Sonia Garza filched one of Brogan's cigarettes and glared at him as he got dressed. She lay naked on the bed, propped up by pillows. Maybe I don't, he smirked, all full of himself. I got what I came for, all I've ever wanted from you. You ain't much to look at, but you always were a great piece of ass. I'll give you that. Nobody makes me hard like you, but I ain't stepping back onto your lunatic merry-go-round, no way. You used to like it. She blew smoke out her lungs and through her nose. But I tell you, 
I never thought loving you could hurt so bad, baby. He never looked up to see the tears welling in her eyes. Get over it. It's not like we never done it that way before. Are you forgetting how we met? Brogan grimaced at the buttons missing from his shirt, then chuckled under his breath, real smug. (laughs) And I'm damn sure not the only one to blaze that trail. You ain't no virgin, honey. She clenched her jaw and watched him dress. Nice threads, she thought, real uptown. Life hadn't dumped on the bastard like it did her after their split. But inside where it counted, Brogan hadn't changed one bit. Every time he opened his pie hole, she remembered his nasty streak. And to prove her point, Brogan kept up his abuse. Hey, Sonia, anyone ever say you ride like a bad-tempered Mustang with a burr under its saddle? You got a mean buck, girl. He laughed and zipped his pants, barely looking at her. I could have used some leather rigging to stay on top. I see you're spending quality time with the livestock, and it shows. Too bad you couldn't last the eight-second count, cowboy. I might have enjoyed it. She dished back his rodeo talk, not giving an inch. You're one mean bitch, Sonia. Brogan buckled his belt and glared at her, venom in his eyes. She remembered the look. That's why we get along, you and me. Being mean is foreplay, remember? Sonia talked tough, not letting him know how much she hurt. Her skin rubbed raw, she ached all over. But inside, her blood churned for more. Brogan always did drive her crazy. He never understood why, and maybe she didn't either. In the old days, she used to fantasize about him, day and night. She would have done anything for him, and she had. Matt reminded her so much of... Images of Matt Brogan jumbled with the shadows of her stepdad, coming to her room in the middle of the night. An eight-year-old kid forced to keep secrets and she never told, not ever. Since then, older men drew her. She sought them out, especially the mean ones. The cycle repeated for a girl who didn't deserve better. She brought it on herself, like her stepdad used to say. Lewd flashes of her old man's body were never far from the surface. His smell, his nasty fingers, the things he made her do, and the way he grunted when he finished. It all came back in a rush, along with her pathetic need for his approval. The images of every man she had screwed ran together and dominated her brain. Her best dreams and her worst nightmares. Sonia could never separate the two. Until she experienced a glimmer of hope years ago. She always thought if she fixed Brogan, made him love her, the cycle would break. But that dream died. Matt booted her out when she needed him most. Afterwards, she let depression and self-hatred run roughshod over the rest of her life. Now Sonia stood and walked toward the man who could have saved her. As she got closer, a chill of fear and desire ran along her skin. Her nipples hardened. I don't want to make you mad, honey. She trailed her fingers down his chest. He watched her move with interest and stood his ground. Slowly, she made her way around him. Sure, you hurt me. Didn't listen when I wanted you to stop. But I still would rather be with you than anyone else, Matt. His ego needed stroking, a chronic condition, but she knew how to work him. Sonia massaged his back through his shirt and moved her hands down to his slim waist. Her arms embraced him from behind. She brushed a hand across his crotch. He was aroused again. Brogan was predictable and so easy to manipulate. If she wanted to engage the only brain he had, all she had to do was unzip it and free Willy. We got a history, and I can't stop thinking about you. Even now. Sonia stepped around and hugged him, hearing his heart beat in his muscled chest. She used to love the sound. His hard body always turned her on. But Brogan pulled away, his hands on her shoulders, keeping her at a distance. All for show. The hunger in his eyes betrayed him. The big jerk wanted her for another round, and it wouldn't take much to put Brogan over the edge. Yeah, we got us a history, all right. I remember holding a knife to your throat and telling you to lose my number, but did you listen? No. Your version of our history is whacked, like you. Brogan never remembered their history like she did. He had his own slant. She did, too. Well, maybe I can help you remember the good parts. She shoved him onto the mattress, clothes and all, and straddled his taut belly. He raised himself onto his elbows and made a lame show of protest before she stopped him. Don't worry, baby. I won't hurt you. You just gotta listen to me. 
What I gotta say is important. But I don't trust you, Sonia. Can't get around that. Oh, yeah? Well, not too long ago you trusted my mouth with your prized possession. I think you should reconsider. He laughed, this time with humor in his eyes. Guess you got a point. So what is it that's so important? You still running girls, Matt? Before he answered, she touched a finger to his lips and added, You don't have to tell me. I know you. Just hear what I gotta say. When she had his attention, she kissed his neck and gyrated in his lap, a slow, steady move. I heard something you ought to know if you're still connected. A cop came to see me the other day, asking about some chick I knew in high school, Isabel Marquez. Oh, yeah? He narrowed his eyes. Did you get the name of that cop? Detective Rebecca Montgomery. She nibbled on his ear and tugged at his open shirt, whispering, the cop told me she had a witness linking me and is.